Onyx, see that there, the perfect cherry? You see right here, that's the eyes. He put those in in November. He was in a slump, eh? And he put that in and he gave that to me. Isn't that nice? That's beautiful. What yeah. are you going to do with it? I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But I know one thing, uh, Lou Vargas, the guy that does that, he's got a son. He's a trainer for Chicago, plays for Tacoma Rockets, got uh, 60 goals in 65 games. Remember that name, John Varga, will be playing for Washington next year. Frank Bannon from Saskatoon Blades is going to Washington. A lot of good yeah. caps uh, playing right now on good luck with Blades and uh, Kamloops in Kamloops. the League Final. What's that all about? You know what it's all about. Oh, yes. Uh, Bob Brown, GM, as uh, all Canadians playing for his team. By the way, we should just mention this little backdrop oh, yeah. in behind us. Uh, Let me tell you something, folks. For 13 years, I'm just an old TV guy, an old, you know, old coach and everything like that. For 13 years, we've been up against the wall, out into the hall, right? Even when Hodge was here, even he couldn't no. figure it out. Sorry. People going by, throwing stuff at us. I said, why don't we do it the other way against the wall? And here I am. Yes. Yes. Good. Thanks. Uh, what about the uh, Leafs trying to come from Boston? Boy, they're in the driver's seat now. Anyhow, let's go on to something else. Okay, let's go on to the uh, Rona clip. All right, have. that's what I want to get to. Now, you kids out there, uh, all you forwards out there, I always had the, the uh, Bruin forwards. They always practiced. I always had one of them go back and play defense every practice. And I'm going to show you why. Ronick does the same thing. You guys, some of you guys can't skate backwards. Roll that clip, Jimmy, or Mark, right now, and show what Ronick does on that goal. Now watch, he's playing defense. Watch him. He can back up nice, beautiful, beautiful. Look at this here. He doesn't stay up. Gets the puck. Watch, he gets the puck here. Puts it up to Amani, and away he goes and scores the goal. That's what all you kids have got to do. Learn how to play defense. Back in like he does. What a guy. Jeremy. Not coaching hockey in Sweden. Oh, thanks. I needed that. Wake up to cool. He's one of the most productive players of all time. His career total of 1,771 points trails only Wayne Gretzky and Gordie Howe on the all-time scoring list. He began his 18-year career with the Detroit Red Wings, but as you know, the majority of his career was played with Los Angeles, where he was the King of Kings. 731 goals, and in the playoffs, 49 postseason appearances, 45 points. For much of his stay on the West Coast, Dion played at center on the Triple Crown line with Dave Taylor and Charlie Simmer. Marcel Dion on Hockey's Great Wall, presented by Ford of Canada. With the International Soccer for Sega Genesis. If it's in the game, EA Sports it's in the game. Well, it's like having a victory in the bank. Safety deposit box located at the Meadowlands branch. Dominic Hoschick goals against 1.75. Martin Brodeur and even two. Second period saves up 2-1. McGillney the break. And a score. McGillney's 4-3 on Buffalo. Thank you, Craig. After that, Brodeur was unbelievable and unbeatable. Robbing McGillney with the glove there. Still in the second. Stefan Riche, bang for the goal. Tied at three. Third period. Claude Lemieux would step up his game. Breaks up the ice, abuses Richard Schmelick. Lemieux's second of the night. Devils had the empty netter to win 5-3. At the final horn, John Mucker, the coach of the Sabres, and the Buffalo bench, they get into a scuffle with the Jersey fans who are pretty brave behind all that plexiglass. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Muckley refused to talk about the incident after the game. A security official said it started after a fan threw a beverage at the coach. Martin Brodeur made just 17 saves, only three in the third. Buffalo's Randy Wood, just as surprised as you are, saying that three goals should have been enough. Oh, yeah. And strange that the crowd for this game five would be the smallest of the entire season for the Penguins. Fans not chilling out in the igloo. Byron Defoe played very well in his first loss. How would he do in his second appearance? First period, Mario Lemieux rips one. The stop, but Sean McKecker in there for the rebound. 1-0 Penguins. Second period, 1-0 Pittsburgh. Penguins were caught in a line change. Thank you, Bill Clement. Caps get a 2-1-1 -on off the play. Mike Ridley shoots and scores. We're tied at 1 on the goal there. Eddie Johnston with a list of drills for next season's training camp. Third period, tied at 2 to Foe. Some quick reactions. Forget the ice and stop the puck, and he does on Kevin Stevens. Shoney saying, I hope Kilborn isn't ripping me on Sports Center. Midway through the third, still tied at two. Yager breaks loose, beats Defoe with the wrister. 3 2 Penguins. Yager's first goal of the series. Penguins fighting off a double minor assessed against them. Tom Barrasso, the save on Peter Bondra to preserve the victory. 3 2 Pittsburgh. Barrasso stops 26 of 28. Yager and Stevens picking a good time to score their first goals of these playoffs. First time in Mario's career, he's gone longer than one postseason game without scoring a goal. 
Caps did blow a 3-1 series lead to the Pens two years ago when Pittsburgh won their second cup. Classic matchups lead to classic games. Bees and Habs. Glenn Murray on Peter Popovic. And Patrick Wan, goal for Montreal, was just his plain old usual self. Ted done out of the shot. The save, Wah. Bruins on the power play. Joseph Stumpel has his shot knocked away by Wah. 60 saves for Patrick. Hey, this guy's pretty good, you think? Bruins finally break through, though. Third period, Stumpel to Glenn Murray. And Stumpel puts in the rebound to beat Wah. one nothing Bruins. Obviously out of the extra large size. Hab strike back on the wrap right here's John LeClaire sneaking it past John Casey for a 1-1 tie. We go to overtime. And in the overtime, Kirk Muller's been fabulous for the series. We get the game winner off the rebound. His fifth of the series, 2-1 Canadians. The Bruins have now fired 102 shots on Wah in the last two games for their efforts. They have three goals and two losses. Glenn Wesley said afterwards, I guess we needed 80 or 90 shots. To get Finally, Bure cracking the scoring column. 4.48 into the game. Beats Mike Vernon, one zip Canucks. It was tied 1-1 at the end of regulation. We're going to overtime, and the Canucks cash in on the Calgary miscue. Gets past Kevin Dahl. Here comes Jeff Courtnall. Oh, the blast. He goes shelf on the glove side. A perfect shot, and the Canucks win it in overtime. 2-1, that was Courtnall's first shot of the game. The Flames a hard time clinching their first series win since 89. Next chance Thursday in Vancouver. Back to boxing with the retirement of... presents Hockey Week, an inside look at all the action of the NHL. I'm Mike Emery. Coming up, the Stanley Cup playoffs are a time of courage and glory. Heroics from coast to coast, we've got the story. Next on Hockey Week. Hockey Week begins its Stanley Cup review. Eastern Conference quarterfinal, Montreal and Boston. The stuff of legends, Patrick Waugh, hospitalized for three days with an early stage of appendicitis, was treated with antibiotics and allowed to practice on the day of game four with a chance to play that night. It depends how he feels. I mean, he had no solid food till yesterday morning. So it depends how his legs feel and how his timing and reflexes, and, but that's, that's his decision. Medically, he could go. And go he did, leading Montreal to a series evening victory with an inspirational performance that won't be forgotten. Fourth to Iafredi. Nice pass, Tchaikovsky! Robbed by Waugh! Big stop there! I was ready when that game started. You know, I, I had a good sleep this afternoon. I had a good meal. And even yesterday, it started yesterday to feel better. I, I, I ate a lot yesterday. I, I had three normal uh, dinner and, 
and uh, really helped me out. In Montreal, they're calling him St. Patrick after the Habs' critical 5-2 victory. Even at two games apiece, the series moved to Boston, but the hero, Patrick Waugh, remained the same. In for Murray, can't get it. Step up. Save Waugh! Waugh, the magnificent save there. The second dinger right. off the face by Patrick Waugh. For Shaw, walks in, shot, save, rebound, save! How can he do this night in and night out? They thought they had the game won. Waugh made 60 saves, holding tight through three periods and an overtime until Kirk Muller connected. Shot in, save, rebound, score! The Canadians win it. I guess the bottom line is Patrick, uh, you know, gave us a chance to win again. You know, he kept us in, and uh, it seemed like by the time overtime came, we seemed to have a little bit more of the jump, and we uh, we seemed to have a lot of luck in overtime last year and this year. But he gave, obviously gave us a chance to win, and uh, we were able to capitalize when we got our chance. With back-to-back -back wins, the Habs were now a victory away from clinching the series. Elsewhere in the Eastern Conference, Buffalo and New Jersey. The Sabres and Devils had each won two games as the series returned to the Meadowlands. Pivotal Game 5 was a topsy-turvy encounter that saw Buffalo take an early lead. If they hurry, it's a headman on the ball. Alexander Mogilny later had another chance, but Martin Brodeur, New Jersey's rookie goaltender, made this save. I was I was there and he hit my glove. You know, he could uh, he could uh, he could have went both ways, but you know he took a good shot and you know uh, he scored the on breakaway, so I had to stop him on that shot at least. New Jersey also got a huge effort from Claude Lemieux. Game tied at three in the third period. Oh, it was a good goal for me. I mean, I'm not that type of fancy player, but I had some good speed coming in, and I uh, I wanted to shoot, and he kind of stood me up, and I felt if I pull it through and, you know, try it, and, uh, and it worked. Uh, you know, need some luck and uh, timing, and, and it uh, worked well for me at that time. Five three winners of game five. The Devils now had the upper hand. Now it's time for the Alka-Seltzer Plus Plus Minus Award final update. When you got a cold and you got to get relief, you got to get Alka-Seltzer Plus Cold Medicine. A powerful force. That's Scott Stevens of the New Jersey Devils. The big defenseman is a plus anywhere on the ice, taking care of business in his own end or finishing on the attack. Here's the centering pass, Stevens, he scores! New Jersey's Scott Stevens is the winner of this year's Alka-Seltzer Plus Plus Minus Award. Islanders-Rangers matchup. When the smoke had cleared from the Battle of New York, the Rangers came away with a devastating four-game sweep of their arch rivals. One key was Brian Leach, who simply put, never played better. Leach was plus 11 in four games, scoring eight points, five of which came on a highly effective power play. Leach pressed by Turgeon. Messier, quick pass to Zubov on the Leach. In the slot, Graves, he shoots, he scores! What a play. It's a power play goal. With the extra man, the Rangers scored a playoff best eight times in 27 chances. Aggregate goals in the series were 22 for the Rangers and just three for the Islanders. The Broadway Blues looked awfully impressive in disposing of their Nassau County cousins. Our long-term goal is uh, still a ways away, and we have to take it one step at a time. We're happy that we got by the Islanders, and, and as I said before, um, whether it was four games, five games, six games, seven games, you know, it, it's kind of a bonus that we do get a rest and that everyone's healthy and we just get ready for the next series. On now to the Washington-Pittsburgh series. Shaky times for the Penguins, who entered game five on the verge of elimination, trailing the Capitals three games to one. The fact of the matter is our backs are to the wall. We've got to show our character. We've got to come out and work harder than the Washington Capitals. And that's why they don't work best and I'll play them. With rookie Byron Defoe replacing Don Beaupre and Nets, the Caps were looking to close out an underachieving Penguins team. One example of that was Kevin Stevens, a star in playoff pass. Stevens had been held scoreless in the series. He picked a good time to get back on track. Going to Stevens, has a chance here. He shoots and scores! Kevin Stevens got it through to Foe, and the Penguins have tied the game at two. Kevin Stevens gets his first of the playoffs. 
With a score 2-2 in the third period, another Penguins mainstay, Yarmir Yager, got on board. Here to center ice comes Christie's in his pants. Cut off by the uh, tag on Eddie, and he goes on to Yager. Moving up into the camp's end. Comes down with a wrist shot. Hey! If a team made one defensive mistake, they made them pay. They might have been outplayed an entire game, but if they made a mistake, they made them pay. They haven't been making them pay until now. The Pens were still alive heading to game six. Now let's find out about game six in the update. Here's Warner Fusell. Thanks, Mike. In Montreal, there were high expectations as the Canadiens and Patrick Waugh were looking to finish off the Bruins. But Boston and Al Iafredi were determined to force a seventh game. Drive in front, and with it, Iafredi cuts, moves, scores! Iafredi makes it three to two, Boston. The Washington Capitals found an open door against the Pittsburgh Penguins and barged right through it. Holding the key was a relentless Dave Poulin. Dave Poulin to Michael Pavanka. Penalty up coming on the Penguins. Here's Pavanka to Poulin, scores! A crushing 6-3 victory in Game 6 capped the series off for Washington. The Capitals had eliminated the once-mighty Penguins, who will strive to answer many questions during their long summer. And speaking of long, the Sabres and Devils took their Game 6 into a fourth overtime. Dominic Hoshik turned back all 70 shots he faced. Martin Brodeur stopped 49 of 50. The winner came at 1.51 in the morning. Dave Hannon ending the sixth longest game in history. Now, Brute presents the check of the week. Brute, men are back. Chicago's Jeremy Roenick just said, make my day. The recipient, Toronto's Mr. Ken McCray. Stay tuned. McCray starts a chain reaction. Check it out. Hey, what a hit, Roenick. Nothing that cross by McCray. Well, that was a good hit by Roenick, a clean hit. Conference quarterfinals, Sharks and Red Wings. In the wild San Jose arena for history. The Stanley Cup playoffs come to the Bay Area for the first time ever. For some, it's early. Only year three. For others, it's right on time. The first taste of Stanley Cup frenzy in the Shark Tank. But in game three, Detroit took the bigger bite. Okay, Federoff comes to center. With Cicerelli and Kozlov. Pulls up, does that button hook at the blue line. Cicerelli scores! The Red Wings were 3-2 winners in Game 3. In the playoffs, turnovers can be very costly. Although you'll never see him doing flips, Scotty Bowman had to be happy when his wings jumped on a shark miscue in Game 4. Herbe gives it away, and they score! Miscommunication here. Those kinds of mistakes can kill a team, but the Sharks have proved resilient all year. Sergei Makarov is a great example. A break for Lariana with Makarov, two on one. Here's Igor Arellano. Makarov, Sharks, four to three. Makarov's winner had even the series at two games apiece. Game five in San Jose under the unique 2-3-2 format. Once again, a misplay around the net was just what the Sharks didn't need. But once again, Kevin Constantine's team refused to fold. The number one line led the way. Here's Arellano crossing the line. Drop pass for Makarov. the Canucks and Flames quarterfinals. Pound for pound, the toughest and most penalized series of the playoffs thus far has been Vancouver and Calgary. In game three, the toll started to show as both Joel Otto and Joe Neuendijk left the match with injuries. 
but the loss of their two top centermen only seemed to light a fire under a Flames club that has had to battle through injuries all year. Here's a two-on-one, right goes to Roberts, he scores! That could pretty much put it away for the Calgary Flames. With their 4-2 win, the Flames led the series two games to one. The Canucks knew they had to come out hard in game four, but the Flames weren't planning on yielding an inch. That was especially the case in goal, where Mike Vernon kept the door shut. Knocked out to center ice. Craven coming in against McKenzie Falls. Craven going in alone. Great save by Mike Vernon. That was the difference in Vancouver's 3-2 loss that now had the Canucks facing an early summer. Calgary needed one more win to close the series. Now our backs are to the wall, and we've got to get the job done, and we have to do it uh, um, with the same sort of effort we got tonight, only better results. Desperate in Game 5, the Canucks entered the Saddle Dome to find that the Flames were able to get Joe Neuendijk back in the lineup. Neuendijk assisted on Calgary's only goal, and a 1-1 tie went to overtime. The struggle only became more intense in what truly would have been sudden death for Vancouver, but the Canucks stayed alive. Next from the West, the St. Louis and Dallas matchup. Darkness upon the waters of the Mississippi. The St. Louis Blues fell to Dallas in four straight. The Stars got shining efforts from Darcy Wakalock and Mike Madonna, as well as a former Blues defenseman who delivered a crushing goal in overtime of game three. Dallas was on the power play after Peter Nedved went off for holding. Portnall's got the puck. Back to the point. Here's a shot by Cavallini. Knocked down. Cavallini keeps it going. He winds a drive. A shot. Yes. And a goal. Paul Cavallini wins the game for the Dallas Stars. They win in overtime. 5-4. And how sweet is this for Paul Cavallini? Cavallini had played with the Blues at St. Louis Arena for the better part of six seasons. If Game 3 wasn't bad enough, the clincher of Game 4 was sufficient to give St. Louis the Blues for some time to come. Leading the Stars 1-0 late in the second period, St. Louis saw any chance start to dissipate under the talents of Mike Madano, whose two goals won the game. Martin on the power play, the shot score! In giving the Blues the broom, Dallas had recorded the franchise's first ever four-game sweep. You know, to do it off uh, the finish of the last two games here in St. Louis showed, uh, you know, we've been uh, working hard all season for this chance and uh, to redeem ourselves after the disappointing ending of the season last year. And a lot of the guys are really excited about the, you know, the, the way the series unfolded and uh, we're pretty uh, happy that it's over. Time now for teamwork, a better way, brought to you by Glidden, a better way to paint. Sandus Ozalinch is a big reason why the Sharks have been shocking. Car off to North. Back to the middle of the list. Pass. Shot. The Sharks are terrific at moving the puck. Watch as Jeff Norton feeds it to Sandus Ozilinch and he makes a heads up pass to Igor Larionov. That's teamwork. That's a better way. Chicago and Toronto. The Blackhawks faced a tough road, returning home to Chicago, trailing the Leafs two games to none. But in game three, two old high school teammates connected. Jeremy Roenick helped set Tony Amante up with a night that will echo long after the old stadium's torn down. Weinrich's better ahead. Down comes Amante. Scores! That's number four for Tony Amante. And the Blackhawks take the two-goal lead. What a night for Amante of Chicago. The Maple Leafs had to hope it wasn't the start of a downward trend. But Pat Burns wasn't going to be too happy in game four. This time, Gary Suter had a hat trick, and that helped send the match to overtime. That's when JR took over, with some heroics only one minute and 23 seconds into the extra session. Landed in off his stick. Not The back-to-back -back wins had even the series and given Chicago a reason to believe as the two teams headed north. Well, hopefully uh, we go in there and, and, and play a big, strong game. I mean, we have a lot of momentum going now, and 
we know we can win up there. We just have to make sure we go in there with uh, the right state of mind and, and not uh, too overconfident and, and go and just try and uh, pull one out of there. In Toronto, a gritty series got grittier. The two teams had once already taken a nothing-nothing tie to overtime, and Game 5 appeared on that course until midway in the third period when Doug Gilmore's replacement came up big. Lando Clark, far corner, Andrew Chuck. Centering Eastwood, he scores! I Eastwood on the Toronto power play, and it's one to nothing, they believe. And the Leafs held on to take a 3-2 series edge. Now the results from Game 6 in the Western Conference Playoff Update. San Jose's upset plans will have to wait. Goaltender Jimmy Waite came on in relief of Archers Urbe, who had a long night against Detroit. And it's Slava Kozlov backhand to Fedorov. His weak shot and they score. The first seeded Red Wings pummel the Sharks 7-1. And now Game 7 will decide it all. The Calgary Flames lost Game 5 in overtime to Vancouver, and Game 6 found the Canucks marching to the same beat. This time, Trevor Linden was the hero. Curry getting set. Let the shot go through traffic. They jam away. They score! Linden! The series now goes back to Calgary for Game 7. In Chicago, Leafs and Blackhawks head-to-head. -head. A Mike Gardner goal was the difference. Toronto's Felix Potvin backstopped his third 1-0 win of the series. They win the faceoff, and Weinrich gets the screenshot, and somehow Potvin saw it. Toronto took the series. The Blackhawks had played their last game in Chicago Stadium. Next week, catch a Hockey Week tribute when we remember the roar one more time. Special edition, top five goals of the year, brought to you by Calcium Rich Toms. Fraser battles his way up the boards. He's got Kaminsky with him. Two on one against Crowley. Kaminsky takes the shot, passes to Fraser, shoots and scores. A dazzling goal by Ian Fraser, backhanding it through his legs. Back over to Burry again, looking for the ex devil Greg Adams, number eight. He was at the half marks. Now Burry works. One of those ones I'm not going to touch. <laughs> Jet watch. Oh, with it now for Neely. Neely gains the line. Trying to go right through. It's in. A standing ovation from this crowd who appreciates talent and toughness. When you combine the two, pleasure to watch. Wait, shoots wide. Buffalo looking to take the lead with a man advantage for the next 35 seconds. Luke oh. Buffalo! Buffalo! Dale Howard Chuck! Dale Howard Chuck tricks everybody except himself. Watch what Howard Chuck does. That is a planned play, folks. That is not luck. What a play by Howard Chuck. My goodness, look at that picture. Looks like a winner. Take a shot with us next time as Brute presents Hockey Week. If you have any questions or comments regarding Hockey Week, we'd like to hear from you. Please write to us at Hockey Week in Care of Phoenix Communications, 3 Empire Boulevard, South Hackensack, New Jersey, 07606. Hockey Week was brought to you by Brute. Brute. Men Adam Oates out there defensively for Brian Sutter. He's had a strong game. Their offensive star and also one of their best defensive players. Everybody on their feet. That's an offside as Stewart brought it in and puts it in the net. No goal. Offside. But we're down to 50.7 seconds left, and the fans all on their feet in Boston. Now, 14,000 plus still think it's a goal, I think. A lot of them, anyway. <laughs> and I don't know how they're going to be able to... They can't start this game now until they clean the ice again. It is littered at both ends. Pat DiPuzzo, who is late coming back, has been hit with something. He's down by the referee's bench, the penalty bench. He was hit with 
some of the debris. Not very often you get three officials with no helmets on, but we have that rarity here tonight. Gary Fraser, Randy Mitten, and Pat DePuzo without the hats on. And when they start throwing things, it can be anything. I remember getting hit with a battery one time. I thought, well, who would bring a battery to throw at a goaltender? Patrick Waugh sitting on the bench talking to Jacques LaPerriere is talking to Eric Desjardins. Right there, that looks as though the ice is clear, but I'll tell you folks, at either end, it is far from it. Especially in the end, down where the Bruins, where John Casey is. It is just littered with all kinds of stuff. These are heady days for sports fans in Boston, while the Celtics are out of the playoffs. But the Red Sox are off to a fine start in the American Baseball League. And the Bruins are doing what they are doing as we look at the young man who is, as I said before, and I still think I'm right, the reason that there is a seventh game in this series. His team has been outplayed. The games, yet, the games they won, Dick, they were outshot 24 to 42, 15 to 41, and 36 to 61. And that's their three wins. That's why he's the reason that these fans are able to throw all this stuff on the ice at 10-15 in Boston on this Friday night, game seven. Brian Sutter has lots of folksy type wisdom, <laughs> he and Tommy McVie, and he was saying this morning, we'll be great, hard work, and if the water doesn't rise, everything will work out. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, Brian, forgetting about his previous seventh game coaching experiences in St. Louis, and I know this has not crossed his mind tonight, nor should it at any time, but the first time he coached in the seventh game, his team forced the seventh game against Chicago, and they went back into Chicago and were beaten 8-2. to two. I'm sure the Chicago Stadium was, the reaction was somewhat the same there that night for the team that he was coaching against as it is here. Bruins on the verge of winning their first playoff series for Brian Sutter. This would be the first seven-game victory of John Casey's career. He was 0-2 coming in. And they tell us under a minute now left at the Brendan Byrne Arena, 30 seconds to go with the Devils continuing to protect that one goal lead. You wonder about that Buffalo team, Dick. Had they had Pat Lafontaine, yep. would they have been able to score a few more goals or would they not have adapted this defensive style that carried them so far during the regular season? Let's see, they played nine periods, those teams, plus a bit of another in a space of about 48 hours and they've scored four goals. And it's not quite over in New Jersey. Nor is it here, but the difference here is the home team leads by two, not just one. Last year, Buffalo swept the Boston Bruins. And then were in turn swept by the Canadians. All right, let's find out what is happening in New Jersey tonight. Countdown on, and the Sabres putting the pressure on. What a great chance they have. And Martin Rode de Brodeur holds them out with 13.3 seconds to go. Boy, what a spot for a rookie netminder. We're underway here again with 40 seconds to go, and a puck bouncing past Desjardins into the corner. Here's a long shot down the ice. Dom Poos, first man to it, touches it, and that's an offside against the Canadians, 29.9 left. Many Don Proust is complaining, saying he was onside when the puck was shot. Look at Patrick Waugh, dejected, sitting on the bench. And Coach Jock Demers trying to cheer his team on. And I hope Harry Sinden doesn't get into the name calling. I'm sure part of the thing after game six was trying to psych Patrick Waugh out, but one of the best goaltenders, and in my opinion, the best goaltender in the NHL. Doesn't deserve those kind of knocks. He won three games by himself in this series. Last year after the cup final, he went to Disneyland. This year after the playoffs, likely in the hospital to have that appendix removed as soon as the postseason's over. Puck in the corner, Patrick Waugh still in the goal. Bellows centers it in front. Here's a chance swept away. Close call there. And the countdown on here will let the Bruins fans take this one down. Boston moves on and there will be a new Stanley Cup champion in 1994. A little 
the motion at the end. Vinny Dom Foose and Al Iafredi. Iafredi thought that Dan Foose shot the puck at him. And he came right after Dom Foose. Dom Foose gave him a little tug, and now the two teams are separated. The Bruins congratulating their goaltender, John Casey, who really did settle down, Dick, as the series progressed. Yeah, we talked a lot about Patrick, of course, and we had to. But you're right, he missed two games. They brought in Vincent Riando. But you're right, as it kept going on for Casey, once he came back after a shaky first game. The Devils have won. Now, Jacques Demers is congratulating Brian Sutter. Of course, Sutter was Jacques' captain in the four, the three years that he was the coach in St. Louis. So it will be the Bruins and the Devils. And that will open at the Meadowlands Sunday afternoon. And Hockey Night in Canada will be there. Well, as the two teams salute each other and the champions shake hands with the new the winners of this series, let's check the three stars of tonight's game, the Molson three stars. Cam Stewart, the youngster, really, was an impact player. Ted Donato, goal and an assist. Glenn Murray, the first star. And you've done this before. Pat, congratulations. Good luck in the next round. Dallas. Kirk McLean. Well, Jeff Cortnell, you were great, too. Uh, how about a word from both of you? Kirk, congratulations. As Pat said, uh, everybody was kind of gunning at you to prove I don't know what, but you did, and it uh, must feel nice. Well, it does. I mean, uh, we were in the same scenario in 89, except they scored late in the first overtime and uh, we were able to hold off and they got a big goal by Pavel. It wasn't like they snapped it upstairs on you in 89. Nothing you could have done on that one. You did this sort of Winnipeg and uh, now here, uh, give me a, aside from yourself, because you were clearly a star, who shone for your team to get you through these three OTs? Well, I think everybody did. I mean, we, we were down 3-1 like you said and we really worked hard for the whole series. We've had some bad breaks and some bad bounces and we never really got down on ourselves. We bugged away and uh, it took three overtimes, four overtimes to win it, so, uh, you know, I'm just happy for the guys. And you ought to be. Congratulations. You were brilliant tonight and really thrilled. Jeff, so were you. Double shifting a lot. Uh, the big goal that really got it rolling. Uh, your feelings? Uh, it was a great goal. Nice to see Pavel get loose, but uh, Kirk, uh, he deserves all the credit, boy. He gave us a chance to stay in the game. Uh, three or four, huge saves, two on one. Great save. It's great to beat him. Yeah, you and your brother. That should be something. Pavel, are you on the air? No. Trevor, come on in here, guys. One word each. We just express maybe a quick feeling. Well, it's great for, you know, definitely our team and the fans of Vancouver. They've been great. And uh, this is the best feeling, boy. Double overtime is, uh, you know, quite a way to win. It is, too. Pavel, Don Cherry picked you to score the goal. How do you feel? Well, you know, I still can't believe it. I scored this goal. You know, it's a big win for us. Pat Quinn showed a lot of faith, and you said you were pressing. He never got down on you. That must uh, help. Uh, we're looking at the goal. Describe it. You're not seeing it here, but they're watching it on TV. Tell me about it. Well, you know, it was great pass from uh, Jeff Brown, and what I had to do just for it was breakaway. As I was saying, Pat Quinn really, I think, went to bat for you when a lot of people were saying, where's Pavel? Uh, you know, Pat, he's a uh, really smart coach. He supported me when I had a bad time beginning of the series, but finally we won. I'm, I'm happy. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Pavel Burry scores the goal to send the Vancouver Canucks to the next round. Tenth team in seven years to rally from 3-1 deficit. And for the Canucks in their building program, they vanquish all the doubters who question that rather tough regular season. Canucks win. We'll have more from the Saddle Dome in a moment. It's that time of year again. The Stanley Cup playoffs on Molson Hockey Night. When the Soviets flew, they flew Dutch. Krutov, Larionov, Makarov, KLM. Igor with his Gretzky-like imagination and Sergei, the nine-time Soviet scoring champion. Now they're on a line with Johan Garpenlov, and together they paved the way for a 3-2 victory two nights ago. It's been proven you can win some with two sums, so beware of sharks in pairs. Yes, San Jose put the fight on Toronto in game one. What a playoff thus far. Three division leaders bow out in the first round, and now three of the four in round two have lost home ice advantage. There's the scene as the Leafs prepare to come out at Maple Leaf Gardens, and the curtain gives you the San Jose picture as we get set for game two of this conference semifinal. Good evening in Walsh Chicago series. Ligament damage to his ankle, and MRI says no more damage could be incurred by playing. But all the same, we wondered about the injury, so I spoke to Doug to give us the lowdown. Well, um... As much as I can tell you, it's, a, it's an injury that is going to take time. And, um, as far as practicing, I can't practice. I can't put my skate on. 
unless uh, it's taped out the proper way and we we uh, take care of it in different ways so tonight it'll be ready to go and it's uh, you know again it's an injury that is painful but at the same time it still gives me a chance to play is there any one facet of your game turning stopping it gives you a problem well i think it's a combination of everything in the first period i usually feel pretty good in the second period it uh, kind of uh, starts to act up in the third period. It's very hard. Uh, the other night in the third period, I went to kick the puck a couple of times and had no idea where my foot was going. So that uh, that has something to do with it. Tell me about the San Jose Sharks and the shock that uh, fans are feeling about a 3-2 victory in your own rink. Well, it's something that uh, we knew what San Jose was going to do. And they played that patient style that they played all year, and especially against us. So they're not going to change their style whatsoever. we got to be a little more aggressive and go out and play our game. And being aggressive means get the puck in and, very, and forecheck as much as possible. Harry Neal, can the Leafs beat Archer Zerbe and company without Gilmore at 100%? Well, that's a tough question. I don't think there's a team in the league more dependent on one forward than Toronto is on Gilmore. It's a big, tough assignment for the rest of the Leafs to go very far without him. What changes will Pat Burns make tonight? Well, I think you'll see the Leafs be much more physical, especially on the front. At left wing, number 12, Bob Airy. At right wing, number 36, Jeff Hodger. At center, number 13, Jamie Baker. Starting in goal, number 32, Arthur Spearbay. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's starting lineup for your Toronto Maple Leafs. On defense, number three, Bob Russ. On defense, number 15, Dimitri Miranov. At left wing, number 17, Wendell Clark. At right wing, number 11, Mike Gartner. Center, number 32, Mike Eastwood. And starting in goal, number 29, Felix Potvin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise and join the star of Miss Saigon, Kevin Gray. Out to be one of the biggest of the year for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Leafs character is on the line tonight. Good evening, everybody. Bob Cole in the broadcast booth. And at center ice, the officials for tonight's game. The referee is Don Koharski. The linesman, Ron Finn, and Liria tonight. Moore and Cronin on the defense for San Jose. Baker, Perry, and Andrews get the start up front. Against Eastwood, Gartner, and Clark. A rebound right here. Look at Mimeso right on top of Moog. And then Bure, who jumps in very, very quickly. Comes from the outside again. Not everybody on top right at once. Watch Burry sneak in from the right-hand side of your screen. And just before Moe goes to get it, a little bit like the Charlie Chaplin picking up his hat. Whack the hat before he got it. Put the puck in the net just before Moe could get his glove down on it. Oh, oh, oh. Vancouver Canucks with a 2-0 lead. And now they... The Sharks. At the beginning of this decade, the Sharks of San Jose came into being and we grooved on their uniforms. Now in 94, it's the way the Sharks play hockey that has gripped the country. Game two of the Sharks and Leafs from Toronto. Sharks up 1-0. Pat Burns, not happy. His team trails 1-0 in the series. Wants his team to be aggressive. And aggressive they were. Keep your eye on number 27. Todd Elick gets the stick in his face from Peter Zezel off the faceoff. Elick bloodied. And behind in the second period, 1-0 Leafs. They go up 2-0. Todd Gill the blast. Gartner there for the follow. Still second period, Mark Osborne on the attack. And splits Sharks goalie Archer's Air Bay Leafs up 3-0. They go on to win 5-1. Sharks can't wait to get back to the tank. The Leafs even the series at 1. They get three power play goals after going 0-5 for 5 in game 1. The Sharks were outshot 13-3 in the first period. Canucks and the Stars. Andy Moog's fan club hoping for a big night from the Stars goalie. First period, Cliff Roning. Great fake, and he beats Moog. Bob Ganey, a bit shell shock. Watch Pavel Burry on the left. He's a part hitter. Shane Churla, who didn't return till the third. He missed this in the second. Pavel Burry puts in the rebound past Moog. Bob Ganey, again, a bit hip hypnotized. Kirk McLean, brilliant. The great save, swatting the puck away. 
in the third, more Pavel. The great shot, and you want to see Bob Ganey one more time, this time in a trance as the stars are blank 3-0. The Canucks take a 2-0 lead in the series. Kirk McLean stopped 39 shots for his second shot out of the playoffs. Pavel Bure now has six goals in his last nine playoff games. Chris. Well, the Cubs desperate to end their own. Here's tonight, goaltending, defense, offense, threes are wild. The Rangers lead 3-0 in the game and 3-0 in the series. A big part of that is number two, the defenseman Brian Leach, winner of the Norris Trophy two years ago. Brian Leach has a goal tonight, his fourth. He leads all playoff scorers with 12 points. Here he is doing his other job behind the blue line. Brian Leach plus 17 in these 1994 Stanley Cup playoffs. And joining me now is Brian Leach. I'd like you to get you know, comment on the game. It's almost been a flawless game for the Rangers. Well, our first period was real important for us. We kept the pressure on them. Uh, got some goals and lucky bounces where we got the goals and uh, created some chances the second. Uh, we didn't have much pressure, but uh, we won the period, and that's the biggest part. Ryan, everybody's talking about the New York Rangers and a potential uh, sweep towards the Stanley Cup. I know much of it is generated by the media, uh, but this appears to be a tremendous hockey team. Is it the best you've ever played on? Yeah, it certainly is. Just uh, the most well-rounded. We've got four lines that uh, help out every game, and the scoring's not coming from uh, any two or three players. It's coming right down uh, from everyone. We got a big goal yesterday from Joey Kosher, and, uh, and Richter's been fantastic. So it's it's been certainly a team effort. Mike Keenan gave the team the day off uh, yesterday. Uh, what's he been like as a coach? Your first year with Mike? He's been really good. I think at the beginning of the year he, he sat back and uh, kind of watched in training camp and got a feel for the players and then started to uh, shape, his, shape the team the way he wanted to. And uh, whenever we strayed from uh, hard work ethic and, uh, and concentration, he got us right back online with some discipline and hard work. But uh, most of the time, he's, he's just kept us on course and kept us uh, a, a game at a time uh, attitude. And it's really worked. Interesting how the modern day NHL works. So you guys were such a great hockey team throughout most of this season. And then they make a couple of changes. They bring in some other guys. There was some tinkering done. Um, I guess it helped the chemistry. Yeah, it, uh, well, we bring in guys like, first of all, Anderson, McTavish. They've uh, been through the wars many times, and uh, they're great people. So that, that was no problem having them. And then with Matteau and Noonan, uh, they're also good uh, people off the ice. So that wasn't a problem. And on the ice, uh, they fit in great. So uh, we were lucky. Um, I think the management did a good job with uh, bringing in people that had good character as well as good players. All right, congratulations and good luck the rest right, of the way. Thanks a lot. Brian Leach, the great defenseman of the New York Rangers, leads all... feel that one. Take a shot with us next time as Brute presents Hockey Week. If you have any questions or comments regarding... Minutes, ...the San Jose Arena will play host to Game 3 of the Western Conference semifinals between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the San Jose Sharks. This best of seven series is tied at one game apiece. Good evening and welcome... Tonight at Maple Leaf Gardens, Game 1. Toronto would strike quickly. Just two and a half minutes into period number one, Wendell Clark in front. His second goal, the playoffs, and the Leafs go up one to nothing. Sharks would pull even in the first. Johan Garbalov to Larianov, the wrist shot past Potvin, and it was one to one. Second period, Archer Survey gets caught again. The third time in the playoffs, he cannot get back in front of the net. Mark Osborne makes him pay, and Toronto would go up two to one in this game. Late second period, Shades of junior hockey days for Ray Whitney and Pat Falloon. Falloon, his first career playoff goal, and again, we were tied at two apiece. Then the game winner for the San Jose Sharks. Under three minutes, Garpenloff would start it, get a little help from Makarov and Larianov, and then Garpenloff finishes it. 
left side past Felix Potvin. The Sharks again come up big in game one. They win it three to two, take a one game to none lead over Toronto. Herbe, 29 saves. Larianoff and Garpilov, a goal and an assist. Kevin on Wednesday, game two, Kevin Constantine, his magic. hoping for the same intensity as game one. What he saw was too much Maple Leaf. Dmitry Miranov puts the lead, leaps up 1-0 on the power play. Some controversy here. Did the puck get into the net? Replay show yes. Top of the net, the puck then bounces out 1-0 lead. Toronto extends their lead. Mike Gardner in front on the Todd Gill miss. 2-0 to nothing, Toronto, Short then just four handed. minutes later, Mark Osborne beats the Sharks. Tom Peterson on the left side, a shorthanded goal, and it was 3-0 Toronto. Moving on to the third period, Toronto continued the offensive pressure. Dave Ellett, great pass in front of Doug Gilmore, another power play goal, 4-0 Toronto. Wendell Clark would soon make it 5-0 after the miss. He puts in the loose puck past Herbe, and it was 5-0 Maple Leafs. Sharks avoid the Potvin shutout on the Ozolins miss. Gaetan Duchesne, first goal of the playoffs. That was it for the Sharks, a 5-1 Toronto victory. Series is even at one game apiece. Toronto 3 for 7 in the power play as they outshoot the Sharks 13 to 3 in period number one. San Jose only 20 shots on goal compared to 38 for Toronto. The Sharks' number one line of Makarov, Larianov, Garbalov, two goals, two assists in game one, but they were shut out in game two. And Doug, interesting strategies on both sides out there. Now he goes back. They haven't been pressuring him. Great pass, Patty Floon breaking down the wing. This was game one. Result. Sharks win. But we see a change in game two. You're going to see it. Igor is here. They're going to be looking for him, the defenseman. He's going to go up, circle back. Normally he would get it there. Their people are right up in his face. Unlike the first game, they're back here. They finish the check on him. They can't get the puck to him. That prevents that line from really having the impact that they desire. The Maple Leafs bring in one of the premier goalies in the National Hockey League in Felix Potvin. They have a defensive-minded game. It's a very aggressive game, too, with all their four checks. What they're going to try and do right off the bat tonight is come in and make big hits. If they can get away with this and the Sharks forwards are not holding up their four checkers, they'll do it all night. Otherwise, they'll wait and they'll meet them up in the neutral zone. So they bang you, they get you in the neutral ice, and then when they get it down in front of Potvin, not only does he have the skill to shut you down, he does some intriguing things from technique standpoint. He really does. Here's a Shark player here who's going to come around and try and jam it in here. He's going to lay his stick down here, which is kind of, it's a technique that a few of the top goalies the last few years have. But what it does is it leaves the top half of the net open which he figures he'll give because it's such a tough shot to come around and throw it up top. Stick is already down, can't go low, makes the save. He's been doing that all year. So you have one option, and that's to go top shot. It is, but very tough when you've got a four checker coming on you in the corner, and it's a very tough shot to pull. One of the keys is Peter Zezel takes all our key face-offs. He's got a great soccer background, as you notice here. Doesn't even look to get a stick in the puck. Spins around, kicks it back. Pele. He is. World Cup here. Only appropriate. <laughs> You're going to see a better angle here on the next face-off against Larianov again. He's going to come in and spin this way, kick it back to his own defenseman. Larianov, one of the best centers in the world. Very tough to, to prevent because he's so strong and he's short and low to the ice. Comes it in, spins, kicks it back. How do you counter it? You've got to get in there low, get your stick in between his legs and prevent him from, from spinning. Special teams, and uh, you know they did it again last game, so... You know, especially with two low-scoring low teams, you know, they're going to play a big role. We're just going to stick to our basics. Get Move the puck. Don't try to do too much. You know, move it around, spread them out a little bit. And, uh, you know, when we do get an opportunity, it, it's not like we didn't have them in game two. But when we do, we just, we got to bear down. You know, we can't just throw it at, at pot, Ben. We got to try to pick a spot, you know, put it up high. And uh, it's no big secret. You know, we get it up high, we're going to score some goals. And uh, so that's basically the bottom line. Uh, like the other night, game two, uh, when you give eight or nine power, power play, uh, I mean, you know uh, your chance to get score on will be, uh, you know, very high. So uh, I, I think special teams going to be a big part of this series, and uh, is the team who's going to be the most disciplined. I think is going to be, uh, is going to get the advantage. Uh, both teams are pretty disciplined teams, and uh, they don't want to take a penalty to, um, you know, to put your your team in jeopardy. There's no doubt uh, that. Uh, uh, they they have a good penalty killing unit. Uh, you know our power play is is, is really picked up uh, since the playoffs started, and uh, it's going to win us games. Uh, uh, if it's not going, then it could also lose us games. So, uh, especially teams are, are a big part of uh, you know if even if you don't score a goal on uh, on your power play, you still get the momentum back on your side. And and uh, uh, we've uh, we've really worked on it in the last month and a half, and, and I think it's paying off for us now in the playoffs. Special teams are always important in all series. Uh, was their penalty killing better or was our power play better? And that's the question. 
the numbers show Toronto road road warriors when it comes to the power play in the playoffs, converting six of 14 away from Toronto. Sharks have converted four of 14 at the arena. In three games of round one at home, San Jose perfect in the penalty killing against Detroit. One area of concern for San Jose in their The nine. keys, though, was the checking unit of Osborne, Berg, and Zezel, which neutralized the Sharks line of Larionov, Makarov, and Garpenloff. Joining us now from the Toronto Maple Leafs is the coach, Pat Burns. Coach, one of the advantages or luxuries, if you will, at home is you have a say on the last second line substitutions. How does your strategy change when you're on the road? On the clock. Well, it, it's, it's, it's more difficult, obviously. He has the, the last change, but uh, you got to be sharp on it. And you, you can't get too distracted with that because if you do, then what happens is your good players never get on the ice. And uh, there's always a certain danger of worrying about matchups too much. If you get your checking line, only worry about your checking line. The good players like the Gilmores, the Gartners, Clarks don't get out there that much, and you don't want that. Part of the success uh, is the Gilmore and the Andrew Chucks, but some of the, in the playoffs, as you know, role players need to step up. Who are some of the role players, in your opinion, for Toronto that need to improve their game here in the second round? Well, uh, basically, it's, it's playoff hockey. Everybody has a role, and everybody has a role to do. If uh, you're looking at, uh, at numbers and points and assists, that's different. Uh, you know, we have to worry about everybody has a role to do in this hockey club. And whether it be checking or whether it be killing penalties, as long as you fulfill your role, that's what we ask the uh, most out of the players. Pat Burns, coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now for more on the Maple Leafs and the Sharks, let's send it up to the broadcast team, Randy Hahn and the Stemmer, Pete Stemkowski. All right, well, I just realized, Pete, we're back on Sports Channel. That must yeah. mean the Sharks made it to the second round. You noticed. <laughs> All right. Good news. And mingling with the masses here, we are at the Sharks Barbecue and Rally. There's the key word right there is barbecue, and we'll touch on that in just a second. But we're out here in Sharks Alley, and all the fans are gearing up for tonight's playoff game between the Sharks and the Maple Leafs. In fact, here's a couple of fans over here. Excuse me, you can tell me, e either you guys are serious Sharks fans or you just fell off the back of a circus truck. Tell us where your name is. Uh, Jim Butler. And where are you from, Jim? Uh, immediately, I'm from uh, Santa Clara. Originally, I'm from Toronto. Okay, I'll do the shtick here. Just play the straight man okay. now. Okay. All right, tell us about tonight and what the Sharks have to do to win. Uh, I think what they have to do is uh, have a good physical game. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's the key to it. And I think the fans are going to be behind them. I, I'm expecting a really exciting game tonight. And uh, how long does it take to put this on? Uh, about uh, 17 minutes, but who's counting? Yeah, oh, there you go. And, and your friend is? Just Santucci. Where are you from? Santa Clara. Born and raised. And uh, did he convince you to do this or what? Yeah, he twisted my arm all the way. I, had to, I just wouldn't go without, so. All right, and I see you're wearing white. That won't come off at all either. All right, thanks a lot. Here, uh, You know, as I said, though, the barbecue's the key. Let's, let's see what we can come up with here as we walk through the masses. And, uh, gosh, can you believe there's more TV crews here? Who'd have thunk that? Ah, I can see it. I can smell it. I'm walking up here now. It's the barbecue time. I made friends with Maria. Where's Maria? Oh, please, don't say that. Well, can you rustle me up some ribs here and some chicken? And what else do you have? Some bread? Oh, look at that. Hold on. Here we go. Give me a rib sandwich. All right. Hey, that's good for me. I wonder what the crew's going to have. Can't beat it. Big league chow and playoff hockey. And speaking of big league, let's send it back now to the Sports Channel studios and Brian Weber. Ah, uh, Steve Paulson wading into the shallow end of the... Hi, how's it going? Pretty good? Great. Uh, you know what I like about being a season ticket holder here at the Sharks games is I get the same great seat at every single game. This one, right here. And if someone sits in it by mistake, they just say, look, I'm sorry, but that's my seat. You made a mistake. Unless they're huge, tremendous, big people. Then I go get the usher to say it, say it for me. Call 287-7070 for season ticket and get first dibs on next year's playoff action. Plus all this, Sharks hockey, you have to be there.
home sweet home for the San Jose Sharks as Sports Channel proudly brings you game three of the Stanley Cup Western Conference semifinals. In a few moments, the house will explode as their fans rally the Sharks against the other guys, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to San Jose Arena. I'm Randy Hahn. Welcome to game three of this best of seven series. In other places, they're saying they're boring. In fact, even Doug Gilmore says our styles are very similar. People say we play ugly hockey, but we play ugly hockey, too. This time, we were able to frustrate them before they frustrated us. That was after game two, and Rob Goodrow of the Sharks said this after game two, the 5-1 loss. It seems like we always make it hard on ourselves. We could have made it easy on ourselves with a win but we never make things easy. Pete Stankowski is here. Pete, I think... See, the fans are fired up here. Pete, in game three of the last series, the Sharks stumble smart. Buy the Discover card. It pays to discover. By Gillette Sensor and the new Gillette series. Gillette, the best a man can get. By Payne Weber, we believe our most important investment is an investment in relationships. By your local Chevrolet Geo dealer. Come in today and see our new cars and trucks. And by Budweiser. Beachwood age for a crisp, clean, classic taste. The Sharks hope to go two games to one in front of Toronto. We're at San Jose Arena. Game three is next. Native land, through patriot love, in all thy sons command me. at San Jose Arena, and this building is electric tonight. In goal, Felix Potvin for the Toronto Maple Leafs. The 22-year-old has gone the distance for the Leafs. Five wins, three losses, and three shutouts, and doesn't he have the numbers? A 1.75 goals against average. Arthur Zerbe has gone all but one period of the playoffs for the Sharks. Played in nine games, won five, lost four, and a goals against average of 3.82. Referee is the veteran Andy Van Helleman, the linesman Kevin Collins, and Dan Shakti, and Larry Warner is the video goal judge here tonight. And what an ovation from this sellout crowd for the Sharks, and particularly Urbe, who was welcomed back with open arms after the Sharks lost game 2-5-1, and these fans... gives the league any money, by the way, right? The rest of them, we got to pay to get on all the rest of those other places. Now... We asked to have a guy come on like Bellary Melrose last year, you remember? Right. And we can't get on. We asked this guy here, Constantine, or it was Constantine. Kevin Constantine. Whatever Sharks he is. No guest tonight. No guest, and he's the guy that did it. 
and we can't get a guess. Not that I care. They're not that good anyhow. But we pay all that toll. These guys, who do these guys think they are that they can't have a guest? I remember I was in the seventh game. I had uh, Jean Rattel. A little rock of Sakamaki from him. Vancouver. Let's go. Watch this. Antoski threw a little elbow in that. Yeah, yeah, game. he did. Oh, it's just he missed, though. I tell you, boy, this has been. They had no prisoners. They had no prisoners in Calgary, and they had no prisoners in this one. This is a tough series. This is a way when they wear the Boston blue and black, they've got to play like this. I'm telling you, boy, this is a good series. Now, when you see the elbow at the end, folks, Shirley's been giving him a hard time. See? That was now, game watch, one. So. Yeah. Now watch this, Wango, elbow of elbows. Now I was sitting home. I was going to show. I was going to show some elbows, you know, on uh, Sunday. But uh, the three best I think I've ever seen. And, and you said it's Mother's Day. Well, Rose throws a few elbows. Anyhow, we got three of the best coming up right now. Let's see them right now. Three great elbows. Gordy Howe would be proud. Now watch this one. You all remember this one, Messi on Natras. Looked like he had a few when he gets up. Had this on rock and stuff. <laughs> Poor Rick. <laughs> That's a good one or what? Way to go, Rick. You didn't stay down, kid. Get in there. Now we got another one coming, but this one wasn't funny. You remember Trent Yanni mm -hmm. and Ludwig, what he just did to Jelena? The thing, this one wasn't funny. We won't stay long on this one. Oh, that was tough. Trent that was seriously tough hurt there. Hey, come on. He was all right. Looked and like uh, Titoff earlier in the year with J.J. Daniel. Yeah, so when he comes back, I think we're going to go to show Bird one that. again. Anyhow, get off, get off that. Brutal. Now here it is again. Watch this here one. He's a tough little guy. Now, I got one thing to say before we go. Remember, I was the guy on Burry and everything. That was a good one. He's all right. Shirley's okay. Get up. Remember, I was the guy that said on Burry, he had no goals. I like the way he never quit, trying. and he's back here trying right now. I don't like you showing those elbows, but it's late at night, so maybe no harm done. Uh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The, the Fair Play Commission are, 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 are to bed now. They've had their tea and crumpets, and all the kids are in bed. But the Fair Play Commission, they... They're going to bed Lots now. of them live in the West, too. They're up. You know what the number one industry before? What? Silicon chips, computer oh, chips. Oh, by the way, I, I want to ask you about this silicon stuff, eh? It's right, silicone. three years ago. Isn't that Wait. neat? The new Hockey Hall of Fame honors almost 300 of the game's greatest contributors. Throughout the postseason, we present many of them on Hockey's Great Wall. It's brought to you by Ford of Canada, a proud founding sponsor of the Hockey Hall of Fame and makers of the 1995 Windstar. Tonight, a player with an explosive temper and the talent to match. The great Eddie Shore is up in 1947 after a playing career that saw him play 14 seasons, 13 of those with Boston. There, he set a standard of excellence in raw brute force that's still unrivaled. Shore came to the Bruins in 1926 after beginning his pro career in the Western League. He's the only defender to win the Hart Trophy four times. He was voted to the All-Star team on eight occasions and played for two Stanley Cup champions. Shore's ability was combined with a fierce determination that saw him knock down anyone who stood in his way. For that matter, any of his teammates. Eddie Shore, one of the all-time greats to appear in the to the Dallas Stars, too. Jordan. shows you the strength that he has on his skates. Good, couple of good chances prior to that by Duchesne and Ellick. But watch Dahlin, literally does this by himself. He's gonna have Jamie McCallum hanging all over him right there, coming over, but Dahlin just fired in front of the net and hit something and went in. Ulf Dahlin gets his fourth goal of the playoffs. The Sharks are leading 3-1, and they have knocked Felix Potvin, I think, yeah, out of the game. Yep, there he one. is on the bench talking to Pat Burns, or Burns is doing the talking, Potman the listening, and we're going to see Damian Rhodes. Yeah, Damian Rhodes, number one, is getting his equipment together, and I think what Pat Burns is saying to his guys, settle down. Maybe he'll put him back in there, but that's the man that he's going to have to go with in the playoffs is Felix Potman, and there's no question about it that he is rattled. Well, I'll tell you what, Pete, as we look at Rhodes' numbers, regular season, 9-7-3, and three, he makes his first ever playoff appearance. This is the second straight game that Potvin has played poorly in this building. You'll recall late in the regular season when the Sharks beat Toronto 5-3, he said it was his worst game of the year. He's never won in this building, and he comes back right after his worst performance and maybe comes up with one that's a little worse than that. We'll see. But for now, he's done, and Damian Rhodes occupies the Toronto net and will try and 
salvage this difficult situation for the Leafs. Well, we talked about the two goals that were scored, Randy, from far out. When goalkeepers have trouble from that distance, you know he's going to have a bad night. And that one on Donald, he came around. I know he whipped it from rather a bad angle there, and I don't think that Potvin really was on that short side. And that's the reason he went down. And hey, he look at who's coming in. back. Yeah, Potvin yeah. is coming back in goal. Well, you had a feeling that something was up. Here's, Here's the Dolan goal right here. See what happens when he shoots it right, and does it hit something? No, it just went right under Potvin's pad over there. And you had a feeling when Burns was talking to Potvin that he'd come <laughs> back into this hockey game sometime, and here he is. Well, that just took the place of using his timeout. You're going to see the puck in front by Andrichuk firing it out in front, and there's Borchevsky getting bowled over by Duchesne right at the last moment, but got a little bit on it, and Irby was in the right spot. Boy, he had a full set of hair there. I wonder how old they were then. Well, just young, just young 17. lads. They were about, those are high school uh, age, That's 17. Right. We left to your screen. Here it is. I don't know yeah, that, where that one happened. Here's where the, the coincidentals took place with Baker and Gill. But prior to that, Andy. Van <laughs> took all of 12 seconds for Dollar. Look, nobody takes them. Gets that body out. People looking for other people. Maybe hoping Donald will pass it off. Look at McGowan playing attention over to Whitney over on the other side. The feed comes in, but doesn't really do much. And Donald just sneaks right on through. A great effort by Oath Donald. Look, he comes right out, gets the stick back on, the puck back on his stick, and able to shovel it underneath Felix Potvin. Power play goal in a 4-1 Shark League. 4-1 Sharks. <laughs> Dolan has the last two goals, and that's the first. It's been a goal of ours to get as many shots as we can up to McLean and, uh, you know, make him work for his saves. We've been uh, throwing everything we can at him, uh, shots from far out, from close in, and he's been doing a great job. But, you know, our goals are, uh, you know, shots from down low, which we want to try to concentrate on doing, and uh, as many rebounds as we can. That was the story on your goal, uh, your first of the series against Vancouver. Uh, you got your own rebound. Uh, take us through it. Well, Dean obviously made a good play of uh, keeping it in. I was able to get a snapshot and uh, you know, getting those second efforts, and that was the key. Uh, you know, McLean made the first save and was able to get up the rebound and get it back at him. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that's uh, a little different for us to have a lead, and it's been, it feels good. And, uh, you know, we wanted to get a lead until Vancouver uh, reacts to that. I know you were getting a little frustrated with yourself. Uh, what did you do? Have a little talk with yourself, or did Bob Ganey have a talk with you? Um, no, we didn't really uh, talk about it. I don't want to get... Uh, you know, too caught up in thinking too much. Just try to go out there and play uh, play good defensive hockey and really uh, be there for my defensemen, uh, be an outlet, easy outlet, and get the puck as soon as I can. Their defensemen are big, and they really like to step up on us. And if I come down a little bit lower, it gives me a little more time with that puck to get my head up and make some plays. And, uh, you know, things have been working out so far for us. Uh, hopefully get back in the series. Mike Medano, thanks for doing this. Uh, good luck to you and the Stars in the third period. Thanks. Mike Medano of the Dallas Stars has been my guest. Uh, they lead the Vancouver Canucks 4-3. to three. Right now, we are going to San Jose to join the Leafs and Stars, Bob Cole and Harry Neal. Gentlemen. Get it. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable fun, man. I'll tell you, these fans are having a ball, and you know, Pete, the way sports goes, enjoy it while it's there, because you just don't know when it's going to happen like this again. And winning is fun, isn't it? Yep. yep. Right here, from Marinoff to Borshevsky, standing up and in good shape. Borshevsky hit him right in the chest with the shot. Herbe has not had a lot to do. Here's a good stop, because Gardner was going to his right. Herbe had to reach back to his left and make what was a much more difficult save than it looked like. Double header on Sunday, Toronto here in San Jose. That's an 8 o'clock start. Before that, Dallas at Vancouver at 5 Eastern. Mention is on for the San Jose Chuck. Well, you give Ulf Dahl in that kind of time, Bob. I mean, he made 26 fakes, changed his mind 25 times, and then stuck it up 
over the glove of Potvin. A brilliant goal. The Leafs, of course, had four men up on the faceoff, lost the draw, and were caught in the three-on-one. Now watch Stalin. He's going to look. He's going to fake. He's going to change his mind. He's going to look, and finally he says, ah, I'll put it in. But 
these fans enjoyed it. I think uh, I think Andy's going to throw everybody off. Now Gilmore's getting at the security guy. Kevin Collins, the linesman who escorted Gilmore as far as he could go. Arthur Zerbe's being the caddy, picking up all the stuff here. Well, this series, Harry, has taken a new twist. I'll say this, Bob. The Leafs may benefit from this little skirmish because now I think they have created an enemy. I don't know whether the Sharks will benefit from it. They certainly did not take a back seat in any physical area tonight like they did in game two. So Sunday afternoon, we're going to see Hodgers and Allen had banged each other about five times, and you can see they came together again, and that's what started it. The officials are going down. Shackney, he's trying to get in early. He goes flying, then Collins gets knocked down, and of course, they're all in it here. Gilmore ended up tangled with Ozelinch, a lot bigger than he. Collins is still giving instructions to Andy. I think Andy, what he should do is just get everybody that was on out of here. See if he can get this 37 seconds left out of the way without another skirmish. Well, they've got the, the ice. Here's Lefty Lefty out there handing the equipment to Archer Zerbe. Lefty looks like he was bitten by a shark not too long ago. Is one of the cameraman's favorite shark fans. We've seen her a number of times tonight. Old Dolan with a hat trick in the hockey game. The only goal in the third period was scored by Dolan at 17:38, and that pretty well put it out of reach for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You saw Gilmore in the fight, and uh, here comes Mike Gardner. The Leafs had an extra man out here because, of course, they had their goalie out. So when the Leaf bench saw Gilmore getting involved with Zozolins a lot bigger than he, they were screaming at one of their teammates to get over and give him a hand. Wayne Thomas, Kevin Constantine, talking it over on the bench. Rogers, a legitimate tough guy, hasn't played much. First shift in the hockey game. Well, Andy Van Helleman has sorted it out and wants to get these last seconds out of the way. Everyone that was on the ice is gone. And Gartner, as you say, Bob, I don't know that you can give him the third minute. <laughs> Everyone was in by the time he started, but you'll get an extra two minutes tacked on him. There hasn't been one person leaves the rink. The seats look just as full now as they were when the game started. The only players in position as we speak, the two goaltenders, Urbe and Potvin, has now returned to the event. And only 37 seconds left in this third period. So the Sharks are going to take a 2-1 series lead over Toronto with two more games here in San Jose. Well, they split the first two so that the Sharks won a whole ice advantage by defeating the Leafs in that first game. That was a terrific jump and a great confidence builder. Not that they needed any confidence building having taken care of Detroit. That 2-3-2 two, two, and you lose the first home game and then you lose game three, boy, that, that puts the Leafs in a desperate situation here for Sunday. Puck is shot across center. And 18 seconds left in the third period. Urban staying from 200 feet. 10 seconds. And we'll let the crowd take it down to the end of this one. They get down to 3.4 seconds, and the play is called. 
Bill Burt's going to get a penalty here, Bob. He's going to be sent right to the dressing room. High sticking call on him. Somebody else. Berg was roaring around here. He'd been, he had a real hit and took the, came up on the short end of it on Sean Cronin. He's going in right here. And they're going to give Osborne the penalty on Peterson, I believe, but Berg could have easily earned one as well. Three seconds to go, and Helen wants to get this thing over with. So no further trouble develops. Irby had gone to the bench on the delayed penalty, and they just talked him into going back. Just over three seconds, and this one is over. They'll drop it in. That'll be it. The Sharks win it. Five to two. And wait a minute. We may not be done yet. Well, at least to be smart to get off. Keep thinking about Sunday's game. Never mind causing any trouble here tonight. shots were 27 21 in favor of San Jose it was their game from start to finish Dolan with the hat trick Arian Baker also scored 5-2 final and we'll be back after this Jose Sharks come home and they win to go ahead 2-1 in the series the Molson three stars in tonight's game Nikolai Borshevsky of the Leafs strikes twice he's the lone Leaf on the three star ballot as you can imagine Lots of Sharks played well. Jamie Baker among them is the number two star and the number one star, a man who's seen this act before when with Minnesota a few years back. Alf Dolan with the hat trick to lead the Sharks to a three-goal victory over the Toronto Maple Leafs. We'll hear from Jamie and more when we continue on Molson Hockey Night. Guys like Ronning, Furry, Courtnell, you don't always have to be the strongest. A huge vote of confidence for Lafayette. Off to the right of Andy Moak. During the camera face-off in San Jose, we will be going there to show you the game between the Sharks and the Maple Leafs. For viewers in the rest of the country, we will provide you with the overtime coverage from Vancouver. And then, as part of our Hockey Night in Canada doubleheader, you will be joining the San Jose-Toronto game. I imagine uh, dinner for some of our mums in the audience might be a little late today as they're... Uh, <laughs> Sons or daughters. The first one is sorry to your goaltender, and the next one is thank you. Burray loses the puck in mid ice. Courtnell with a crafty little move to get a shot with McLean, who has been positioned perfectly, with the exception of one time this afternoon. Gobbles that one up. Russ Courtnell has been the busiest shooter today. That's his seventh of the hockey game. He established a Dallas club record this year for a right winger with 57 assists, but he would dearly love a goal. In this difference in ice time. Obviously, Pat Quinn using Burry in a lot more situations. Shifts the same. That means that Burry has got a lot of long shifts, and it might mean that Medano is able to explode a little bit more than Burry might in the overtime period. But after having and it's over, five four for the star. Chicago with the puck at their own blue line. Winery trying to step the center. Used to the line, kept in breeze, wash shot, deflected, Casey down, they score! Kirk Fuller is the overtime hero of game five. Roberts against Siddick. He has Neuendijk with him, but Siddick breaks it up. Here's a chance now for Corto. Corto going in alone. Presley at the front, can't get it through driver. Go again. Centered one off of Albaline, and it's scored! Murray has it in the corner. He's being watched by Fleury. Murray getting set. Let's the shot go through traffic. They got it away. They score! Listen! Along the board from Linda.
to go first overtime. Devils have had a couple of great opportunities. Played ahead to Oates. from this base off, a chance for Riche, breaking right in, here's Riche, moving, score! Riche in overtime! The Devils have won! The series is even, and it now becomes a best of three! Jelena puts it back to the point, Lume! The Capitals are desperately attempting to force it. Taken on water. There wasn't one. So they don't play well in game four. They come out here. They've got their hands full because the renewed confidence that the Capitals gained in game four is very evident. The Capitals are playing, I think, just about as well as they can play. They've got all cylinders pumping right now, and that will force the Rangers to see just how good they really are. Dale Hunter goes on the penalty. There again, M.C. off cutting to the net. Carry a stick. I like the skating, the scoring, the passing. I like that you don't shake hands with your opponent until the very end of a playoff series. I like the Zamboni. I like the hitting. I love the Bruins. <laughs> <laughs> I like how they throw a dead octopus on the ice in Detroit during the playoffs. I like that when somebody does something bad, they go to the box. I like the fact that right now I'm going to break away with the greatest player of all time. I don't like the fact that he's not capitals. Finally broke through winning game four Saturday night. New York Rangers a chance to win the second round series at home on Monday with a little extra incentive. You see, earlier in the day, the regular season champions had no one nominated for any of hockey's postseason awards. That includes goaltender Mike Richter between the pipes for New York. one nothing Rangers, capped shorthanded, Kevin Hatcher just clearing it the length of the ice, and it goes in from 140-plus feet away. How did that happen? Look at the replay. Mike Keenan does. Puck was spinning, kind of hits a edge, takes a weird hop, and just like that, tied at one. But the Rangers come back. Leach to Adam Graves, feathers the perfect pass. 2-1 Rangers. 55 seconds later, Sergei Zubov the shot. Estetik in between the legs. 3-1 New York on Don Beaupre, who is pulled in favor of Rick Chaparacci. But the Caps answer, Sean Anderson on the rebound. Can't fault Richter there. Great three on two. He did give up the rebound, though. Three two Rangers after two. Some encouragement from Adam Graves heading to the locker room. But 27 seconds into the third, Sylvain Cote ties it at three. And the Rangers have to be wondering what's going on. But late in the third, Kevin Hatcher can't clear. Zubov keeps it in to Brian Leach. Neither one nominated for the Norris Trophy. And the two defensemen who led the Rangers hook up on the series-winning goal. Would it be? Could Richter make it stand up? Well, the Caps put on tremendous pressure, send everyone to the net, and Hatcher's shot is stopped by Richter, and he gloves the rebound. Shoney thought that this one was headed to overtime. But instead, the Caps are headed to the first tee, and the Rangers to the third round, becoming the first of hockey's final four. Brian Leach snubbed for the Norris, scored the winner, assisted on the other three goals. Rangers' first semifinal trip since 86. The next series starts Sunday at the Garden. Who will they play? The Charles Corral Series on the road. The road team winning each game. Martin Brodeur in the Nets for the Devils. Claude Lemieux hit the post. Scoreless after one. Corey Millen only playing because Bill Guerin is injured. Set up by Bobby Carpenter. 1-0 Devils in the second. Claude Lemieux in on the breaker. And John Casey turns it away. It just went wide. Ally Afraidy, the tough guy. Watch the finesse play here to prevent the breakaway. Remember Felix from The Odd Couple when Oscar got locked in the basement with the armored suit in Halloween? Well, that was him. In any case, <laughs> Lemieux to Carpenter and it's 2-0 Devils. In the final minute of the second period, the Devils took but one shot in the third. They got defensive-minded and it worked. Ending the road dominance, the Devils have won the last three in the series. It was going to play game six, Brodeur or Terrari, who won games three and four in Boston. Well, the Devils can close it out Wednesday in Boston. A game you'll see on the Deuce at 7.30 Eastern. Sure survey. Sharks make a little noise late. A pair of third period goals. One by Ellick 
and this shorthanded goal by Rob Goodrow to make it 7-3. Mark Osborne added a late Toronto goal for the final score of 8-3. Toronto comes up big in Game 4 to even this series at two games apiece. The eight goals allowed by the Sharks, the most San Jose has given up in the playoffs. Doug Gilmore, a goal and four assists in Game 4. Two goals, nine assists now in the series. San Jose, one of eight on the power play. They are now two for 23 in the series versus Toronto goalie Felix Potvin. 27 saves. He looks so calm out there and cool, and, and he just doesn't get nervous out there. You, you've watched him, or I've watched him now for a couple of years, and there's a knock that maybe plays too deep in his net or something. But I just find that uh, he doesn't ever get rattled. Like I said, even after a bad game, uh, you know, in Toronto, it's pretty tough to play, and they're pretty critical at times. And uh, he just seems to keep going and going, and uh, nothing bothers him. And you seem to think, uh, Bill Berg, they all they all take the body, they make it really he hard to play against. He hit the series delivered by one incredible of the hit. That's an incredible hit. Yet he does it all the time, and that's what's so important about uh, uh, the Toronto team and their hitting. And Wendell Clark, he, he does it all. He hits, and uh, even guys like Doug Gilmore, somebody that's not really known to be a big player, he plays hard and he plays big. Uh, that's what uh, experience. Come back. Uh, 220 pounds. Uh, great mobility in the corners and with the hands and the skating all put together and can shoot the puck. Uh, he kind of reminds me of a Mario Lemieux in a way when you watch him. Uh, with it's the, a big label. Yeah, with, with, this, uh, with his mobility and size and uh, hands and everything. Had time to buy a hat or a trinket, but we're not done. Team effort, do you do anything different for Game 5? No, I think the, the biggest thing that we got to do is we got to come out hungry right off the bat. We've got to play this as a do-or-die situation. We don't want to go home. Uh, down by a game, we want to go ahead by a game. Now talk about when you get the puck and you go behind the net, are you acting as the quarterback there and do you have set plays that you're looking for with Clark and Andrew Chuck? Well, in the offensive zone when I'm behind the net, uh, a guy like Dave Anichuk so big, he uh, parks himself in front of the net and he's very, very hard to move. Uh, a guy like Wendell, he'll kind of move in the slot through the holes at the right time and it's uh, very simple for me to walk out and make that pass. So. That's where I do like to set up when I do have time, but other than that, a lot of times they don't give you the time to, time to set up back there. All right, Doug Gilmore from the Toronto Maple Leafs, and now for more... ...the alleged police protection. The threats allegedly came back in February from a woman who Gilmore claims said, if Doug's not giving me the time of day, I'm going to kill him. Gilmore now believes he is safe. Gilmore not only leads the Leafs in postseason scoring, but the entire league. The Leafs and Sharks tied at two games apiece. Gilmore and the Leafs looking to get that one-game advantage, but would it be... This man, Sergei Makarov, just over a minute into the game, Makarov picks up the loose puck, in on Felix Potvan, and the Cat loses one life. one nothing Sharks. The Leafs strike back. Power play, another Russian name, Dmitry Miranov. One times it through a crowd, we're tied at one. We have more. Still in the first, 2-1 Sharks, more. Fireworks from the Russians, Igor Larionov, slopper stop. Makarov there, 3-1 Sharks. Second period, now 4-2. Vlastimil Krupa, the spin, and Todd Ellick deflects. 5-2 Sharks in the end. Archers Urbe gets mobbed as the Sharks win it by a score of 5-2. They lead the series 3-2. Game 6 is Thursday. Urbe, 27 saves. Makarov, 2 goals, 2 assists. Leafs, Sharks. We just saw that. How about the Canucks and the Stars? Last time the Canucks went past round 282. They could clinch the series right now. Canucks up 2-1. Jeff Courtenall, the Craven. It is 3-1. Third period, same score. Pavel Bure, look out. Andy Moog, down and out. 4-1 Canucks, 4-2 in the third. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Incoming. The Canucks, 4. The Stars, 2. Vancouver wins the series 4-1. to They face the winner of the San Jose-Toronto game. A series, I should say. Vancouver, seventh win in their last eight. Burray had two goals. Their first conference final. The blows and the puck goes down the ice. The goalie jumps and the players bump and the fans all go insane. Someone roars, Bobby scores at the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, take me where the hockey players face off down the rink. And the Stanley Cup is all filled up for the champs who win the drink. 
Now the final flick of a hockey stick and a one gigantic scream. The puck is in, the home team wins the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey Can't say it better than Stompin' Tom Connors, a national theme this evening. The Canucks and the Leafs, Vancouver at Toronto in the Stanley Cup playoffs for the first time ever. A Canadian team going to the Stanley Cup for sure. Good evening. Welcome to Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC or more aptly. Welcome to Canada Night in Hockey. The Gardens is jumping and you know so will the Pacific Coliseum be on Friday. Two teams as loose as a Canada goose. Both these teams have dodged bullets the size of missiles. You're glued to the set this evening. Somewhere around the world, Johan Garpenloff and Robert Reichel are shaking their heads. For the Vancouver Canucks, a beautiful roll. They didn't expect to get on this roll. It's the best spring in Vancouver since 12 years ago when the team went to the final and Harry Neal was bowling on this very night because that's when the Islanders cinched it. For Toronto, it's a little bit of a mood shift from a year ago. More worry than wonder. But the fishing trip's over. Here are the fans to greet their men. on the expectations of their opponents. Well, I don't expect anything different than we've seen from them before. They, uh, they try to play a physical game against us, and uh, while we haven't always responded, obviously if we expect to go on, we better respond in this series. The Canucks right now are playing very well, uh, you know, with uh, Kirk McClain's having a great playoff series, and that's and Trevor Lynn probably playing the best hockey I've ever seen him play, and, and uh, I guess Pat Elbury shaking off uh, a lot of the doubters out there, and uh, he's playing very, very well. He's going to have to be tended to now. Uh, we know it's going to be a physical series, much more physical than what we had against the San Jose Sharks. I think the two big teams will be clashing, and uh, who knows what could happen. Both men figure it'll be physical. 2-3-2 two, two really worries Pat Burns, sir. Absolutely. They really have to win both these games in Maple Leaf Gardens, or they're playing from behind, and that did cause them a lot of trouble against San Jose. The Canucks have been so good on the road in the playoffs. This is a big task for the Leafs. Okay, uh, the big thing is Burns wants to use two lines maybe against Pavel Bure. Can you play six forwards at the same time? Bure is going to be a problem. You can't worry about him after he gets the puck. You got to have somebody near him so the passers discouraged from giving it to him, and you have to try and cut those passing lanes off. It's going to be a huge challenge to the Leaf defenseman because he's going to get away one-on-one -on -one a number of times in this series. Well, in the broadcast booth this evening, Harry providing the accounts and joining you in a moment, Bob Cole was on hand this morning to welcome Trevor Linden to Toronto. Bob will have the accounts of game one of this Western Conference Final, and as you see, none of the Canucks wanted to talk to Don. <laughs> All right, the lineups for the game. Let's go to Paul Morris. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game one of the Western Conference Final. Tonight's lineup for the Vancouver Canucks. Number one, Kurt McLean. Number 35, Kay Whitmore. Number three, Brett Edekin.
Number four, Gerald Diddick. Number seven, Cliff Ronnie. Number eight, Greg Adams. Number ten, Pavel Bure. Number fourteen, Jeff Hartnell. Number fifteen, John McIntyre. Number sixteen, Trevor Linden. Number nineteen, Tim Hunter. Number twenty-one, Yoke Lume. Number twenty-two, Jeff Brown. 23, Martin Angelina. Number 25, Nathan Lafayette. Number 27, Sergio Momesso. Number 28, Brian Glenn. Number 29, Gino Oje. Number 32, Murray Craven. Number 44, Dave Pepper. Assistant coaches are Rick Lee, Ron Smith, and Stan Smeal. And that's head coach Pat Quinn. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's lineup for your Toronto Maple Leafs. Number one, Damian Rose. Number 29, Felix Putman. Number two, Sylvain Lafay. Number three, Bob Rose. Number four, Dave Ellis. Number ten, Bill Bird. Number eleven, Mike Gartner. Number fourteen, Dave Anderson. Nikolai Borshevsky. Number 17, Wendell Clark. Number 18, Kent Vanderbilt. Number 21, Mark Osborne. Number 22, Ken Baumgartner. Number 25, Peter Zezel. Number 26, Mike Kuchelniski. Number 32, Mike Eastwood. Number 34, Jamie McCown.
position, 41-27. The Canucks have had five days off, Toronto won. Hello, Canada, from coast to coast, and welcome to game one of the Western Conference Final. Here's Kirk McLean. He's having a great playoff. He comes in with a 2.33 goals against average and a very impressive 9.26 save percentage. Felix Potvin in seven home playoff starts. Potvin has allowed only nine goals over 13 games now. His average is 2.36. There's the referee, Dan Marowelli. Kevin Collins and Dan Shackney will work the lines. I'm Bob Cole in the booth with Harry Neal. And we have a new view for you tonight. There's the camera we have set in the net. In behind Felix Puttman as we start this first period and in front of Puttman will be Gil and Ellen, Gilmore, Gardner and Clark for Vancouver. Hedekin and Brown, the defenseman in front of McLean with Malesso, Ronning and Jelenon. We are underway. The conference final. First two games here. A ship to Vancouver then for three, four and a necessary five. Game. Gardner took the pass. He'll about how the Leafs can control Pavel Burry. That is their biggest assignment. There's no doubt about that. And Doug Gilmore took a big hit from Sergio Mameso early in this game. He will not be a protected species in the eyes of the Canucks. I can guarantee you that. The Vancouver big line is on. Trevor Linden, Burry, and Adams. Didik and Babich are the defensemen. The Leafs shoot it in with Zezel. Whitest and the whitest vapor trail in the National Hockey League. We'll see it before this game ends. Imagine. Picked up in the fourth round. Then they had to go to Mr. Ziegler and appeal the fact that he was eligible for the draft. What a break that was for the Canucks. And what a smart move it was to draft when all the other teams thought he wasn't eligible. Back to the blue line. Fave shot. Tip wide of the goal. Here's Trevor Linden, a long pass. Now we'll see whether Quinn will put out another line. As so there is a little matchup game going here. Manderville's got the Burray assignment. Pat Quinn paid Burry a great compliment. He said he's been inspired by the fact the opponents have played such close physical attention to him. Having the great ones all had that quality. From the faceoff, Toronto on the draw. In back to the net, it's centered off the boards. Comes all the way down the ice for McLean. And Linden had a good chance. Well, Pavel Burry on a turnover. Makes a cute little play to try and beat the defenseman. Here it is right here, watch this. Off the skate, up to the backhand, and by the time he got it, he was a little too far in. Never mind whether it works, Bob. How many guys would even try that move at this time of the year? Automatic. What a great hockey player. He'll be exciting in this series. He's helped to lift the Canucks so long. I only like him a bit. Cruz is a hockey fan. This is the third playoff game he's seen. Everybody in the country at this time is a hockey fan now, I would say. In this country, that's for sure. Bird playing it up. A little deep into the corner. And here goes Babbage for Vancouver. Took a hit from Osborne. The puck gets out of center ice, so... The boot. Great penalty killing by the two lead penalty killing forwards. Manderville is right out there to deflect that puck out. You can see Ellett in front, and the Leafs penalty killing is... The referee come over and warn you, Bob. Then you have no excuse, and neither do your players, if they get a penalty for the shoving and pushing after the whistle. It's a good move by Marowelli. Face off to the left of Kirk McLean. Three three. They played game by both teams, especially defensively. There's been some good hits. There's been some excellent defensive decisions. McCowan stands up on a two-on-two -two rush. Very nicely here at the blue line to make sure Linden doesn't go where he wants to go. Bird is going to try and hit Burry every time he can. There's another look at the McCowan check. 
You are not going to intimidate Pavel Burry. He's a chunky, tough guy. And you're not going to get a big hole hit at him very often either. You can get a handful of pressure in the coach's corner. And the score at the end of the first period. I'm coming down. That's what I'm talking to him, you kids. And when you see Leach going in, he should have been back out here. But it all began in the minors, where Worsley won several awards before moving on to the New York Rangers, where he won the Calder Trophy in 1953. Later, he was dealt to Montreal, where he backstopped the Habs to four Stanley Cups. His career average is sparkling 2.91. The only thing better is playoff performances. His average there, 2.82 in 70 postseason games. Gump Worsley, our hero this evening on Hockey's Great Wall, presented by Ford of Canada, makers of the 1995 Windstar. Not quite as much as he usually plays, but before it's all over, these two guys will play a lot more. The other two big-time scorers for each team, Linden and Clark, about 30 seconds apart in ice time. Face off to the left of Putman, and it's knocked into the corner where Zessel picks Voici le nom d'Aran, à la droite du but. Une rondelle qui est recouvrée par euh, John McLean. McLean s'avance bien avec Bernie Nichols. Est-ce qu'on va garder le jeu blanc Oui, le tir est bloqué par euh, Richter. Là, on tente de sortir la rondelle de chez soi. Ce sera fait par Larmer. Larmer est contré, c'est gardé par McLean. En zone adverse, mais c'est Zuboff qui vient récupérer. 6 minutes et 12 secondes. À la période. Voici Zuba. Il y a longtemps qu'il a la rondelle. Il réussit à faire une passe qui est redirigée à la droite du filet de Brodeur. C'est pris par euh, Niedermeyer. Niedermeyer qui a perdu. Voilà, maintenant, Karpov fait un tir. Oh, il a donné du mal à Brodeur qui a réussi tout de même à faire dévier la rondelle sur sa droite. Voici Dowd. Il est contré. Là, c'est la contre-attaque qui se prépare, mais dans son repli, on a enlevé la rondelle à l'adversaire. Un beau repli de Randy McKay. Voilà Richer, c'est pour McKay, deux contre avec Down, avec Richer encore, il recule la rondelle, il a un mais même Chinoff l'a fait dévier et elle tombe chez les spectateurs. La soirée de Joaquin Molson vous présente les séries et les pro tard. Je croyais moi qu'à 9 minutes, euh, même ici, il y avait quand même beaucoup de temps, qu'on le ferait immédiatement. Mais non, on le fait ici à 5 minutes et 31 secondes, avec euh, le bombardement à laquelle il a fait face, 40 tirs sur, dont 15 en troisième période. Ça peut près temps, ça peut près temps qu'on y pense. Pour le reposer pour le prochain match. Voici euh, Ken Danico derrière le but. Il était blessé, oui. il était blessé oui. également avec la fatigue. Le jeu répété. Non seulement les lancers qu'il a dû, les arrêts qu'il a dû exécuter, les tirs en cette direction qui l'obligent à bouger. C'est vrai. Mais les attaques étaient soutenues, Gilles, comparativement au dernier match. On lui demandait avant la rencontre de ce soir s'il était épuisé suite aux attaques, des nombreuses attaques et nombreux tirs des, des Rangers. Il a dit non parce qu'il ne reste pas souvent dans ma zone. Et on déloge vite la façade du but. Mais ce soir, c'est à l'opposé. Ben oui, c'était une autre histoire. Alors, il a dû perdre un peu de poids, là, ce soir. McTavish à la mise en jeu devant Robert Rolick. La rondelle qui revient jusqu'à haut. Oh, un gros tir ici de Carpotter, mais Terrary me semblait prêt. La rondelle était tout simplement à l'extérieur. Il a défilé de très peu. Voici euh, Driver. Une passe qui va jusqu'à... Torski, une autre qui est dirigée vers Guérin. Guérin rentre en zone adverse, contré par Gilbert. Et euh, voilà une rondelle qui tombe au banc des Devils. Ouais. Ah, quelques jeux, quelques rondelles. De renouer avec la compétition. Oui. Voici Danico. Du côté gauche, une passe qui lui revient de Niedermeyer. Là, c'est une passe qui est dirigée maintenant vers, oui, Dowd, mais il n'a plus complété. Richter intervient. Dowd s'est fait barrer la route par Well. Là, maintenant, le long d'avance, Richer qui bataille vers le disque. Quelqu'un qui le gêne, c'était Gilbert à nouveau. Là, c'est poussé du côté opposé. Voilà, Gilbert à la poursuite du disque. C'est devancé par Danico. La rondelle lui revient. Danico récupère, tire vers la ligne bleue, mais encore Gilbert intercepte. Rappelé au banc, il tire à la gauche du filet de First Terrary. 4 minutes et 10 secondes à jouer dans cette troisième période. C'est 4 à 0 les Rangers.
elbow. He wires it. And you can see how fast the puck came out of the net. His 14th power play point to tie Gilmore in that department for the lead. There's the shot. Right up in the corner. McLean, no chance on it. 2 1 lead. regular programming. Let's go right to Finance Minister Frank Newman. Where will we end up on the PST and GST? Well, Catherine, these taxes are a burden Canadians simply must bear. Hold it. We've got Speedy Mechanic Bob Cameron. Catherine, at Speedy, you don't have to pay PST and GST on exhaust work, and that's on top of our usual low prices. Speedy announces no PST and GST on all exhaust work. United Canada's Ward Cornell talking to Ken Dryden who won the Conn Smythe Trophy 23 years ago today the Canadians won the Stanley Cup and we remind you that closed captioning of tonight's game is sponsored by Household providing financial services for the family that was Dryden's first Murray rolling in for running running turning around in the corner still has it now he goes to the ice Gill gets the puck for Toronto. Going the other way, away from Omesso. Gardner shuddering to think they let him go on waivers. Come in. And the play now called. And a Toronto penalty coming to Jamie McCown. Quick, telling me, don't change your mistake. There's the mistake. McCown runs out at Ronning and then tackles him. So the giveaway got him in trouble. The tackle got him two minutes. Canucks have taken a 4-3 lead on a power play goal with 4-14 remaining. That's the fifth goal scored by a defenseman tonight. Uh, Yurke Lume circles in from the point. 
and gets in the scene or in the middle of the rink where nobody was and just slid a nice little pass. Gilmore's tied up worrying about Furry and he just shot it as he was going by the net and it gets in on the stick side with 4.14 to go. Vancouver Canucks get a power play goal to go ahead. Yurke Lume. And he gives you a sample right here of what he did so often. And often in overtime. Clark throws it in the middle right here to Gartner who lets it go. And McLean with Doug Gilmore roaring in for a rebound makes the catch. I think Burns will call a timeout right here with 114 remaining. And Potvin, well, we'll see. The faceoff is going to be in the Vancouver zone to the right of Kirk McLean. The go-ahead goal coming from Lume on a power play at 15.46 of this third period. 4-3 Vancouver. Well, Shots Pat in the third by Toronto Harry, 14, and by Vancouver, 13. It has been that close. And a reminder coming up. You saw the save just made by McLean. I'm sure he'll get some consideration for the Molson three-star selection, which comes up right after this hockey game. Well, Pat Burns is showing an offensive face-off play with the goalie out, 1.14 to go. Well, the Leafs ought to know where they're going if they win the draw, and equally important, they have to know where they're going if they lose it. Because recovering a lost draw may be just as important as doing something if you win it. All right, here it is. Gilmore on the draw. Gardner to his left. Amber Chuck Clark on the ice. Maradov and Ellen. Empty net down there. And the Canucks had a chance to clear it and did not. Gilmore on the boards with Clark. Maranov pinching in. And it's out over the line to center. 105 remaining in the third period. Ellen backing up. That's and Clark turning. Gardner rifles it in in the final minute of the third period. Vancouver 4, Toronto 3. Ellen stopped it. Into the corner he goes with Gilmore. Ellis back of the net trying to center it. It's going to be Linden. Don't get a chance to bring it out. He did not. But now it's shot to the line. Hit Linden Burray across center. No, he had to back up. Burray now a shot at the empty net. And it's stopped by Miranov, who faded back there. 30 seconds remaining. Clark will dump it in. The Leafs will pour in. Last ditch effort right here for Toronto. It comes to the line. Back of the net, Gilmore centered and scrambled at the side of the goal. 14 seconds remaining. The Canucks trying to clear and they can't get it out. Eight seconds remaining. Gilmore in the corner is Ambershot. Five seconds. Back of the goal, Gilmore. Two seconds. He can't save it. The Canucks win the game. They hang on right here and stave off that last Maple Leaf attack and tie the series at a game each as the scene now will shift to Vancouver for the next three games. The Canucks win it, four to three. The winning goal by Lume on a power play at 15.46. Well, the Canuck penalty killing nearly did them in. Five on five, I thought they were a vastly superior team to the Leafs tonight. A hard fought game, both teams playing a little better than they did in game one. Well, Vancouver. Outshot by one, 40 to 39, but a great effort tonight to tie the series. The final score again, Vancouver four, Toronto three. And we know it's going five, so there'll be three games at the Pacific Coliseum. The Molson three stars tonight, a lot of players, Sean, Kirk McLean and Felix Potvin were dynamite, Dimitri Miranoff and Dave Ellett, and Jeff Brown, the number one star, obviously an honorable mention to Yurke Lume. He gets the winner. So even the series at one will be on the air Friday night, 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 ET. And don't forget... Eighth of its own, Aaron Spelling never thought of it. Twice Mr. Post to save games for the Leafs. He's a part of the team 
Yeah, Wendell Clark, the big fan of Melrose Place. Late in the first, Pavel Bure watched this sweet move around Elliott. Beat Putman. one nothing knock. Second period, the Leafs are on a power play. Dmitry Miranoff, one-timer. His second power play goal in two minutes, 2-1 Leafs. The Canucks would tie it, and 39 seconds later, Murray Craven. You just can't stop that. 3-2 Canucks, late third, tied at three. Jamie McCowan gets into the backfield. He's got the quarterback for a sack, but it's a penalty. Bad timing. The ensuing power play, it's Yurke Lume. 4-3 Vancouver. The Leafs show a little frustration. Ellett drills Courtnall after the goal. No penalty. Leafs press for the tying one. Wendell Clark, who spit earlier, somehow gets it to Gartner. McLean the glove. He faced 40 shots. You want a drink from that cup? The Leafs are going to have to win one in Vancouver. And speaking of Vancouver, that's where game three is. The Canucks blew out of town. They flew home immediately after the game. Leafs go three for six on the power play. They're four for nine in the series. Canucks not far behind. They're three for eight. We have spitting. Hockey has fighting. It also has some fighting. Game two, Rangers and Devils closely watched. Claude Lemieux appears to bite the hand of Kevin Lowe. Ah. The MSG Network reporting that the NHL is looking into the incident, which may result in some kind of disciplinary action. Game three, no biting allowed. The Rock'em Sock'em series resumes Thursday at the Meadowlands and right here on ESPN. Faceoff 7-3-5. The team split the first two games of the series. Still to come on the show, Ewing in the next... Coming as Chorsky trailing. Rishay at first to speed. Hockey Week, an inside look at all the action of the NHL. I'm Mike Emmerich. Coming up in Toronto, the Leafs and Canucks try to find the right groove, while in New York, the Devils and Rangers are on the move. Next on Hockey Week. A camcorder like the Sharp View Cam. The viewfinder gone. Replaced with this LCD view screen. Gretzky scores! Gretzky scores? Let's go to the replay. Then, play it back instantly with color and sound. View Gas, only from Sharp. Now score big. Get up to a $200 rebate when you buy a Sharp View Cam. Hurry, call 1-800-B-SHARP and see it at your dealer today. Let's get rolling with the Eastern Finals, Devils and Rangers. The Hudson River separates New York from New Jersey. Six points is all that separated the Devils from the first overall Rangers during the regular season. A quick ride through the Lincoln Tunnel brought those Devils to Manhattan to face the Rangers in Game 1 of the Conference Championship. Both sides had a lot to think about before this anticipated matchup got underway. Obviously, they're a very well-balanced club. Uh, you know, they got three, four lines they can put out there at any time. Uh, you know, they got the superstars in uh, Messier and Leach, and uh, Graves is vastly becoming one. So uh, they got a lot of weapons and uh, a good mixture. I think uh, they're going to be very tough to beat. You know, they got some big forwards uh, who can score goals. You know, guys like Richie and Lemieux, you know, they're big guys who, who are strong and can score goals. So, I mean, it's going to be a big battle in front of the net. And, you know, I think whichever team wins the most little battles will win the series. I have to get involved more offensively. Hopefully, you know, uh, I will get some more goals from my team. Uh, I have a lot of chances against Buffalo. Same thing against Boston. Hopefully, now the puck was going to go in the net for us and, uh, and, you know, personally for me, for the team and, you know, in that series. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Madison Square Garden. Tonight's Game 1 of the Eastern Conference Finals featuring the New Jersey Devils against the New York Rangers. Oh, 
McLean around the net. Wrap around, fight scores! Great hustle by John McLean. The Devils lost all six of their games to the Rangers during the season, but that didn't matter now. At stake was a trip to the finals, and New Jersey proved in game one that it was ready to battle to the wire and beyond. Nichols down low, score! Bill Guerin ties it up for New Jersey. Leads along the board. Weimer to SCA. Save for the rebound. Score! Steve Weimer. And the Rangers lead again. It's 3 to 2. McLean is the fire scores. Lemieux is blocked. And saved by Richter. It goes over the top. McLean against Lee. Centers. Scramble is on. Save Richter. Rebound. Score. The Devils tie it. First time in the playoffs that the Rangers have had to play overtime. Here's it. Driver quickly to Almelie for the shot. Save, it's loose, it missed. The shot hit the post. Now long pass for Kovalov. He breaks in. Kovalov hit the post. That's Matt Riche. Long pass. It's on side. Devil Kukin missed the net. Riche with help coming as Torsky trailed. Riche averts the speed. Just a matter of time, you know, one team is going to make a mistake, and, uh, you know, that's what happened, you know. Uh, Alan Gray, you know, he was working as a defenseman, and I took a chance to go and, uh, you know, and that's what happened, that's a big goal for us. Well, he just, he went to the outside, and I tried to get my stick in, and uh, tried to pull him down. I kind of, you know, our, our momentum took us right into uh, Mike, and kind of, uh, I didn't see exactly, it was a, everything happens pretty fast, so. He's a very strong guy. He made a good play, and uh, unfortunately, he scored. We really didn't uh, do anything bad to create any opportunities for them. We were pretty sound defensively, and just going into overtime, being there before, we knew what it took to win, and uh, I think we just stuck together as a team. We shortened our shifts up. We played hard, and of course, we got a break. Now it's time for the Alka-Seltzer Plus Plus Minus Award final update. When you got a cold and you got to get relief, you've got to get Alka-Seltzer Plus Cold Medicine. A powerful force. That's Scott Stevens of the New Jersey Devils. The big defenseman is a plus anywhere on the ice, taking care of business in his own end or finishing on the attack. Here's the centering pass, Stevens. He scores. New Jersey's Scott Stevens is the winner of this year's Alka-Seltzer Plus Plus Minus Award. Another sellout crowd could sense the intensity immediately. New Jersey rookie Martin Brodeur's game face was masked, but Mark Messier's wasn't. From the opening shift, Messier set the tone big time. Stevenson sent flying by Messier with a big hit. Pass across for Keegan, and he missed it as he was checked by Stevens. Claude Lemieux moves it behind the net, gave it to Messier. Stop it, try to What a shift by Mark Messier! I don't really think that uh, the first shift of any hockey game is going to win your hockey game, but I think that uh, you need to really sustain some good uh, tempo and some good hard hockey for 60 minutes in order to win. Hockey is a game of ups and downs. The Rangers responded to their game one loss by taking control in all three zones. Bill Garrett with lead back. Garrett goes around to the net. Saved by Roger. Oh, man, what a save. Yet despite the better of the play, Mike Keenan's crew only led 1-0 after two periods. But in the third, the Rangers rocked and rolled. In front, Keenan and went down. Rangers four, Devils nothing. The fourth shutout of the playoffs for Mike Richter. A rugged series was even at one game apiece. A view from the top. At Madison Square Garden, that's a dream Rangers fans have had for a long time now. New York's 54-year Stanley Cup drought is well documented. Few of us were alive, no less remember those days when the old garden was the home of the Stanley Cup champions. The Rangers have won three cups the most recent of which came in 1940, a year some people remember with great affection. One is former Ranger Clint Smith, who recalls that Lester Patrick's blue shirts were okay. 
And we were like a family, actually, uh, with the Rangers. It was a, a, a great tradition with the Rangers. Uh, Lester, he always built his club that way. He, he wanted everybody to get along with each other, and, uh, and we did get along. Clint Smith has watched a lot of hockey in his time, and he likes what he sees from his current counterparts. This is the first time I've seen the Ranger Club that was so well balanced. And uh, they were a similar club to what we used to have. They were all playing together. They knew where they were going. They were well disciplined. And uh, they looked to me like uh, there was just nobody that was going to take care of them. The comparison from then to now even extends to Mark Messier. It seems that 1994's captain has a lot in common with 1940s. Well, he's a, he's a great leader. We had the same thing in New York. We had a guy by the name of Art Colder. And boy, Art was the quietest guy in the dressing room until about the last two minutes before we went on the ice. And he'd get up and he'd call some so and so and so and so and uh, let's go. And I mean, he was uh, he was a great captain. Clint Smith was a guest of General Manager Neil Smith when the Rangers visited Vancouver last March. At that time, Clint presented his old number 10 jersey to the Rangers GM. 54 years is a long time, but Clint Smith is quick to point out that Neil Smith's predecessors were not responsible for any so-called Stanley Cup curse. I've heard about uh, General Kilpatrick burning the mortgage in the cup and all these things about Red Dutton when he wouldn't renew the lease that he put a curse on him, and I know that Red would never do a thing like that. But all those things are, are strictly media-made. What lingers on for Clint Smith are the memories, especially of that April night in Toronto in 1940, when he joined in with Lynn and Murray Patrick, Brian Hextall, Neil Colville, Babe Pratt, and all the boys in celebrating their cup. Well, it was quite hilarious. <laughs> Everybody was pretty happy because, uh, I mean, you, you don't uh, win Stanley Cup too often. And when we won that Stanley Cup, it was quite... It was something. And it would surely be something if the Rangers were fortunate enough to win a cup this year. There is a particular gentleman in Vancouver who thinks they will. I, I really do. I think this is the year. I, from what I saw of that, of that club, they've got the, the club to do it. And up to now, they haven't had any uh, bad injuries. And I, I think they can go all the way. I, I really do. I think that this is their year. Now, Brute presents the check of the week. Brute, men are back. New York's Brian Noonan is always ready to ask New Jersey's Ken Danico. Stay tuned. Brian Noonan catches Ken Danico. Check it out. Brian Noonan, a 200-pounder. You see him zero in, cuts the lane off, and finishes the check as Ken Danico was admiring his pass. Boom. Stanley Cup edition. The Toronto Maple Leafs and the San Jose Sharks. Game seven of the Western Conference semifinals. The upstart Sharks sought to pull off another stunning upset. The Leafs were bound and determined not to let it happen. The Leafs beat the Sharks 4-2. The San Jose dream was over. Captain Wendell Clark had two goals and an assist in leading his club to victory, one which he quickly credited to the team. Well, it's, it's something where uh, the guys come down and uh, dig deep. Uh, we always had confidence in ourselves. Uh, just a matter of time in doing it. Uh, we couldn't say we were going to do it, but it was just a matter of time. And it came down to uh, the guys putting out at the right time, so it, it, this one come from the heart. On now to the Western Finals, Canucks and Leafs. Pavel Burry and his Vancouver teammates arrived at Maple Leaf Gardens well-rested, having five days off after eliminating the Stars. The Leafs, for their part, were playing it cool when it came to tuning it up again after just one night's rest. The Canucks were coming in as winners in seven of their last eight games, a fact impressive to many, but not perhaps to the gentlemen dressed in blue and white. Following the form established during the season, everyone expected this to be a rugged, hard-hitting series. Well, 
Our team plays well when we're physical and playing with emotion, and Toronto does as well. I don't know if they can be any more physical than our Calgary series was. A lot of people are saying that's the most physical series they've ever seen. But if it comes in and close to that, it'll be a physical series. I think you might see a lot of hitting the first five or ten minutes of this game. And then you're going to see some good punishing checks, but not to the point where guys are, again, going to be over-aggressive. It's going to start early, and it's going to be physical. It's going to be very intense. And that's, that's the good thing about playoff hockey. You've got good, good hockey. There's not going to be any cheap stuff. It's going to be good hard hitting, and uh, that's what everybody wants to see. The hitting was hard, and it was doled out evenly. So it was the scoring, 2-2 two -two after two periods. But in the third, Toronto pulled ahead. This is Gentle. Back to LaFay. Long foot in the great Gentle back there. Peter Zezel's first goal of the playoffs put the Leafs ahead. It stayed that way until late in the game when the Canucks had a chance to capitalize. Mike Gartner was called for holding and Vancouver pulled its goalie. That meant six on four as the Canucks headed to the Toronto net. Drowning, the drowning, drowning, he did, he With 30 seconds left, Canuck captain Trevor Linden tied it up. Vancouver was 4-0 in postseason overtimes, but that record would not remain unblemished. This is Osborne. Mark Osborne to Toronto. He'll dump in. Bill Burke is onside and chasing. The claim beats him. Peter Zezel had struck again. Toronto beat Vancouver 3-2 after 16 minutes and 55 seconds of overtime. Zezel was the right man in the right place after Kirk McLean strayed too far from his goal. It was a great night for the Leaf checking line. Well, obviously our job is, to, is to, to stop them, but if we can get one or two goals every chip in here or there, we can't leave it to, to Dougie Gilmore and, and Wendell and, and the scorers all the time. You know, we've got to chip in and, you know, it was our night tonight and we'll take it. You know, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Game two at Toronto. The Maple Leafs would have liked nothing better than to get up by two over the Canucks, but the chances of that diminished late in the third period with Jamie McCowan in the penalty box and the score tied 3-3. And now, Linden from the boards, sizing it up. Centering pass to Louis scores! Great play by Trevor Linden to set it up, and the Canucks have taken a 4-3 lead on a power play goal with 4 remaining. Yerky Lumi got the goal, and in the final seconds, Kirk McLean made it stand up. 115 remaining. Gunner shot. Great save. Kirk McLean saving the day for the Canucks. Vancouver came away with a 4-3 win. The Western Conference final was even at a game apiece. The two teams now head towards the Pacific for three more games. Time now for teamwork, a better way. Brought to you by Glidden, a better way to paint. Mike Gartner of Toronto gets a special assist from the Leafs' seventh man in game one against Vancouver. Gartner loses his stick, but not much time goes by before a loyal fan makes sure he gets it back. Gartner's on the ice right now saying, my stick, where the heck is my stick? There it is, and he's pleading the guy in the stands to give him back his stick. Everybody helps out. That's teamwork, that's a better way. Oh, man. Meet Ron Asseltine. In 15 years as an NHL linesman, Asseltine has played an important role in hockey. But his role off the ice is so much more important. He participates in the Make-A-Wish Foundation and as such joins celebrities like Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton, and the late John Candy in helping to make the dreams of a critically ill child come true, if only for one day. Ron Asseltine founded the Guelph, Ontario chapter of the Make-A-Wish Foundation 10 years ago. I've been asked many times, how, how do you deal with, you know, terminally sick children? And, and uh, it's, it's difficult because um, you know that they should be out running and playing and jumping and having a good time. And because of, their, of, what, of the illness that they have, they're, um, they're robbed of their childhood. And sometimes they're robbed of their life. In 10 years, Ron Asseltine has helped grant over 80 wishes. Each of those wishes involves a remarkable story, but one in particular stands out. It's about a young man named Jordan. The jolly old elf there, Santa Claus, is yours truly. I dressed up as Santa Claus, and we went around to, this, to, to Jordan's home to meet him. And uh, we took him a TV set and a Nintendo game. And the little boy in the middle of that's his brother. And that was on the 22nd of December. 
On Christmas Day, Christmas morning, I woke up to see, uh, to see how, he had, uh, how he was doing, because I knew he was extremely ill, and his mother had told me that he had died Christmas morning. And I guess of all the wishes that we've done, um, that one is probably the most poignant one because I guess it really strikes at the, uh, at the heart of why uh, we do what we do. Ron Asseltine is an unselfish man, and he is the winner of the National Association of Sports Officials Gold Whistle Award for Outstanding Service. Congratulations, Bear, and thanks. light means it's time for top five goals of the playoffs brought to you by calcium rich toms brady back on to oak left it behind Chersky able to move in tom Chersky moves in front wait score tom Chersky makes it five to three new jersey Great finish. Take a shot with us next time when Brute presents Hockey Week. This is our last show of the season. If you have any questions or comments, we'd like to hear from you. Please write to us at Hockey Week in care of Phoenix Communications, 3 Empire Boulevard, South Hackensack, New Jersey, 07606. From all of us at Hockey Week, thanks. If they get a chance here in an attempted pass by Rose to his defense partner, Gill never got there. And the Russian Rocket got there, and what a play he made. Look at him. Put that leg out, take the slash, put it upstairs to beat Potvin, and then enter in another car. What a flash. That young man. Pavel Bure. Give him a chance, and he'll grab it. And likely score. And he did right there. Score by number 10, Pavel Bure. 25, the time of the goal by Bure. The goal. Lead one to nothing. That will be an unassisted goal by Bure. That's 13 straight games that Pavel scored in in these playoffs. It is Vander. Good play, tying him up, just hesitating a second or two. Mark, if you got there earlier, might have got that rebound. Team 25. Well, the double penalty killed by the Canucks is the, one of the reasons why it's 1-0 Vancouver. That's a tough bullet to dodge when it's a minute and 29 seconds long. We're looking back to 1969 for one moment now. No, it's not a hockey game. It's this guy. Don Cherry. Well, he played right here with Vancouver in the WHL. And he's coming up in the coach's corner. All right, the shots in the first period, 15-9 in favor of Toronto. But the score after one, Canucks one, and the Leafs nothing. with Don Cherry. Brought to you by Pepsi. Be young. Have fun. Drink Pepsi.
looks like the game tonight. Get in here a little closer. <laughs> Get in tighter Get in here closer here. Mike, you got to show... Uh, what was it? Uh, you met some kids before the game or something? All the way from Hamilton, these kids... Looks like the game tonight. These kids drove all the way from Hamilton straight, just stopped for gas. Now, that, that's fans, as far as I'm concerned. They're making that's the why we love hockey. And, and it's our religion, I'll tell you that. Well, I get my tie here right. Get straightened out. Uh, your right. Camera up, because uh, Don looks like he's got guns on there. All right. Uh, they make quite a fuss out here. Uh, well, just the way your coat's flaring out because you're on a stool. Oh. I want you to look good. See what I mean? Okay. Uh, making a big fuss about you here, and I don't know why. Two years ago, Pavel Bury was a weasel. Now you're uh, getting into... Hey, well, it's all right. Hey, the kid all of a sudden uh, starts playing the old Canadian way, hitting it all out. You saw Churla, McCallum, what he did the other night. Got a little bag what he did to Churla. Yeah. Well, but he's looking out for himself. What do you got? Go Anyhow, ahead. what have I got here? And then leave your cappuccino alone. Have, what yeah. is this oh, here? Gordon, you want to learn to espresso yourself? Anyhow, you should try it. Yeah, I don't have much time. Go. Here, eh? Go ahead. Just what are you? What's in the cappuccino? Nothing. Just sit there. Milk. All right. I've seen him in a long time. I've seen a lot of things, but I'm going to show it again. Burry flipping it over and coming. Now let's see it again. This is going to make Rockham stock. I'm right here. Let's see this now. This is unbelievable. You got to admit, and he meant to do it. Look at this. Picks it up, throws it out like this, picks it up, misses it. He picks, he didn't get much in. It would have been a good shot. He still gets a little. By the way, they've offered him three million bucks, eh? And That's he wants four million. Worth it. New rink coming. New rink coming for sure. Bobby Orr used to flip the puck up like that and hit it with his backhand. Unbelievable, Bobby Orr. I said, you know. Go ahead. You don't talk about this is God. Great. This is a All right, I got to hurry. Here are you with oh, your camera. You know, now look at this here. This is when we won the uh, uh, the cup here in the Western League. Can we get in here? Are we going to see in here? All right. Here's <laughs> Donnie Jones is drinking out of it. There's Bobby Barlow and uh, Mark Reum. There's uh, Brian Hextall. See the guy in the top left-hand corner? I'm going to talk about him. See the cut he's got in the black eye? Andy Vathgate and the good-looking guy peeking around the corner. That's me. Rose, I was thinking of you. You're in Rochester. We get in here. Now, you see the guy with Mark Reum here. Okay, there's Reum. Yeah, and you see this guy up here. No, the left. To the Go left over here. here. Call him Penn. Yeah, right here. You see the black guy in the cut? Let me tell you a story. It was unbelievable. The game before, that was Bob Lemieux and, and Mark Reum. He, uh, Bob Lemieux fell down, and Mark Reum stepped on his head. It was about 60 stitches right across here. The very next game... We play, we play Portland, and Mark Reum gets the overtime goal. He gets the winner, 2-1. And, and when you see these celebrations, the first thing everybody says is, take your skates off. The trainer comes in, they take them off, because, you know, you're running around. Well, Mark is out doing the, Mark Reum out doing the, you know, on the TV and everything. He Peter comes Reum. in with the skates. Yeah, guys like you, cut them. 56 stitches, the blood was flying out. I'll tell you, 100 stitches at his own teammates. The two games. Imagine you played in the Canucks uh, system yeah. and the Leafs system, so there's no prejudice here. Uh, what was the other thing you were saying about uh, Johnny Canuck today? You were Johnny you know, Canuck. Sure about the logo. I am, we, when I played, we had a great, it was called Johnny Canuck, and it was beautiful with the Panthers and with the Ducks and the Sharks. It would have fit in perfect. Now, let's see Johnny Canuck. You would have loved it back in this days. This is when they really had tough teams. Wouldn't that have been great? You know, looks like Jean Guy or something like that. Anyhow, Johnny Canuck. It was perfect. Imagine how they could play this. Now, they went from this one. Now, this beautiful one. Now, figure that one out. That's supposed to be a C with a stick. Pat Imagine. Quinn wore that proudly, though. Ah, yeah, and he said it was lousy, too. Well, you get the next one, folks. They went to L.A., got a guy for a hundred grand. One hundred thousand designed that thing right there. Was supposed to be powered. I remember Dennis Kearns, the uh, Boston was playing him. It was funny. Okay. It was Dennis Kearns was playing him. Uh, he was in a... A lineup with, you know, facing off with Bobby Schmutz. And Schmutz, he says, how do you like the uniform? Schmutz says, who? He says, uh, Dennis Kern says, you know, last year we played like clowns, and now we look like clowns. Anyhow, Johnny cannot get him in there. Got to the final. What do you think of the game? One nothing. The game, not a game. bad game. It's a pretty good game. Uh, Andy's calling a lot of penalties, but, uh, I, you know, I thought it's the old story right here. That's not the same Vancouver club that played in Toronto. Why they can't get it pumped up here is unbelievable to me. Don Cherry was a lumberjack, and then went to work on the jackhammer. He's everything he's jacked up to be. Oh, there they, they are. The guys from Hamilton? No, that's not the guy. A lot Super of guys from Hamilton wearing a Vancouver thing, you nuts. Well, never know. It could be a Canuck fan living there. Vancouver Canucks farm team was there. Don Cherry in the coach's corner on Wilson Hockey Night in Canada in the Stanley Cup playoffs on CBC. Don 
Cherry. Brought to you by Pepsi. Be young. Have fun. Drink Pepsi. Achievements. Having a place with the elite. The new Hockey Hall of Fame honors almost 300 of the game's greatest contributors. Throughout the postseason, we honor many of them on Hockey's Great Wall. Brought to you by Ford of Canada, a proud founding sponsor of the Hockey Hall of Fame and makers of the 1995 Windstar. Tonight, Standing Paul, the legend of Ken Dryden, after this. Ken Dryden was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1983, almost four years after finishing one of the most successful careers in pro sports history. In seven plus seasons in Montreal, Dryden won six Stanley Cups, including four in succession. He debuted at the conclusion of the 1970-71 season, backstopping the Habs for the 1971 Stanley Cup. That spring, he captured the Conn Smythe Trophy. One year later, he won the Calder Trophy. What followed was an open invitation to hockey's great wall. His career average, an outstanding 2.24. He recorded 46 shutouts. He was named five times to the All-Star team. Always aware of life away from the game, at the age of 31, Ken Dryden retired at the top. He's on the Great Wall, brought to you by Ford, makers of the 95 Windstar and a proud bounty sponsor of the Hall of Fame. Kellogg's Special K. Chris starts out each morning with the protein help build and repair your body tissue. Okay, Chris, let's wrap it up. Did your equipment play in the NHL? The Kellogg's Special K breakfast. Hi. Back to the Coliseum in Vancouver. And after one period, the home team leading one to nothing. Vancouver got a goal from Pavel Burry. And 13-25, Linden drew an assist on that goal. Burry left it there for Linden. Pass to center. The Canucks are up on it. This is Brown, the defenseman, getting the zone and playing it in off the boards for Burry. Adams couldn't pick it up. Here's Linden after it. Whipped it back to Lume. He goes to the other way and back to Lume again. Once more to Brown. Up along the boards with it. They're on the outside of that four-man box. Brown shot. Tipped in front of Putman. He stopped it anyway. Brown might test him again. Low shot. It swept up the net, hit a stick, and bounced to the corner. And now Lume getting set. The pass goes in, intercepted. Brown! Going in. Brown with Perret. Another shot. Hit it. I always think Pavel Burry should play more than he does. 
But when he does, you notice him. There's no doubt about that. Trevor Linden and Wendell Clark, two Western Canadian boys, played almost the same amount of time with the same number of shifts in the first period. Nearing the nine-minute mark of the second period here in game three. He didn't miss by much. Right in front of the net and cleared back down the ice. Burray tapped it in. Linden had to come back outside of the line. Burray steals it again. Burray shot. Hit Marinov with it. It was centered. Hit Ross's skate, and Puckman had to be careful. Leafs just clear it out now. They want to make changes. 9.45 remaining in the second. 2-0 Vancouver. Gilmore at the Canuck blue line. Now McCulchick played it to the open side, and Babbage came in from the blue line. Ellett tossed it up to Baumgartner. They've been on a long time. He has to race the puck in order to make a change. And that he does. 7.35 remaining in the second period. And they're loving it here in Vancouver. And tonight's game is sponsored by Household, providing financial services for the family. i got to turn to Harry. This is more his era. Who's this guy? This is Cyclone Taylor. Bob, you played on a line with Cyclone, uh -huh. didn't you? <laughs> Tell you one thing, neither one of us would have had any chance to keep up to him the way he could skate, according to all the hockey historians. It is 2-0 Vancouver leading the Toronto Maple Leafs with 7.30 remaining in the second period. Eastwood missing a pass at center. Canucks running, has to go back to pick it up, and he throws it out to center ice. On the move with Jelena over the line. Rock puck man rolling over. Knew somehow the puck was behind him. And it might have been going in, but he stopped it. Well, Bob and Harry, Felix Spot Van there, a la Mike Richter last night. Great goaltending in the battle between the Rangers and the Devils. That series on the road to the Stanley Cup heads through the Lincoln Tunnel. They'll stay at the Meadowlands for Game 4. Tomorrow, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, and then a 5 o'clock local start Sunday for the Leafs at Vancouver Canucks. Well, the puck in the crease, our overhead camera's going to show you how close it was to being a goal, and Pot Van, as he sprawls on his back, finds the puck with his left hand and gets the whistle. A big save again by Felix Pot Van. 6.33 remaining in the second period. It is 2-0 Vancouver. Adams reaching. They get as far as center, and Andrew Chuck broke it up. Shooting it back in, it's wide of the net. Burray will pick it up, and they call that icing against Toronto. And they bring it back inside the leaf line. Six minutes, six seconds left to the second. Burray into the far corner, and Osborne can't stop him. Here's Burray. left to the second. Two players on the ice. The puck jam there. They get a whistle. Gilmore is on top of everybody, pushing and shoving. There's Adams, number eight, trying to get back up. Six-two are the shots here in the second in favor of the Canucks. A Mazda get air conditioning or equivalent value credit of $1,500 or lease from $235 a month. Outstanding 5.8% Mazda financing on 626 Kronos, Mazda Protégé, and 323. Or get a great lease rate. What do you think, Pat? This is a big audience here. <laughs> well, Pavel Burry always keeps his feet moving, turning, twisting, feet moving all the time. So if you only get a bit of them, that isn't enough. As he walks around for about 12 seconds before finally Osborne shuts him down in the leaf zone. Almost had to ride him to get him to fall. Great piece of work by Burray. He has one of the goals in the game. He scored it in the first period in spectacular fashion again. 
Linden drew an assist, but it was he who sped in from the blue line and beat Pompey high. Adams on a power play here in the second at 4.56 to make it 2-0 Vancouver. And under five minutes left in the second period. And Portal and Craven. Hunter was knocked down at center ice. Back to Zmerinov in his own zone. Hunter watching him. Hunter takes the puck. Circles at center and brings it in. Hunter gets over the line in on the left side. And it's Rice who covered him. Gardner looking for skating room. He doesn't find much. And Chuck flips Four Leafs are on the move. It is Clark carrying the puck. Up over the line with a low shot and the rebound. And Eastwood is covered. And it can just skate with him right to the boards. 2.50 left in the period. Vanderville. And it's shot in. The plane. Hollering to his teammates to get back. And it was Brown who took his pass. Got it out. Chelena with Linden on the move. Linden takes the pass. Weak shot, knifed away by Puttback. Shots less than a foot away. And no leaf could get the puck far enough away from his pads to get it up. A nice play here by Krushelniski to avoid Brown. And here's where the chance is. One, two, three, another one, four. And finally, the puck in the eyes of referee Van Helleman is held. And here's the dance. Performed by McLean, the double pad stack. So it would be tough to get it up when it's that close. Great goaltending by Kirk McLean right here in the dying seconds of the second period. And the Leafs unable to get on the board. Vancouver leading two to nothing. Linden shoots it out and down the ice, and here comes Gill. But right in after him is Craven. the Leafs again, Felix Puckman. Well, the race for the puck here, Todd Gill can't pick it up on the initial attempt, and he knows Craven's going to throw him into the end of the rink. Craven bounces off the glass and then tries to get it across to Adams. It was intercepted by Puckman, or the score would be 3-0. 25.6 seconds remaining in the second period. The Canucks leading the Leafs two to nothing. The Leafs out shooting Vancouver 22-20 at this point in the second period. Well, the chances to score, I have them at 12 to 12. But the big stat is two nothing count. The goal here in the second scored by Adams on a power play. Clark gets up over the Vancouver line. Clark lost it as he skated through the slot. And then the Canucks just happy to dump it out and down the ice. Only nine seconds left in the period. And the clock will run out here as Gilmore played it into McCown. His shot was on. The plane, the easy save. And the horn goes to end the second period. And with once again the players milling together to the right of Kirk McLean over on the boards. And the officials are in to calm them if they can. Well, the two glaring problems for the Leafs, and you have to give the Canucks credit for creating them. One, they don't seem to get a second chance very often against McLean. And two, they have real trouble controlling the puck in the offensive zone against this big Vancouver team. That wasn't a problem for Toronto in rounds one and two. It certainly is in round three. Shots in the period by Vancouver, 11. Toronto 8. The only goal scored by the Canucks on a power play at 456. And Greg Adams got that one. Go along with Burry's first period goal. And the score after two periods then. Vancouver 2, Toronto nothing. Burry second in the playoffs and scoring now. A point ahead of Brian Leach with 22 points tonight. A goal and an assist. Vancouver leads Toronto 2 nothing at the end of two periods of play. Here's something you won't see very often. A Doug Gilmore giveaway, but it's of a different variety. That's Martin Jelena's stick Gilmore has in his left hand, and 
He just passes it to the happy fan, and we have no idea. Look at Martangelo now. Hey, the guy thinks it's Gilmore stick. Pretty happy about all that. We don't know if he got it back. We'll uh, cover that story as it develops. Jeff Cortnell's with me, uh, born in Victoria, uh, local area fellow. Let's talk about the fever that's hit the city. Jeff, uh, what's it mean to you? Well, it's great uh, for me individually, business-wise, and with the team. It's uh, great to see the Canucks uh, getting closer to uh, the goal that everybody wants, and uh, playing at home is great. Tell great to see the family. You bet. Tell me, Russ is here. Is he at the game tonight? Yeah, Russ is here tonight. Uh, he and his wife are on their way to Hawaii. Oh, great. And so will you be after, if all goes well. Uh, it was great to, to see you two on that Mother's Day thing, by the way. Let's talk a bit about your minor hockey. How would you get started? Uh, I know you were picked up as a free agent by Boston. We went on from there to play both of us pretty much junior uh, with the Cougars. I played in BC Junior Hockey League but uh, before that. But uh, we played one year together, which is exciting. People who are successful can rarely explain it, but uh, is there something your dad did uh, away from the practices that helped you two to become such great skaters? Well, he... Uh, he started pretty early with us. Russ was figure skating at three, and uh, I started when I was about seven. And I think uh, he really concentrated on power skating. I know when I can remember, we took a lot of power skating classes. Uh, Phil Blake, I think, deserves a lot of credit for Russ and I, the way we skate. I think he taught us uh, probably when we probably were about seven years old. Uh, he really concentrated on a stride, and I think it helped, especially Russ. Isn't that super? Yeah, <laughs> he's quick. No doubt about that. Let's look at double overtime. Uh, your restaurant downtown. Tell me the story about how you got involved in this. Well, we opened one in Victoria called Overtime, and it was real successful. So when I got traded here to Vancouver, we decided to open Double Overtime. Sure, and uh, why not? actually, this year it's really started to get pretty crazy on this. A lot of competition, a lot of sports bars uh, now down in your area, but uh, you're still the best, I understand. <laughs> well, we've got the most stuff in there, that's for sure, and the food's great, so it's good atmosphere. Well, you want to see stuff, uh, super fan. We're going to feature him next, Jeff. A continued success. Thanks a lot, Ron. Jeff Cortnall, the Vancouver Canucks, five goals, helping to pace uh, Vancouver in their beautiful run here in the Stanley Cup playoffs. One of his biggest boosters will join us. Next, we'll get a look at some true paraphernalia. And we continue on Wilson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC. Terry has restaurants, not in Vancouver yet, though. 2 nothing at the end of two periods of play. Kirk McLean has been like the weather is now, evidently. Is that a live shot? Perfect after 40 minutes of play. Fan is short for Fanatic, and there are a slew of them in this area right now, but if the Vancouver Canucks want to thank their fans, they should thank one in particular, make room for him the way he has made room for them. posters and various players. Every player you'd ever want to see is on the poster out there. How many hockey pucks? I have uh, over 500 displayed and I have uh, over 1,500 or more uh, in boxes that I don't have room for. I have over 1,500 hockey sticks. Uh, that includes goaltender sticks uh, ranging from uh, Greg Adams to Joe Zanussi, A to Z. Uh, my whole collection is worth, uh, well, it's insured for $500,000, uh, but it's probably worth well over a million dollars. My audio tape collection uh, is over 500 cassettes there. Uh, my videotape collection, any Vancouver Tax game that's been on TV since the 80, 82, 83 season is on videotape. This thing started uh, 24 years ago, uh, going to the Canucks home game. Uh, I loved watching hockey, and I was I was addicted to it. And I was never never stopped going. I just, uh, used to have season tickets for the New Westminster Bruins and the Vancouver Canucks, and I'd go to two games in one day. And if there were three games, I'd try and do it. I'd come home and watch a game on TV, and I am you know total hockey. My friends uh, don't have many friends, actually, but they probably think I'm absolutely nuts to be con totally consumed in hockey. Uh, but this is this is my life, and you know they they can do what they want, and this is what I do. I don't I don't do anything else. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Don't have a girlfriend, and I'm totally consumed by hockey. My parents uh, my parents are pretty good. They uh, they don't mind this at all. Uh, uh, the amount of stuff that I bring in here, they kind of roll their eyes and thinking, oh no, not another box full of junk you're bringing home, but uh, they're pretty good about it. It was just great. 
It really was. I love we always used to always used to kill him as well. More junk, Andrew. Uh, but he's a good fellow. Now there's been some times when I'm thinking, you know, why do I support this team? But uh, as a as a Canuck fan, you have to be true to the, whether they win, lose, or draw. You have to be there to support them. Um, not a person that jumps on the bandwagon if they win three or four games in the playoffs and they're all of a sudden, oh, I'm I'm a Canucks fan. It's a popular thing to be at that time, but uh, not me. I'm with them through thick and thin. I've seen lots of thin. And uh, this year, they're doing really well. Hopefully, so it will continue. Had a nice story for the Vancouver Canucks. Andrew Castell, always be cool and collected like those fellas in the mobile, the hub of tonight's telecast here in Vancouver. 2-0, the Canucks lead the Leafs after 40. You're watching the Stanley Cup playoffs on Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC. Kellogg's Special K. Chris starts out each morning with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. The Special K breakfast is high in protein. And protein helps build and repair your body tissue. Okay, Chris, let's wrap it up. Did your grandma play in the NHL? The Kellogg's Special K breakfast, high in protein. The Coliseum. In Vancouver, British Columbia, the third period coming up with the Canucks leading the Maple Leafs two to nothing here in Game Three. Pavel Bure, an exciting goal in the first period of 13:25. Linden got an assist. Bure took off and came in from the blue line and put one high on Putman for a one nothing lead. On a power play, his third of the playoffs. Greg Adams scoring from Brown and Bure. At 4.56 of that second period, here's that scoring play. Well, after a couple of great chances, a double deflection, maybe even a triple deflection with Adams on the last one, puts the Canucks up on a point shot from Brown that Burry, after Burry had passed the puck to Brown, Adams tips it in. The Leafs need the next one, and I think they need it quick, Bob. They haven't been able to mount much in the way of good scoring chances in this game. From the faceoff for the third period, Babbage, a pass at center ice, knocked down by Adams and lost it. Gilmore finding McCown, who steps in with a low shot, deflected wide of the net by Didick. Got on the board as his biggest save of the playoffs, but I think he just made a bigger one, John. Rangers try to pinch in, take some chances, and close Lemieux is all by himself. Jeff Bukaboom is caught up. Brian Leach forces Lemieux to make the quick shot. Neely stays with him, good patience. A little goalie, Glenn Healy, cuts down the angles very well. With the elite, the new Hockey Hall of Fame honors almost 300 of the game's greatest contributors. Throughout the postseason, we present many of them on Hockey's Great Wall, brought to you by Ford of Canada, a proud founding sponsor of the Hockey Hall of Fame and makers of the 1995 Windstar. Tonight, we highlight the career of a great NHL official, the legend of linesman George Hayes, inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1988. Among his many distinctions was the fact he was the first official to work in over 1,000 NHL games. Hayes was a strong-willed and colorful chap who, despite his share of conflicts with league management, was universally regarded as the finest official of his time. He worked in 1,544 regular season games and 149 more in the playoffs. As well, 11 All-Star games were part of his reward for his ability to control the game he so loved. Red Story once remarked, Hayes was the finest linesman the game's ever known. One who's held in the highest regard by those in the game. George Hayes on the Great Wall, presented by Ford of Canada, makers of the 1995 Windstar, and a proud founding sponsor of the new Hockey Hall of Fame and Museum. This portion of Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC was brought to you in part by Ford of Canada, where quality is job one. Bob Cole and Harry Neal ready for period number two at the Pacific Coliseum in beautiful Vancouver. Sellout crowd again, of course, here in the playoffs. And this city is certainly caught up in all the excitement of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Here's the second period, no score in the game. LePay. Less minutes as the Vancouver Canucks, five for 14 on the series, have their first power play 
of this evening. And it's Linden with Adams, Burray, Lume, and Brown. Koshelinski on with Osborne. Face off, won by Vancouver, but it was cleared out by Toronto. Osborne got a shot that McLean had little difficulty with. Osborne trying to keep it in there now. Well, he's up to center ice and rifles it in. Comes off the two corners and all the way down the ice. Almost got the four corners. <laughs> and it hit that third down there and stopped by McLean. He toughened this square rink to get it all the way around in one shooting. Nearly did that time. Adams coming in with Trevor Linden on the move on the left side. Adams takes it back at the net. Out front it comes and Berg will get a chance to move it out. He does. And Zezel has McLean leaving the net again. As he went in to pick it up, he centered it, and Berg couldn't handle it. There's Zezel back to the goal. Zezel helping to kill this penalty on the attack now. He's out front. Zezel trying to come in front. Berg didn't see the loose puck, and four Canucks line up the cutout. Burry takes it over the leaf line, and he was hammered on the boards. The count is back there for Toronto, and he was hit hard by Adams. Again, Kruschelinski trying to move it out. Two on one, Toronto. Kruschelinski coming in. Shoots. And he missed it at rebound. And that was fired wide of the goal. The Canucks come back in. Murray over the line, dropping it. Shot. Great save by Putt Van. That glove save. With only 16 seconds left in the penalty now to Sylvain Lefebvre. Toronto has had two glorious scoring chances, and then the Canucks stopped by Putman. Well, Yerke Lume pinches here and doesn't get the man or the puck. The way the Leafs go on a two-on-one. Crucial he has got the puck on the inside. I think he makes the right play in shooting, but missed the net. And right after that, a shot wired by Brown, and Putman makes a great stop, reaching behind him to nearly pull it under the net on a bullet shot by Jeff Brown. All right, 16 seconds remaining in that penalty to LaFay. The face-off is deep in the Toronto zone, and Diddy gets a screenshot. Off the knees this series, five goals, five assists for 10 points, 35 shots on goal. So in the battle of the big line, the big line in white, Dominated the series so far. Craven, McIntyre, and Hunter left to right for Vancouver. Gardner, Gilmore, and Clark, the Maple Leaf line. Outside, here comes Glenn, there goes the net. And they line up oh, in round two. Well, they're parked here in round three and a game up on the Toronto Maple Leafs in the best of seven. To the lead zone. Lefebvre back to the net. Pass going astray. Miss Berg down the ice. And that's an icing call against Toronto with 8.36 left. Well, this is a, uh, a milestone game for quite a few players as far as Stanley Cup history is concerned. There are four of them that are playing their 100th playoff game Regular season playoff game tonight, or playoff game this year, regular season and playoffs. 100 games and they still got a round and a half to go. There's one player who's played one more than 100, and that is Sylvain Lefebvre 101. Now we don't count the preseason games, so a lot of these players are getting up to the 110 or more mark, games played this season, playoffs and regular season. From the face off, it comes to the line where Lume skates around Clark centered the puck. It comes back to him. Lume handling it beautifully. Now centers it again. And Adam's shot missed by a foot on the far side. Linden keeping it in. Leafs can't find it. It's in the corner where Burry went after it. Back to Glenn. He gets a shot. That was deflected and a depth missed on the short side. Leafs dump it out. Still, it's scoreless. Well, as often happens, especially in tight games, a great chance at one end is followed quickly by a nice chance at the other. Here's a tip-in chance that nearly handcuffed Potman. 
The Vancouver Canucks defenseman pinch every once in a while. Gardner never really did get his shot away. Bob Gardner hasn't got a point this series. And he gets in alone, hauled down on the rush, slides into McLean. The net comes off. Neither the shooter, nor the stopper, nor the net is hurt. 8.02 left in the second period. Another big scoring chance. First for the Canucks, then for the Leafs. A great difference in styles of the defense core in each team. Toronto defensemen rarely pinch to keep the four check alive. Don't join the rush nearly as much. Face of Trevor Linden, and he's going to the bench. McIntyre is in there trying to pick it up, but the play is called as LeFave touched it. And some of the fans are complaining here that it was a high stick, Bob, but if they could see the replay that I think we're going to see, they will see that it was the puck, not the stick. Trevor Linden wanted to continue. Here's the play right here. The puck comes right up off the, his own stick on the attempted shoot-in by the lead player. Linden's on the bench getting some medical attention. Looks like he's going to go in and get stitched. There's only 3.11 left in this period. I'm sure we'll see him back. And the crowd trying to get these Canucks in the mood for a goal before this period is out. Three minutes and 11 seconds left in it. And Craven comes out. In his last 13 games, with at least one point in each of them. He leads his team in six, or tied for the lead in six different offensive categories. The reason he has been silent tonight is he hasn't had a chance to get the puck and get skating full blast between the blue lines. And you can, if you can take that away from him, you've got a long way of corralling him to some degree. You can see Lennon on the bench, he's back. Vancouver winning the draw. Cortnell left it at the blue line, and Glenn couldn't keep it in. Now they shoot it in. 155 remaining in the second period. Rouse around the net and starting out. Here is a dear friend who now spends his time fishing and looking after his two schnauzers. I chatted with Howie yesterday. Everybody says, what's the greatest moment you ever had in hockey? You know, what were you most proud of? And I think it was that first year we're in the fifth or sixth game to win the Stanley Cup against the Montreal Canadiens. We're up 2-1, and Hap Day put on, Broda was in the net, and Hap Day put on Mortson, Thompson, uh, myself, and Kennedy, and Lynn. And four out of the five were rookies. And we killed the last minute and 30 seconds to win the Stanley Cup. You were the first, maybe, uh, it used to be Foster Hewitt, Danny Gallivan were the stars. Then it became the people that were doing the analysis and Dave Hodge. Uh, did you ever think that you'd become uh, the voice of hockey uh, for the better part of a decade? No, I didn't think it would ever happen. I was in Newfoundland and I uh, got an opportunity to work in television. Don Jameson uh, uh, owned a television station down there and he was a pretty good friend. and. He said, hey, uh, our radio sports announcer quit. Would you like to take a shot at it? <laughs> what I, when, where, and how? He says, when's my, my first broadcast? He said, 11 o'clock. <laughs> this was 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I got into broad radio broadcasting sports, and then I got into uh, television, and I did everything down there. I had a bowling show. I had an outdoor show. Uh, I had a physical fitness show there. It was in the morning doing exercises. And, oh, geez, you, you name it, I did it. And uh, then I started, Bob Golden was, I think, the first of the ex-hockey players to get involved in Hockey Night in Canada. And I watched Bob and watched Bob, and I said, I can do that. I can do that. Everyone on Vancouver Island wants to know, uh, where does your heart lie, with the Leafs, where you won Rookie of the Year, or with the Canucks? Uh, I'd love to see the Leafs win. I really would. But I've been very close to Vancouver, uh, 15 of the 20 years I've been out here. And I know a lot of the fellows on the team. I know Pat Quinn, and Pat's a great guy. Good hockey man, but a great guy. And uh, I would not be unhappy to see either one of the teams win, but I would like to, for Pat's sake, I'd like to see the Canucks win it. But Pat Burns, God, he deserves a win, does he? He's a magician. He's a magician. That's all I've got. What he has done with that team the last two years, unbelievable. This is just behind the scenes stuff. I want to know when you and Grace are in the house at night and the game's on, uh, what's the situation like? Is she the one yelling or are you the one yelling? What happens? 
I'm going out of my mind. And, and Grace is in the kitchen. In the, we have two sets. And she's in the living room or in the kitchen. I'm you know, watching what she wants to watch. And I'm there. And, and it, it's locker room language. It's not too good. And I get the end of I Shoot the puck. Shoot the puck. <laughs> you know, I played for 20 years and I'm still playing. I coached for 20 years and I'm still coaching. And the thing you hear more than anything else, either as a player or a coach to a player, shoot the puck, please shoot the puck. And, and they don't do it. They don't do it. And that those passes coming out of the, their own end, 10 feet behind the blue line, in through center ice or into center ice, I just, oh, against the board, you idiot, <laughs> against the board. <laughs> but not often, but there's, I just shoot the puck. I just I shoot the puck. And hit the net, right, Howie? What a great day it was. Grace, thanks for the oyster stew. The schnauzers, you didn't see Sam. He's the boy. That was Tara, the girl, up on Howie's lap. And those two, they go every day to the Globe Box at 4 o'clock. Uh, quite a scene up at Parksville. Uh, the Meeker household probably tuned in tonight. 17 years on Hockey Night in Canada. It goes without saying. Our show became a whole lot better uh, for having that crazy chap along. We'll hear from Jacques Lemaire, who rarely does Hockey Night in Canada interviews. Uh, he did one with Scott Russell after the 3-1 win last night here at the Pacific Coliseum at 0-0. Then results in a 3-1 victory for the New Jersey Devils over the New York Rangers. And this Eastern Conference Final is now tied at two games apiece. For the first time in the series, the New Jersey Devils established the lead, and they did so in the first period. Stefan Oriche wraps around and beats Mike Richter, his seventh goal of the playoffs. And the Devils were off from there. Joining me now is coach of the Devils, Jacques Lemaire. A very important thing that your team could get the lead in this series, was it not? Yes, it was. Uh, through the uh, all series, we uh, we never could take the lead, and uh, you know the, the players were affected by that. And uh, I stressed that before the, the game tonight that uh, we had to play our best hockey in the first five ten minutes of the game, and maybe we will get a break and get a goal. A very volatile situation could have developed before the game. There was the Bernie Nichols suspension, but the important thing for your team was to maintain some kind of discipline because you knew the Rangers had a strong power play. How did you uh, get it across to them that there had to be no penalties? Well, that was the uh, other thing that we stressed, the uh, discipline. Uh, we all know that uh, the Rangers, they're, they're good on the power play, and, and we can't take more than four penalties because they, they've been scoring every four uh, penalties. So, uh, you know, we talked about retaliation and all that. And in the playoffs, if you want to win, you can't retaliate. And uh, I tried to uh, get the guys to understand that, and I think they did uh, to a certain point. Defensive zone coverage broke down. And when Burry gets the puck, everyone goes to him. Two leads do, and look where Adams is all alone. And he whips on the rebound that came off the back of the ring. Jeff Cortnall, who's in a little mini slump, no goals in his last six games, comes out before each game in his long underwear and tapes his stick and doesn't mind the odd visit from some adoring fans. As you can see, these two Canuck fans painted up. Cortnall on the bench. Ronning's line on for Vancouver. Jelena, part to the right. Lomeso on the other wing, and he's in there, puffing McCown. LeFave for Toronto. Poke the puck ahead, the Leafs just dump it away. They are changing. Clark and Eastwood coming off the bench. Babbage around his own net. A long lead pass to center. Lomeso was there alone as the Leafs were changing, and Toronto has to get back again. Nearing the two-minute mark of the third. No score in the game. Didick missing it. Icing waved off. Babbage back in a hurry for running. Running brings it out over the line. Skating away from Clark a second time and down on the wing did it. Babbage coming up. Babbage tried to center it. He was hit in the corner. And now Jelena. Jelena working his way along the board. Good pressure by Vancouver. Jelena offended. There goes in back of the net. The Canucks are on the puck. Running trying to get it out front. He does. The mess is coming. Chopped away to Clark. He had to stop to pick it up. Lomeso caught him then with a hit. 
The Canucks break up that leaf rush at their own blue line with Lume taking over and skating in front of his own net. Dropping the pass back. Glenn up the center. He couldn't get by Clark. Clark failed to see Gartner up ahead of him. It is Gill again, turning away from Linden. Out the center. Adams stopped the pass. Shot it back in. Linden was hit trying to chase it. 250 gone in the third. No score in the hockey game. Hard pass to handle for Berg. And Gill will try to move it up now. Shot it across center ice as the Leafs want to change. Kirk McLean plays it when he sees the linesman waving off the icing. Shot to the line and stopped by Osborne. He played it back in and Glenn hammered it to center ice and rolled by Lefebvre back to the blue line. Linden is in there. Lefebvre saw him and got it out to center ice. Bird steals it, takes the shot. McLean was screen on that. Well, the best scoring chance of the hockey game right there. And down the tubes chance either team's had in the third period. A lovely little backhand pass by Ronnie on the two-on-one to Jelena, and Jelena can't redirect it by Potvin before he's filled in by Gill. Cover. David Babbage recovers when it looked like Gilmore's going to walk in alone and took the shot away from him. Nine minutes and comes out a scramble for which was a hard one, he stopped it, but couldn't quite find it. And Gilmore had a chance. Go to Clark. Well, both goalies have been brilliant here in the third period. Wendell Clark, who wired one from the top of the circle, McLean knew it hit him, but he didn't know where it was. Two Leafs have a chance to get a shot at it. Neither one can get it. Here's the shot right here by Bill Berg, and Zezel goes to the net. This game will probably be decided by a team whose player goes to the net without the puck and finds a rebound because these goalies have been superb on those initial shots. Kirk McLean has shut the Leafs down for 128 minutes and some odd seconds. And was marvelous again right there. It's right at the Leafs bench. It was not a very boom jarring body check but you can see Pearson getting up given Hunter and cut on his nose it has been overtime since the early of the first period I've had that feeling one goal will decide it and there's only 658 left in the third period Team 35. 
comes out front again, McLean poking at a loose puck. And the Canucks will clear it away. Two leaves trapped deep in the zone. Brown is coming in, dropping it back, and here's Brown again. Around the net, he'll come out front, he's shot. And that whistle just wide, as Hunter had a great chance. One to nothing, Vancouver here in game four. And if they can hang on, they'll take a 3-1 lead in the series. Well, another game scheduled here in 48 hours. A minute and a half left. Pot Van edging out of the net. Gilmore going in after the puck. Takes it off the boards, and there's Gardner over skating it. Pot Van is still in the net with a minute 19 seconds left in the third period. It is 1-0 Vancouver, and the league's fighting for their lives now. Gilmore. Pot Van going to the net bench. The net is empty. The Leafs have the extra man. inside the Vancouver line. 47 seconds remaining. The well, importance Toronto, of a face-off, we talk about it many times. This is critical. Toronto Maple Leafs have been better, not a lot better, but better on the face-off than have been the Canucks. Murray Craven takes very few draws during the regular game, but he's out there now. Remember, he played a lot of center ice for Philadelphia and has played some center ice here for Vancouver but he hasn't been in the center ice position for draws like this very often in this playoff. He's there against Gilmore, and Gilmore won it. Shot in through a crowd. It comes back near the line, in close to the goal, and it's snuck down the ice. This is going to be an empty net goal by the Rocket. Here, this is over. They kick it back to Miranoff, who shoots it. And the Leafs end up getting a bit of a chance right here. But the shot jumps over the two Leaf player stick. Nobody on earth or anywhere else they play hockey is going to catch this guy, Bure. And he puts it in to make it 2-0 with 32 seconds to go. And Vancouver have their feet on the throat of the Toronto Maple Leafs up three games to one in this series with the fifth game here in Vancouver. And when the 
Canucks in playoff history went up 3-1. They have won four series and lost none. And the crowd is finally able to stand up and really let her fly. Exciting, though, to see a hockey player such as Pavel Bure break away. 150 feet or so. Tonight's three stars as selected by Hockey Night in Canada. Tonight's third star from the Toronto Maple Leafs, number 29, Felix Putman. Tonight's second star from the Vancouver Canucks with his fourth playoff shutout, number one, Kirk McLean. Tonight's first star from your Vancouver Canucks, number seven, Cliff Running. Well, there's no question about it. Cliff Running had himself a whale of a hockey game tonight. He was a good player in that first period where there was no scoring, and his team outshot 11 to seven. And then in the second period, same thing, but he was the threat. Every time his line got on there, the mess on Jelena on the wings. No scoring again in the second. Aha, uh -huh, but it paid off in the third. 1735. Mameso and Jelena on the play with Mameso tossing it in front. The onrushing running. And he scored what proved to be the winning goal. And then with Felix Potvin on the bench, the extra attacker on for Toronto. It was an empty netter for Burry. Here's the goal we were talking about. Look at Mameso. Potvin thought he'd shoot. And there's Ronnie. What a beautiful play. Go to the net without the puck. Do it every rush. It'll pay off eventually, but not maybe as dramatically as it did right then. Cliff Ronning got away from the leaf back checker. Stick on the ice, took a perfect pass. And here's the Canuck bench as Ronning turned away from the net after he steered it in. Kirk McLean now is tied with Richter with four shutouts. And that's not bad work in Stanley Cup play. 
Well, the goaltending has been terrific throughout. There's no question about that. And again, here tonight at the Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver, Kirk McLean, a solid standout bit of work for the Vancouver Canucks. The Leafs had 29 shots at him, and he stopped them all. Well, the first star of the game is coming in to chat with Ron McLean, and here's Ron now. Thank you, Bob. Cliff, congratulations. Uh, go ahead. How does it feel? Feels good. Uh, you know, it was a big win for a hockey club, and, you know, we still got one uh, more win that we have to win uh, to get to where we've always dreamed of playing. Uh, give me a sense of your lines performance. It's all the fellas upstairs talked about much of the night, but I think as a trio, uh, you were dynamite all night. Well, it's, it's strange because uh, we're doing lots of... Uh... Go ahead. Come on in. <laughs> anyway, <Glenn>. it's, uh, <laughs> you know, most of the time, the last uh, nine games or so, we were just checking the number one center and Madano and then Gilmore, and they try to change it up. So it was important for us to uh, definitely, uh, you know, keep going and, and maybe add some offense. And we were getting chances, and... Uh, you know, we had a, couple, we had a two on one that uh, Marty almost scored, but uh, we kept at it as a line and kept working together, and I think that's why we scored. You won the uh, Super Skills competition this year as the Canucks' most accurate shooter, and it's always been a great dimension in your game. In tight, <laughs> uh, we're going to show the goal, and you can address maybe where it was that you uh, became so proficient at uh, converting and doing those well, little things. I remember Marty gave me a nice, or someone on the side gave it to me, made a move, gave it to uh, Serge, and uh, Serge is such a heads up player. I tried to just go to the net, and uh, we've played together from training camps, and, and uh, we've always seen to play together. He's a big guy. I'm a small guy, but I can use my quickness, and he can use his size, so we work together very well. March 5th, 91, you came over from St. Louis. Did you two play together there much at the Blues? Uh, sometimes, but not often. I was many times just playing the power play, and uh, I played behind players such as Doug Gilmore and Peter Zezel at one time, so I was always playing uh, you know, with great centermen, so I got to watch some, some great ones play. We've often talked about being from Vancouver, how great it is for the Canucks to get on a roll and whenever you play well. Uh, but you think of that ninth round draft in 1984. Uh, Gary Souter came out of that. Luke Robitaille both won the Calder Cup coming out of that. And uh, we've gone through this before, too, whether you ever thought you'd be uh, given a chance like this despite that brilliant career at New West. Well, in junior, I did very well. And uh, <clears throat> it's no surprise that I'm um, half the size of a lot of guys out there. But, you know, it's something I've always dreamed of doing was playing the NHL. And for a lot of the small players out there, you can play. You just have to just give everything you got and uh, play with as much heart as you can. And there's many times you're gonna get knocked down, but the quicker you get up to show them that you can take a hit, uh, I think that's important. And you know, it helps also playing with guys that are six foot five on your wing, so it yeah. makes a lot easier. Can't say enough about Messo. And how about this guy over here? Shutout strings now at 135 minutes and 25 <laughs> seconds. Uh, four shutouts in the playoffs, ties a the record. There's Kirk McLean. What about uh, what about the goal? You, you've had Ranford and Reddick in New Westminster, so you've got a good start with guys in the net, but uh, how about Kirk? I've always been fortunate to play with good uh, goalkeepers, and Kirk is the most calmest uh, goalkeeper I've ever seen. Uh, even when he lets one in, it's like it's no big deal. He just look, gets ready for the next one. And the biggest thing with Kirk is uh, when you do make a good defensive play, he lets you know, and uh, he's yelling at you to make sure you're covering guys in front of the net. And he doesn't talk a lot in the dressing room, but when you're out there on the ice, he lets you know where you should be. What about Pat Quinn? Uh, how did he prep you for tonight? Uh, as we discussed, there was all this anticipation of uh, a wild evening based on the last three minutes of Game 3. Well, we got a hockey club that's pretty tough. People don't realize we've got some guys that uh, can throw their weight around, and we've got some players not playing, such as Antoski and a couple other players. So uh, we're not worried about that. We've got some toughness in our dressing room. we also got experience in a player like Tim Hunter who's been there before. He's really leading us in the dressing room right now and letting us know what it's going to take to get to the finals. And, we're one game away, but it's a lot of work still. We know there's three periods of hockey that we got to give everything we got. Well, it was like you sensed you were going to do it tonight. Uh, all through the game, as we said, you played great. Uh, congratulations on a huge goal for the Canucks. Thank you very much. Cliff Ronning, we'll send it upstairs and bring in Kirk McLean in a moment here. Fellas? Well, it'll be interesting to hear from Kirk McLean. He's won 10 now uh, in these playoffs, and uh, he's, he's on quite a roll. There's no question about that. But the Vancouver Canucks tonight, Harry, what, what's your impression? Uh, two periods and nearly three periods just laying back there. There weren't that many quality chances, but their defensive style seems to have the Leafs outside. Well, the Leafs can't get much forechecking, uh, effective forechecking done against this Vancouver defense core. Uh, they, most of them, if not all of them, handle the puck well. Four of the six jump into the rush every time, and the Leafs can never get their second forechecker in, even when the first guy gets in early enough to cause some trouble. But Toronto played a far better game tonight than they did in uh, game three out here. 
they had enough chances to win. They couldn't beat Mr. McLean. He had that cement wall between the goal pipes. It's a great feeling when your team trusts your goalie. He reminds me of Richard Brodeur in 1982. We'd say on the bench, shoot till your arms get tired. You're not going to beat him. Boy, he looks solid in there. And we're going to have a chance to listen to him now as he joins Ron McLean. All right, thank you, Harry and Bob. Kirk, 29 saves again. Uh, this is getting to be routinely brilliant. Uh, tell me how you uh, saw the game tonight. Well, we didn't have the effort tonight. I don't think that we wanted to. We, we, we worked hard, but we didn't uh, really accomplish anything. But we got the win. We gutted it out and, uh, and found a way to win. And, and I think, um, you know, we're going to have to play a lot better if we want to uh, go on. Right. Toronto's got to be a little heartbroken because, to, to me, that would be a game Pat Burns would want to hang and hang in. And uh, you really broke their back. Uh, Tell me about some saves you remember. A lot of shots high, I thought, early uh, in the game, and you probably enjoy that. There, there was, a, there was a, a few that were, uh, you know, in the first period where they had a couple of uh, a number of situations where they took slappers off the wing and I was able to, to get a hold on. Maybe uh, the first shot of the game was kind of a, a cut-in breakaway. I, I don't know who it was, but I was able to steal that aside. So if you stop them from scoring earlier, earlier you have a pretty good uh, chance to win because they control the lead very well and, and, and they make it tough on you. That was Chris Govadaris, his first game of the playoffs, and boom, he's got speed. He was in, uh, and you made that save. Bill Berg had a chance. We're going to take a look at that, and uh, I don't remember it. See if you do. This is in the third period where he, where he cut up high, and it got me, kind of handcuffed me a little bit, and then I think that was uh, Keller that was coming in to try and jam the rebound, and, and right after that, they got a shot from the, from the slot, I believe, where I was able to kick it out with my uh, left, my right pad. There's your shutout string. It's 135-23. Uh, Dave Ellett's the last guy to beat you. We'll talk about your defense, but we were going to mention Mike Fountain the other day. You were saying how he's been great uh, doing most of the puck stopping here uh, in the spring, and I said he reminds me of you. Do you see that when you watch him? Well, we both uh, come from the same schooling you know, and, uh, through Oshawa, uh, Ian Young, who uh, who uh, brought us up and was our coach and still you know gives us a hand here and there. We we do a, a goalie school back in Whitby, Ontario, uh, Ian Young's goaltender school that we do. So. We're in, we're in good uh, good hands there, so we were kind of similar that way. Don Cherry talks about him all the time. Tell me about him. What's his? Uh, well, his we team? were actually on Don's show. Uh, Ian's been on a couple times, and uh, he had Ian and myself on once before. And uh, you know, he he's he's really a teacher of the game. He, he studies the game very well, and and he's he's uh, got uh, good natural ability. He, he lost his eye. Obviously, he played with Bobby Orr. And, in uh, in Oshawa in those days, and, and uh, I believe it was Mickey Redmond that caught him with a slap for those days without math. So that, that kind of end of his career, he tried to come back, but uh, wasn't able to. So he went on to uh, uh, you know finish his schooling and what have you. But uh, he's a he's a lover of the game, and he loves to you know lend a hand whenever he can. And, and we've uh, certainly become a great friends uh, away from the rink since uh, my days in junior. Isn't that nice for him? Wasn't there a goalie, Larry Dick, or somebody had uh, one eye and managed to make it? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know that story? I, I seem to remember. Maybe Grapes will know. We'll ask him <laughs> afterwards. Let's talk a bit about uh, your puck handling tremendously again tonight. Uh, it's a little adventurous. I'm trying to throw it up uh, the boards with uh, the, the leaf speed, but uh, you're really helping your guys. Well, uh, you know, if I can move it up, uh, if they can give me an outlet uh, and uh, force their players to come to me and and, give, and, and get in the open space, it makes it easier on defense, you know, from getting their their face crash you know, in the end glass there and, and we can t uh, turn the transaction from defense to offense and try and catch them uh, sleeping. Do you get inspired watching uh, Brodeur and Richter on the off night or do you pay any attention? I've been watching a little bit, not too much. Uh, I maybe get a little caught up in it. I'm a, I'm a big hockey fan but uh, I try to stay away from it on the off days. I don't want to uh, boggle my mind too much with, with hockey. I want to you know, relax a little bit when we don't have to play, and then the days that we do play, let's uh, start concentrating. That's an excellent point. I hope my executive producer, Ron Harrison, <laughs> understands uh, the validity of that comment. Well, you've got four shutouts. We're going to look at the list of names, and you're in some select company here. Uh, Mike Richter, of course, has moved into that bracket. Felix Potvin's got three. Dominic Hasek had a great year, uh, and you can see uh, also on that uh, shutout list, Chris Osgood. Boy, there's a guy that uh, he really played great, took a lot of flack for that game yeah. seven. That must make you uh, sick when you see a goaltender under the gun like that. Well, uh, you know, when you get into playoff hockey, it, it seems to be the one person that everybody looks to. And, and you know, I, I'm not saying that you don't need good goaltending to get through, but uh, there's a lot of other efforts that have to be put forth uh, to get you through to the, to the Stanley Cup or to win a Stanley Cup. And, and sometimes uh, there's a little bit too much unfair pressure put on the goaltender. But, uh, you know, that's the media and that's the fans, but then you have to live with that with being a pro athlete. How about your folks? Are they upset that you're leading Toronto 3-1? to one, or? 
Oh, I don't think so. I think they're probably pretty happy. I think they're trying to steer as, few, as many friends as they can over to the Vancouver side. Well, it was a great piece TSN did at the All-Star game when you played there, getting them involved. So uh, I'm sure they're happy, and uh, so are all Canucks fans. Another great, great effort. Congratulations. Thanks, Kirk McLean. Okay, Bob and Harry, we'll send it to you as we watch uh, the masked man here with his shutout again this evening. Take a bow, and then we'll bring Don Cherry in after we hear from you upstairs in the booth. No, no question about it. A great night for Kirk McLean, and there's another one of his big saves in this hockey game. A 2-0 win for the Vancouver Canucks over the Toronto Maple Leafs and a 3-1 lead in the series. Now, the Canucks have the Leafs, Harry, in the same position that they themselves were in against Calgary. What does Pat Burns have to say to his charges now for Game 5? Well, I'm not sure he's saying very much right now, except he's saying they played a lot better and had every bit of a, as much a chance to win as Vancouver did. But he now will start in... Uh, win one game and we get them back to Maple Leaf Gardens for two. We can't worry about whether we're down 3-1 or not. We have to start worrying about Tuesday night. Can we make these guys take the long trip to Toronto where our playoff record is far better than it is on the road? It's a tough sell and you know Pat Quinn saying, don't forget Calgary boys, don't forget they had us by the throat. So we're going to see a good game, game five. The Leafs have an awful mountain to climb. But you can't make the climb, Bob, if you don't complete the first step. All right. You have two teams, one of whom will be in the Stanley Cup final here in 94. Vancouver or Toronto. Vancouver with the upper hand right now, of course, with her win tonight, 2-0 and a 3-1 lead in the series. Here again is Rob McLean. Thanks, Bob. Don Cherry, uh, Ian Young was great on the grapevine. You better believe it, and uh, he helped him write a book. He's going to take him and let his, uh, you know, people remember, he's going to let his defense go. It said the defense turned that way because, as Johnny Garrett said, they're not used to uh, when, he do, when he don't play a lot. I think, you want my personal opinion, I'm going to tell you how Jacques Lemaire... ...and up about Pot Van 2 in a game that seemed like a must-win for the Leafs. 3-1 series lead for Vancouver. Pot Van's the number... Three star, face 21 shots. Kirk McLean, 29 saves for the second game in as many. Felix wears the 29, but so does Kirk well. And Cliff Ronning scores his fourth of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and that proves to be the game winner in a 2 0 shutout victory for Vancouver. Tomorrow evening at MSG, it's a 7 30 Eastern start. Game five, the Devils and the Rangers tied at 2 2 in that best of seven and of course we'll be back on tuesday evening for game five of this clash the canucks leading the western conference final three games for one tonight's game in beautiful bc our executive producer ron harrison ron's been guesting with frank rigney here for the last couple of days he and sally out on the water enjoying themselves larry isaac lives here our producer so does Ron Forsythe now as he moved over from Calgary. I'm filling here, folks, best I can. Don Moss, our isolation director, did another great job with replays tonight. Linda Chang made sure the music was okay in the opening. And our thanks to all the technical and production staff, except for Glenn, who walked through the shot when we were interviewing Cliff Running. <laughs> Alan Clark, the head of CBC Network Sports, and our senior producer is Doug Sellers. And those fellows uh, will be out on Vancouver Island all summer as we mount our coverage of the Commonwealth Games. Jelena to running to Sergio Mameso. He's 14 goals this year with hands like that. He's going to score 50 next year. Right to Cliff in the slot. And running scores the goal that sends Pat Quinn with a little arms up just for a second. And the Canucks know they've got a two-game lead. Kirk McLean with the shutout performance will be back as the Canucks play for the Stanley Cup. A dozen years later, a former New Jersey Devil has designs on a similar rendezvous. Kirk McLean has four shutouts in the playoffs, and presently a goal is string in excess of 135 minutes. Is his four-leaf clover saying four over the Leafs, or can Toronto solve the Western Stonewall? One thing certain, there's a captain in the King's domain who ranks with the best. Another beautiful dry day in the lower mainland, and the Toronto Maple Leafs know all about droughts. 135 shots they've peppered Kirk McLean with, Six goals only, and all of those in Toronto, they just can't seem to beat him in Vancouver. The Canucks a commanding 3-1 series lead as we get set for Game 5 of the Western Conference Final, Toronto at Vancouver. Good evening. Welcome to Molson Hockey Night in Canada, the Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm Ron McLean with Benji Cooper. Benji, hang in there now. This is an important debut for a 17-year-old, but uh, thanks for coming aboard. Tell me about this version of the Stanley uh, Cup you have here. Well, about two years ago, um, when the Canucks beat uh, Winnipeg, Game seven, I jumped on the ice, and I paraded around with it, and then I gave it to Pavel, and he held it up. 
it was amazing. I, I recall you being out there. We'll get that shot eventually. Uh, see your favorite Canuck? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. What do you think about the Canucks? Uh, how many games do you get to during the year? I get to about 15 a year, and I try to get to as many as possible in the playoffs. Is this your first playoff game? Uh, no, I went to the whole first round, but uh, this is my first for, uh, since then. Well, it's a great spirit in this uh, building. What's your prediction for the game? 4-3 uh, in OT. Vancouver, I'm guessing. Hell yeah. Well, I'll tell you a couple of things to think about. For one, Vancouver's come back from 3-1 deficits twice. You were here the night they did it for Winnipeg, and of course against Calgary it happened at the Saddle Dome. Twelve teams in history have done that, but none's ever done it in the third round, and that's the big question. In the old days, there's only two rounds of playoffs. Since 1987, ten teams have come back from 3-1 deficits. Toronto's trying to do that, but do they have the grit five weeks into the playoffs? We went to two arch enemies. Tim Hunter and Doug Gilmore to discuss Game 5 this evening, and you'll see there's not a lot of talking here. Both men had their game faces on in anticipation of tonight. Well, just uh, how serious this game really is, and, you know, as far as be loose, but go out and play hard. And the, the biggest thing for us, the Toronto Maple Leafs, is go out hard and at all times give it our best shot, and we'll see what happens. No, that's right, and uh, they're going to have to be patient and wait for us to do it, and uh, we're, we're ready. Uh, we're going to play our game and worry about us, and that's the main thing. When the Vancouver Canucks went to the Stanley Cup for Harry Neal back in 1982, they won to go there in Chicago. Tonight could be the biggest victory in franchise history on Pacific Coliseum ice. Well, Harry, you had that celebration 12 years ago. What about tonight? And let's start with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Can they save off elimination? And if so, how? Well, certainly they were. Remember Calgary, meaning the Flames had the Canucks by the throat three games to one and lost it. As we all know, I'm sure Pat Quinn is trying to remind his team that the Leafs were down 3-2. The San Jose Sharks had the last two of Maple Leaf Gardens, beat them in an advance to the next round. I'm sure he's saying that they were lucky to win perhaps game four, and if we have to go back to Maple Leaf Gardens in the nine games, the Leafs have only lost, given up 15 goals against, and on the road, they're not nearly as strong, and I am sure it's an unemotional, but to the point message. Now, Pat Burns has got a much more difficult chore to try and convince his team to get out there within a good frame of mind when they're down 3-1, and I'm sure he's saying the first 10 minutes, let's win the first 10 minutes and go from there. Telling his players, no passengers tonight. If you aren't going, you aren't playing. And if I have to go with six forwards and three defensemen, that's what I'll go with. But we do need some offensive help from our best offensive players. They have drawn a blank this series so far, mostly due to the great goaltending of Kirk McLean. Sure, like 12 years ago, Harry. What about first goal tonight? Well, the first goal has been monumental in this series. In the playoffs, Vancouver are 10 and 1 when they get it. The Leafs are 9 and 1 when they get it. Maybe we should go home as soon as the first team scores. Well, the fellow who calls owes your cohort, Bob Coles, in the broadcast booth. And Bob, before we get to Game Five, a word from you. All right, we've been talking about Kirk McLean, and rightly so, he's been fabulous in this series. But the six men in front of him have been equally as fabulous. Brown, Hedekin, Lume, Glenn, and the two veterans, Gerald Dedick and Dave Babich, have never played better defensively. If the Leafs are going to do anything tonight, and in this series, they've got to solve the Vancouver defense. And that's not going to be too easy. When you're talking about defense, and you talk about Kirk McLean, well, as they say, he's like a seventh defenseman. He handles the puck as well as anybody in this league in the Whites. 11 years ago, 11 victories for Richard Brodeur. Captain Kirk's on a similar roll. He'll go for his 12th, and it would be a big one. To tell you the truth, as much as it's a mood of celebration in the building, I'd say it looks a little tense in here. I think the fans realize they don't want to go back to Maple Leaf Gardens. The eyes will tell the story. Let's enjoy Game 5 of the Western Conference Final on Bolson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC.
singing of O Canada. down the ice by Berg and McLean stepping out of the net going the other way away from the rushing Berg. It is Burray's pass. Dangerous looking pass with Eastwood coming in but he just missed it. No score. First period. Six and a half minutes into it. Diddick is moving up to hit Berg. Puck is cleared inside the Vancouver line. Babbage after it. And Ronning are in there and Ronning slapped it on the boards. Eastwood stopped that. Eastwood dropped it out to the line. Gill faked his shot. He went in deep and put it in back of the net. And there was McLean out of the goal. It is back of the goal again. And Clark was upended. The Leafs are on the puck. And they're causing some problems for the Canucks now. The shot by Osborne is blocked. McLean has had to make one difficult one. The puck was given away here by Yerke Lume. Eastwood, you're right. Bob walks out. The defenseman takes the pass away, and McLean cheats ever so slightly towards Clark, and Eastwood puts it up over him on the short side to make it 1-0. Oh, They protected in the warm-up now with a plastic shield, so we learned we can't trust the players in the warm-up when we put the net cam in there. Maybe if we ask the players to pay for it. Took 10 seconds on the power play. That's number one in the National Hockey League playoffs on the road. The Leafs win the draw. We know they killed the Canucks in game one with point shots. So the Leafs are forced to try and make the play down low against the two defensemen. And they get away with it right here. As you can see, Gerald Diddick and Babbage both had their back turned to Gilmore. McLean got a bit of it, but not enough of it to keep it from going in. Into the 
number four, Dave Ellip. Ellip and Borshevsky with a tough bullet on a three on one. And the Leafs have silenced the sellout crowd at the Pacific Coliseum with three goals here in the first period. And they're leading three to nothing. Well, Wendell Clark has got one of the better shots in the National Hockey League. McIntyre goes down. The uh, Canucks can't keep the puck, and McIntyre's hurt, so he couldn't get in on the back check. A three-on-one, I don't think Wendell even looked at his two partners. He just wanted to get it on the net, knowing that one, if not both the others, would be going to the net, and Kirk McLean again gets a piece of it, but not enough of it. And with 7.41 to go, the Leafs have told the Canucks in no uncertain terms the series is not over. With an assist, well, the second point of the game, he scored the first goal by Putman. The officials are in there quickly, and I don't think any penalties will result here. Bill McCurry hasn't made a move. Putman again coming up big in this first period. This time on Burry. Well, there's been some bone crushers, and here is as good a check as any. Courtney looking down to kick the puck ahead, and before he can look up, he is down. And Burry, after he took that dangerous shot, was taken into the end of the rink with Lefebvre by Lefebvre, and Burry comes back with a stick. So the animosity that wasn't available in game four seems to have returned in game five. Three to nothing, Toronto leading with 4.36 remaining in the first period. Randy Minton's got three throwouts. I think five's the record. He made his pass right onto the money for Adams, but he was checked immediately by Osborne. Vancouver back up. Hedekin and Brown. Hedekin again. Up as far as center. Only one penalty. He looks like he's in a great deal of pain right here. He's trying to stand up and get off. He's hanging on to Dmitry Miranov. And it'll be very surprising if this isn't a serious leg injury. Those feet first slides. It's his right leg, obviously, and those feet first slides can really be dangerous. Defenseman Todd Gill hustling back in his own zone with Vancouver turning it on. And he was hit into the boards down to the right of Putman. You can see he is in a bit of pain. We'll look at it again. See Gill trying to stop and get the hold of the puck, and there is his foot. The front of his skate hit the boards just above the yellow baseboard. Now watch it here. So Mameso's just running him in. And of course, Mameso's a big, strong boy. And there's Gill's right foot. Go right in, skate first. Something has to give. And it did. And Todd Gill's in the dressing room in a great degree, degree of pain. Two minutes and 31 seconds left in the opening period. And it's just becomes the general manager of the Quebec Nordique. His son is on the Leafs. And by the Leafs 10. Well, neither one of these teams in these 94 playoffs has won a game when they were trailing after the first period. The Canucks 0-1, Toronto 0-5. And, and they both are 6-0, Toronto, Vancouver 7-0 when they lead. So that first goal, first period stat has been huge. And coming up in our first intermission, of course, Don Cherry in the coach's corner. Eastwood, Gilmore on a power play, and Clark were the goal scorers for Toronto in period one. And the score after one period, Toronto Maple Leafs three, Vancouver Cox nothing. Corner with Don Cherry. Brought to you by Pepsi. Be young. Have fun. Drink Pepsi. All right, put it there, pal. My type of guys, right? There you go. See what I mean? You get these commies, then you get the good guys here. Great <laughs> job. There's Blue, biggest fan, right there. Great guys. It's going to be on CBC, guys. Wicked. There's Blue right there, a lovely girl named Jenny. Maybe this uh, in the Coliseum here. By the way, you know what You know what the Canucks should do? They should go get Hunter and show some discipline. By the way, whoa, look, look out, wait a minute, hold, look out, get off. There, they come again, get off. 
They're back on the bandwagon again. It's funny. Toronto They're Maple all Leafs. back uh, on the bandwagon. Don't look at me. I'm a neutral observer here, but... Uh, neutered. You're a neutered oh, observer. Well, calling a spade a spade, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about what we saw at the top there, the Rottweiler. What was that all about? Ah, uh, that went out CBC, had some fun, and uh, some of the left-wing pickles were yelling at me, and then... Uh, then the, the good guys come along, the beer drinking guys drink most of the Rottweiler. Great dog. How come we didn't show the other guy? I don't know. I don't know why they didn't. Anyhow, all I know is they're not calling them Wendy now. And it's the same old thing. Pat Quinn knew it. It's they come down. Oh, hey, we got her wrapped up. 3-1. It's all over. The other guys are desperate. McLean's not having a good game. Finally, he's not having a good game. That's it. And Potvin is in one of those moods that he was in in the seventh game. Every once in a while, he gets in one of those moods, and he's hot right now. It sort of seemed without him, though, that Vancouver could have been up 3 zip. Well, that's what I'm talking about. He's in one of those moods. The last time, Pat Quinn knows they didn't play a good game the last time. They only had 11 shots in two periods. All right, uh, we'll move on to uh, last night's game. I was at the Cloverdale Rodeo. You should sure, I don't blame it that much. He gets out there. Messier half-injured is better than, like, Wendell Clark. By the way, what a zinger there Wendell has, eh? They're not calling him Wendy now. No, he said that, but... Uh, I'm he's saying it again because that really ticks me off when I hear that stuff. Well, that is brutal. You're getting more authority on their shots. Remember we talked about that the other day? There's hard shots, and uh, Low Kirk made 20 yeah. saves. They didn't seem to get the quality That's shots. That's right, and, and if you go by morning skates, we were at the morning skates. Mm. I'm telling you, Vancouver, let's go, ho, ho! Glenn Hanlon, let ho! All hollering, and it was like a... It was like a morgue for the Toronto one, eh? There was no sound. I heard Pat said, come on, guys, let's get some life. Shows you. Can't ever tell those morning skates. He went over to Doug Gilmore. You were a little teary-eyed when I came by with the stats. You didn't want him, but we were going around the rink talking to different people. You, you know, I got to... You kids out there... Rose says, I got to let you finish. You kids out there, you, get, you should think of Dougie Gilmore. I didn't know it was the guy sitting... I thought it was a black ace sitting over there. Dougie Gilmore, 10 to 15 minutes sitting, waiting to get on the ice. By the way, I hear you getting Pavel on, eh? Yes, second All right. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I'm outside signing autographs for 15 minutes. And I, you know, I, and I'm taking abuse. Guys are hollering, calling me a bitch. Are you ever? Yelling, screaming at, yo, back to Toronto and all stuff like that. But I'm signing because the kids are nice. All of a sudden, zoom. Who is it? It's Pavel. And I understand this guy will not stop and sign autographs for these here kids. And the one kid says, we don't get out of the way, he'll drive us down, he has the car inside. Now this guy's going to earn four million bucks. Now wait a minute, he's going to earn four million bucks. I remember Bobby Hall, I remember Bobby Orr, I remember Gordy, I remember Bobby Hall one time, that's God's truth. He was going, he had 49 games, he was trying to get the 50th goal at 49 to bake the rocket. It was in, it was in, the, in the Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, it was in the warm-up. I swear to God, he signed autographs for the whole warm-up. And the only reason he stopped signing autographs, the Zamboni come around. Now, somebody better get a hold of this kid and say, whoa, just a minute, kid. You're a good hockey player, and he is a good hockey player, but these are the kids that are going to pay your salary. You'll don't, be over don't a month you think, though, it might be, Apparently, there's been a problem with the Players Association and collectors that hang around at the north end of the college. You can always tell a collector. You want to know how you... I started this. They used to bend the thing. I can tell them. You want to know how I tell... Uh, what do you want? Oh, just sign your name. How about me? There's pictures, guys in Detroit and the Sault Ste. Marie selling my picture for 15 to 20 bucks. And the poor kid's got it. What am I going to get? Mad or something? I always sign it for him. But here's how you can always tell a collector. All right. What you do? Who do you want it to? Oh, no, just sign it. You scumbag. Who do you want it to? You can always tell that. Sign the kids' autographs. They're the kids that are going to be the fans of the future. Don Sherry, a signature performance on Coach's Corner on Molson Hockey Night in Canada in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Not bad, not CBC. bad. Didn't know I was going to say that either. Not bad. Ice with the Elite. The new Hockey Hall of Fame honors almost 300 of the game's greatest contributors. Throughout the postseason, we present many of them on Hockey's Great Wall. Brought to you by Ford of Canada proud founding sponsor of the Hall of Fame and makers of the 1995 Windstar. Tonight, the man whose name is synonymous with great goaltending, George Vesna, up next. George Vesna was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1945, among the elite members of his sport to be so honored in the initial wave of inductees. Known as the Shakutami Cucumber for his ever-present cool demeanor, Vesna was also durable. Turned pro with the Habs in 1910 and for the next decade played a total of 328 games, forging a 3.45 goals against average in a period when goalies weren't allowed to drop to their knees. 
He was a member of the Canadian Cup winners in 16 and 24. In 25, Vesna died tragically of tuberculosis, but the sport he loved and played so well has honored him ever since, awarding a trophy in his name. The front of me believes that four or five chances to get the puck out of the zone. You knew that the Vancouver defenseman would pinch as Glenn does. Corto takes the shot. That one stopped by Potman. But Murray Craven, who's gone to the net without the puck, is rewarded with it. Potman gets a bit of it, but it goes up and over. Just over a minute and a half into the second period. And the Canucks have got exactly what they want to mount any kind of a chance of a comeback.
to go across at this particular angle with the crowd. At the line, and Burry, the two of them. Burry pass! Lumet was in the... Well, the Leafs come up with that one. And Bird brings it out. A two-on-one. Here's a pass. And Zezel apparently was offside on the rush. And he didn't hear the whistle. I don't think the players did either. But it was offside. We want to make it perfectly clear. You'll find guaranteed low prices at your Canadian Tire store every day. If you find a better price anywhere, we'll match it. Guaranteed. On the power play, the long pass across the zone. If it had not been intercepted or partially intercepted by Bill Burke, Lume would have had a good opportunity to score. That's a great and a save for Vancouver. As it hit the post and bounced down there, and McLean got his glove on it. What a stop that was by Kirk McLean to keep his team in this game. That's the second 10-bell save. Looks like there's a penalty on it to Nicky Borshevsky. Now watch this. It's a two-on-one rush. McCowan jumps into the rush. Takes a nice pass and then doesn't shoot it. That's not the stop. Gilmore's going to wrap around with it now. Now watch the stop by McLean right here. Oh, with his glove. And then knocks it behind the net. Here's the net cam's view. That puck is going in. So he gets that big trap around it. Where Shevsky gets a roughing penalty after the play. It really upsets the event or the Leaf coach Pat Burns. One thing we know about Nikolai Borshevsky, Bob, roughing penalties are not very common by him. He's got one now at 17.01 of this second period. Trevor Linden, a black eye and all out there, leading his troops. Trying to tie the game now, but here's Berg with a shot. Burry got a stick in front of that shot off Bill Berg. Leafs send the Canucks back, but it's dumped over the glass near center ice. Pacific game six as the Devils try to wrap up a shocker in the Eastern Conference final. Meantime, if game six is necessary, the Vancouver Canucks and Toronto Maple Leafs will travel to Toronto for game six at 8 ED5 local time here in Vancouver. Pavel Burry will join me in our second intermission, Bob. Brown shoots one and pop out a save. Big rebound. Back to the line for Brown again. To Lume on this power play for the Canucks. They whip it around outside. Lume to Bure. Bure drives it. How much on it? Evans, I think, will get the goal to tie the game for Vancouver here in the second period. Greg Adams grabbed a rebound on a shot to pass. There's Adams' eight. The shot hits two or three legs and then comes to Adams and he puts it between the legs of Putman. Burry missed the shot but got it on the net. Adams is there for the rebound and the score's tied. Open when the puck got to Adams. 09 away from the third. Pat Burns has got to jack his team up. Pat Quinn has got to keep his team up during the intermission. Unless there's a goal scored in the last minute to distance with Mr. Burray. <laughs> He's going to go up so he can really get his point across here. The face off is to the left of the lane. With 51 seconds left of the period. 3-3 tie. Borshevsky after the puck. Going around the net. Borshevsky's coming in. And he can't get by the table. Hit him. And he went 
sliding into the boards, but Burry is okay. He is chasing Lefebvre, who gets the puck out over the line. 23 seconds left of the period. McCown taking a look at the clock, shooting it off the boards to center ice. 15 seconds remaining. And he talked to Hunter, and uh, then Andrew Chuck went over and robbed him a bit, but the officials get in there very quickly. Puckman very upset that Hunter, as the period ended, wired the shot over the head of Puckman. Puckman's argument is it was shot after the whistle. And Potvin went right after him. The period just ended now. And Potvin goes in and gives a little gentle reminder to Hunter. I don't think there's any penalties on the play. It remains to be seen. McCown was over complaining to McCurry about the slash. For 13 by Toronto 8. Craven, Lafayette, and Adams have tied it up for the Canucks. And the score at the end of the second period. Canucks 3. Leafs three. Beautiful Vancouver words. 3-3 three, three at the end of two periods of play. Potvan and McIntyre draw minors at periods end, so the teams will play four on four to start uh, the third, if I have that right. There it is, 3-3 three, three in uh, game five. The Canucks trying to wrap it up on home ice tonight. And here's the Russian rocket, Pavel Bure. Uh, what a comeback. What did Pat Quinn say that got you going? Well, you know, he didn't say a lot. He just said, you guys come out on the ice and try to score just one goal first, and after we'll see what's going to happen. Right, Craven scoring early. Uh, how do you feel, Pavel? You got the jump? Well, yeah, I think, you know, we got the jump right now because it's a big, it's huge comeback from 3-0 to 3-3. So, but it's, you know, it's another period to go and we're going to work hard. We'll see what's going to happen. Bernie Nichols said uh, last night that when he got suspended for one game, it was such a break after two months of hockey to take a day off. Uh, do you feel when you play your game skating, uh, do you feel tired or do you feel fresh? How do you? Well, you know, Every day it feels different. Sometimes you feel, you know, like you like flying. Some same time you move, uh, your feet doesn't move. So, you know, it's every every day different. How do you feel tonight? All right. Good. Let's talk about uh, the Red Army. I saw you in 1989 when the Calgary Flames were the Stanley Cup champions, and uh, you were a youngster playing over on that team. But who was your uh, boyhood hero, Sergei Makarov? What did you try to do uh, to mirror him? Well, you know, when I was a young kid, I used to went to watch practice. Not every day, but you know, five, six times a week. And uh, after I had a chance to play with those guys like Makarov, Florionov, Kosatonov, Fedisev, and they helped me a lot. In what uh, particular asset? Uh, how to look after yourself? How to pass? Well, you know, everything, you know, like how to handle the puck, you know, how to read the play, you know, how to get open, everything. Is there a, uh, Tikhanov always had systems in place. Uh, did it bother you when you got to the NHL to try and work with it? The, they were a unit, the five-man unit. As great as Sergei was, I think he was really frustrated in Calgary. Uh, did you find it difficult, or were you always able to play uh, generating stuff on your own? Well, you know, different is, is those guys came over when they were 30, and I came over when I was 20. So I think for me it was much easier to get used to it. Now, let's uh, get to the question every Vancouver fan wants to know. I know you've been downplaying this, but what are you going to do? Will you re-sign with Vancouver, or will you test the market? Well, you know, we just decided to drop it right now until playoffs finish. And leave it at that? We're going to leave it at that. Well, good luck in the third period tonight. Uh, right, Pat thank doesn't you. want to hear anything about that. And congratulations on the great playoff run you've had. Thank you very much. Pavel Burry of the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, we'll go to commercial here, and then you can run off and okay. see what Pat's saying about uh, the great comeback after uh, two periods of play. Up next, we'll talk a little bit about changes around the NHL. There's a new management team in Los Angeles and Quebec. That's next on Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC. Three to Canucks and the Leafs after two periods of play in Game 5. As Harry Neal mentioned earlier on the telecast, big changes today. It's nice to see Sam McMaster, a great hockey man from the Ontario Hockey League, get the job in Los Angeles. He's the new GM there. And in Quebec City, Pierre Lacroix has taken over the helm of the Quebec Nordiques. Changes made necessary. These two teams uh, involved in the playoffs in such a big way a year ago. But after the Nordiques had improved 52 points last year, they falter this season and don't make the Stanley Cup playoffs as a result. Pierre Lacroix, in a surprise move, he says he just found out a week or so ago that he'd be involved. Well, he spoke to Pierre Dufault of our La Soiree telecast earlier tonight. Why would a man like you, a successful businessman, uh, at 46 years old, abandon everything and uh, take a challenge that seems, uh, for certain persons anyway, almost impossible?
to drop the puck. You wonder if maybe one of the supervisors called down and had them and had them stop the game for another look. All right, we are 16.4 seconds right now on the clock away from the question mark becoming Y-O-R-K. But there's confusion here about the time clock. Yes, they put it back to 18.6 from 16.4. The Devils gain a couple of valuable seconds. Now we're ready, and from the faceoff, Tied up again behind the net, Bookaboom around the board, Stryver has moved in, Warmer and hit, centered it, side of the net, they back away and score! Devils have tied it! Bill McCreary just got bumped by Mike Richter, and Richter better be careful, or he might not be around for the overtime. Valerie Zalapukin was poking away at the side. And the devil. Poised and confident, that's the words they were using to describe their team, getting the, the kind of respect that they deserve. Not all the ghosts have been exercised yet. Claude Lemieux throws it out, Zalapukin has a crack at it. It's under Mike Richter and a second shot. What a save by Richter on the first one. I couldn't believe he got the first one. Zalapukin, the shot, Richter gets the left leg on the first one and then has two cracks at it. They got the second one by him. 1952. Time of the goal. Brodeur will hold it long enough. Unbelievably. We're headed for overtime in game seven. Thanks to the goal by Valerie Zilipukin. Well, we tried to set that up, John, going back to game one with the goaltender out. But I'll tell you, the Devils had terrific intensity on those face-off situations. Bernie Nichols did a good job tying up Mark Messier and... As you say, the hunger and the eagerness for the Devils to compete in the last minute along the boards, on the faceoffs, and in front of Mike Richter. Bella Pukin hung right in. In that last sequence of plays, through the last minute after Roger had been taken out, they had three shots on goal, the third one going in. And five minutes before that, they'd had none. Stella Pukin gets the goal. It's his third of the series, fifth overall. Here's another look. Claude Lemieux, the assist with 7.7 seconds to go. Folks, we're headed to overtime in game seven. Bulls have tied it with 7.7 seconds left. This game is now 1-1, game seven of the Eastern Conference Final between the Devils and the New York Rangers. This game has gone to overtime twice, double overtime. In the first game, Stefan Riche scored the double overtime goal to win it for the New Jersey Devils. And in game number three on May 19th, it was Stefan Matteau who scored for the New York Rangers. The puck comes in front of the net in front of Martin Brodeur and Matteau scores. The Rangers win it two overtimes and it is going to overtime for a third time in the Eastern Conference Final. Mike Hudson of the Rangers, not dressed tonight. This is too much to take. Uh, what's it like for you watching it on the sidelines? Are you disappointed, first of all? You obviously have to be. Oh, of course we are. We, uh, we thought we had that game and uh, well, bad period. But, uh, you know, it's still it's up for grabs. There's nothing you can do about it. They scored. We just have to move on right now. What about the emotion in this building right now, uh, Mike? Uh, the fans were up chanting. Uh, they've been that way a lot of the night. Uh, this obviously means so much. Yeah, the New York fans have been pretty good to us all year. They've given us a lot of breaks, and uh, I hope tonight we can pull it out for them. It's going to be tough, though. New Jersey's played well. This is a first-place team against a second-place team, so you knew it was going to be close, but uh, this overtime is going <laughs> to be really close. Now, the last time I talked to you about overtime, uh, you <laughs> gave us the great answer. You said it's going to be Brian Noonan, your teammate, on a dump-in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get you to pick another one tonight. Uh, don't say Brian Noonan again, but uh, no, no, who will you pick tonight? Brian's hurting, so I'm not going to take him. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take Adam Graves. Adam Graves. Playing a tough game in front of the net. All right. Now, let me ask you one more question. That's about uh, your position. Um, you're not dressed. Uh, how do you feel about that? What's a player feel like when he's not dressed? It's a really difficult situation out there. I tell you, it's probably a lot easier to play the game than to watch the game for a player. But... Uh, you know, with such a lineup we have right now, and after my suspension, um, Keenan made a couple Canucks of... Canucks are in against the new question marks, and the Devils have made that so much tougher to decide because we are going to overtime. The game is tied.
1-1. We're at Madison Square Garden in New York, again heading for overtime in the Eastern Conference Final. Stay tuned for more on Molson Hockey Night in Canada. Here is the reason why we're going to overtime. The Rangers a scant eight seconds away from the Stanley Cup Final, and Valerie Zelopukin is parked on the doorstep, Mike Richter's doorstep. He bangs it home with 7.7 .7 seconds left to tie this game at one and send it to overtime. Well, this is almost too much to take. All the fans here at Madison Square Garden would tell you that. Right now, to comment on this overtime, let's head upstairs and join our two analysts, Dick Irvin and John Garrett. Well, I don't know if you're ready for this, folks, but during the second intermission, one of the statisticians here at Madison Square Garden told me that the last time the New York Rangers won a playoff game by a score of 1-0 was on March the 26th, 1940. <laughs> well, they were 7.7 .7 seconds away from doing it 54 years later, it looked like maybe the world was going to unfold for them as per 1940. <laughs> Didn't work out. But it was a bit of a shocking end, John. It wasn't the case of the Devils having to catch up and storming through, say, the last half of the period. Well, it wasn't like game one where the Devils were carrying some of the play and the Rangers were on their heels a little bit before they got that big goal at the end. This time, the Devils were doing nothing. Five minutes, you mentioned it, five minutes without a shot, no control at all. And yet, they win the... And it scores the goal with 7.7 .7 seconds left. And here are the New York Rangers heading back onto the ice to try and recover from what has been a devastating rally by the New Jersey Devils in this Eastern Conference Championship. Mark Messier on the ice now for the New York Rangers played such a great role in winning game number six, 4-2, the hat trick. Adam Graves heading onto the ice. Rick on his ankle. Mike Richter has had time to calm down after his emotional outburst. He ran into Bill McCreary, and McCreary was very cool about it all. Paid no attention, just skated over to the box and put the jersey goal up. Away we go. Overtime in game seven. It doesn't get better than this. Messier, Kovalev, and Graves are up front for the New York Rangers against Korski, Lemieux, and Carpenter. And offside the call at the line, 18 seconds in. Kovalev out with Messi and Graves. Not how the game started. Glenn Anderson was on this line. Mike Keenan trying to generate some offense early. The ice has been a lot better here than it was in game five. Not as humid outside. Chris, you and I were in a broadcast booth last year in the playoffs when they... And what's up with this? Well, the Canuck Mobile is a 1977 AMC Matador and has carried Werner and two buddies from Vancouver to New York. Needless to say, it has been an interesting trip. But we were having fun. It was a blast coming over here. We stopped by Medicine Hat and see Trevor Linden's parents. That's his grandmother. You can find his parents. The 77 Matador is the car. It's compared to a Ferrari. Like, like I'm saying, look at this car. It's amazing. It's under bay. I lost the muffler. So we have a muscle car now. It sounds like one. It's a high pitch legging sound. It's like a Harley Davidson. With the help of mechanics and sponsors, the Canuck Mobile found its way to the Canucks Team Hotel Tuesday afternoon, where they sought advice about a parking spot around Madison Square Garden. You know, Anywhere in New York, you got to park the car in the garage. You don't think the car gets messed up by New York Ranger fans? Oh, before the game, though. No. After the game, yes. Hi, <laughs> Mr. Hunter. This Getting tickets to the Stanley Cup games may prove even tougher than getting to New York. They are hoping to get some from the Canucks organization. After all, any money they get through donations will go to Canuck Place. So is there any trepidation as you come into the Big Apple with a Canuck Mobile? These people have not won a Stanley Cup in 54 years. They're not friendly people. We're absolutely freaked out of our mind. We were talking to people all the way in, like through New Jersey, and they're saying, we're afraid of New York, don't go to New York. And basically, we're probably going to be parking our car somewhere outside of New, New York state limits before the game. Because supposedly, if we drive it up to the game, it'll just get really uh, upside down, yeah. Gary McDonald, CBC News, New York. <laughs> well, there were a lot, not a lot of 1977 matadors in this afternoon's rush hour, but a lot of folks hit the road home. Really? No, no, I just got off work now. Go Canucks. We, we're going home now. Do? 
What did I mean? Watch the hockey game. Watch the hockey game, yeah. Really? Yeah. You guys left work early to do this? Uh, not really, not really. We just finished the shift. Are you rushing home for the game? I'm, I'm going to get screamed at if I don't go. It's nice to get there a little early, yeah, for the hockey game. What's going to happen? Uh, Canucks, of course. In five. Okay, sorry. Do you watch the hockey game? No. No? I'm going to the dentist. <laughs> oh. And yeah, we'll have more on the Canucks a little bit later. Running! 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 No. Uh, Linden. Linden. Linden! That's right. Oh, you can touch Linden's glove. Oh, oh, glove. What is it? Oh, 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 I'd like to try it on. Did you want to try it on? I like that like wearing Pavel Bury's helmet. Cool. Fun. So connects if you don't win Pavel, get more lucky charms and if you lose harsh, I'm gonna smash my head in the wall. Feels like the connects are gonna cut beat beat the New York Rangers and win the Stanley Cup and I bet um Don Cherry's gonna like the Canucks more than any other team. What's the second course? We, we will rock you. Talk about rocking, you know, not everybody likes Fever becomes an officially recognized medical condition. It's the only excuse thousands of folks in BC have for skipping work early today so they wouldn't miss the start of the Stanley Cup final. They waited 12 long years for another chance to get their hands on Lord Stanley Silverware. For some fans, TV is not close enough. Our man in New York, Barry McDonald, discovered some Canuck fans are willing to pay almost anything outside Madison Square Gardens this evening just to be there in person. Eric, we have some people here in New York that are living very dangerously. Wearing Canuck uniforms, Delia, you're from Vancouver. How did you manage to get a ticket? Oh, through a package. Are you feeling safe out here? Yes, quite safe. You're all huddled <laughs> together, though. We're not going to uh, go apart from each other. We're sticking together. Are you there's a lot of good people here. Taking some abuse? Oh, a little bit. <laughs> Mike? Barry, I'm actually living dangerously. These guys all have tickets. I don't have a ticket yet, so I'm hoping Steve Town believes the Canucks is coming through for me and he has them waiting for me. If not, I'm in big trouble, but... What are you going to... They're going to be in, you're going to be out here? Yeah, and I'll... Oh, hey! hey! And, I'll, and, if I, and if I do get in, I'll be sitting by myself, so... Oh, help me! These people are asking, what's a Canuck? Have you got an answer for them? A Canuck is a Stanley Cup champion! Yeah! It is Bedlam, Eric. Back to you. The hockey game is coming up. Looks like Barry picked up the first stitches of the final. Last chance to check your pacemakers. Game one begins in a matter of minutes. The opening faceoff is scheduled for 5.08, but could be delayed by the player introductions. The Canucks and Rangers didn't make all the hockey news in New York today. The Islanders stole the attention for a few minutes to announce Al Arbor is retiring and will be replaced by Lauren Henning, his longtime assistant coach. What is that mobile? Not going to be popular. The following is a live presentation of CBC Sports.
of the towns who've waited some time for their ship to come in. The 1994 Stanley Cup final. Game one at Madison Square Garden, New York. They used to watch Jake LaMotta in a building named MSG. This is the new site, of course. The Canucks and the Rangers are ready for prime time. Good evening, welcome to Molson Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup Championship Series. I'm Ron McLean. Tex Rickard was a fight promoter here at MSG back in... dictated by the New York press here. We're here for a coronation, I guess, and uh, and uh, so we've, uh, they never ask you a question, they make a statement and want some sort of response to their statement, so uh, we haven't had a chance to really express how we feel. We're pretty happy to be here. We feel we're a good hockey team and we're going to give them all the, all they can handle. To win the Stanley Cup. That last March, they had a little tangle going here. We had a little trouble going. In fact, uh, the benches were going at it. Let's take a little look at that right now. We got some, uh, what should we say, rock'em, sock'em going on. Here's where Sergio kind of teach Joey Kocher a little two-step. They get into it. Now watch the benches here. So there's a lot of two Irishmen going at it here, boy. So don't think this is going to be a little tea party here. These teams are ready. They're big. They're tough. Vancouver's a bigger team. It should be a lot of fun tonight. Okay, we'll save your prediction for the coach's corner on the broadcast, joining Vaughn and me, Bob Cole, Dick Urban, and Harry Neal. As the teams take to the ice, we'll have, of course, the starting lineups and the player introductions. But let's go to the men in the booth for their feelings. Bob? Thanks, Ron, and hi again, everybody. Well, we've already seen some great playoff hockey this time around. Fourteen teams have been eliminated, and now we're down to two. What about Vancouver? They're on a roll. They've only lost two of the last 13. Their defense core was the difference in the Toronto series. They pinch well. They join the rush. They are the rush. They certainly, without question, are the biggest team of the two. And this is the fastest team in the history of the Canucks. And fourthly, Burry the home run hitter, Linden the best player, and McLean as good a goalie as there is in the playoffs. One thing about it, Dick, they've got the crowd for New York. I tell you, they've got a good goaltender, too, Bob. Good job, Ottawa and South has become a star in this league. Most of the 16 games, 1.84 goals against, but he's got to keep it up. Their penalty killing has been outstanding. For example, 39 times short on home ice in the playoffs, only two goals against. They can change the momentum of a game. And Mike Keenan's been able to get the role players to play a role. They're deep in the trenches. Best example, Stefan Matteau, of course, two big overtime goals. Well, you're right. This Richter... And may I say, Kirk McLean have been two outstanding goaltenders to get this far. And there's McLean, all ready to go. You know, the newspapers here in New York, and that's understandable, I suppose, are full of the fact that the New York Rangers are prohibitive favorites to win the Stanley Cup. Let me tell you, New York Ranger fans, something. These Canucks have defeated some pretty good teams to get here, and they themselves are a darn good hockey team. So don't count Vancouver out of this one. This can be a long, long series. This crowd is pumped up, as you well might imagine, at Madison Square Garden. Need we say sellout? Of course, and they're loud. Bob Gollerstein will introduce the players.
and gentlemen, now let's introduce the lineup for game one of the Stanley Cup Finals. First for the Western Conference champion, Vancouver Canucks. Number three, Brett Pedican. Number four, Gerald Diddick. Number seven, Cliff Running. Number eight, Greg Adams. Number 10, Pavel Duran. Number 14, Jeff Courtnall. Number 15, John McIntyre. Number 16, Trevor Linden. Number 18, Sean Antosky. Number 19, Tim Hunter. Number 21, Jorge Lumet. Number 22, Jeff Brown. Number 23, Martin Jelena. Number 25, Nathan Lafayette. Number 27, Sergio Momesso. Number 28, Brian Glenn. Number 32, Murray Craven. Number 44, Dave Babich. Number 35, Kay Whitmore. And number one, Kurt McLean. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vancouver Canucks. And now the Eastern Conference champion, New York Rangers. Number two. Number six, Doug Lister. Number nine, Adam Gray. Number ten, Etta Tinkinen. Number eleven, Captain Mark Messier. Number thirteen, Sergei. Number 16, Brian Newman. Number 17, Greg Gilbert. Number 21, Sergey Zubov. Number 23, Jeff Mokabu. Number 24, Jay. Number 26, Joe Coulter. Number 27, Alexei Kovalov. Number 28, Steve Warner. Number 32, Stefan Matteo. Number 36, Glenn Anderson. Number 30, Glenn Healy. And number 35, Mike Richter. Ladies and gentlemen, the New York Rangers. that you rise and join John Amarante in the singing of the Canadian and U.S. National Anthems.
set to Canada or in New York. Well, good evening again, everybody, from Madison Square Garden in New York, the New York Rangers and the Vancouver Canucks. About set to go in game one of the best of seven. And our crew will be covering this series from all angles. Here's our net cam, which was introduced to these playoffs. This family Cup playoff round, Kirk McLean. Well, really, two goalies at the top of their game. Kirk McLean has played in all 17 playoff games for the Canucks. Lost two in his last 13. Goals against 2.11. Here are the six defensemen who played so well against Toronto as a group. They're quick, they can move the puck, they can join the rush, they can be the rush. And the four lines that Pat Quinn has got available, the first two. A little more dangerous offensively. And Toski, McIntyre, and Hunter. You're going to be able to hear them for check. You won't have to watch them. There are the scratches. Merge is ready to go, but can't get in the lineup. I think we'll see him before long. Wow, Mike Richter has become a much better goaltender since he got the job all to himself with the John Van Beesbrook shift out of New York. And he has been absolutely outstanding in the playoffs. The goaltenders have to be if their team reaches the final series. The surprise with the Ranger defense, the return to action of Kevin Lowe. He was thought to be maybe out for the balance of this playoff year after his injury in Game 7 against the Devil. Doug Lister playing against his old team. And the forward line, no changes as far as Mike Keenan and the Rangers are concerned. Messier will take the opening faceoff as he has done throughout this playoff year. The referee is Terry Gregson, Randy Mitten, and Ray Scappinello will work the lines. Lyndon Burry, Adams starting up front. Vancouver, Messier, loose putt and it's jammed away from the Ranger goal. Vancouver with three pretty good chances right off the bat. We're just underway at Madison Square Garden, no score, first power play of the game. Vancouver on the move. It is chucked into the zone by Adams out of the net as Richter declared on the boards, not out. Lume stopping it, shoving it ahead. Murray is checked. Adams going back at the goal with Linden fighting for it in the corner. However, there is going to be a Vancouver penalty on the play. Trevor Linden took his man out of the play and on the board. And they'll be five aside. First power play of the series lasts 40 seconds. And the Vancouver Canucks won the draw to start the power play and had three chances, two point shots and one rebound. Good score. There's the hooking penalty on Adam Graves by 16, Trevor Linden. So we're going to play four skaters against four here for a minute and 20 seconds. And with the speed either of these teams can put out here and the extra ice available when it's four skaters against four, we may see some fancy plays here. Dick? Harry, what do you think the Rangers will do with Burry? What, how are they going to... Uh, I don't think they'll put a man on him. No. In this situation here, the left defenseman is going to be taking a look at Burry if the Canucks get a win, any kind of a rush. Raven won the ball and shot it in deep into the Rangers' zone. But here's a dangerous leap starting the Rangers' out. Pass to Graves across center ice. Coming in with a 
shot. Lane now making that look easy. And it's intercepted. Blue Bombs drive, a stop, and couldn't find it. And it hits the heel of a skate. And what in? Well, in a four-on-four -four situation, the most dangerous players are always the point men. Leach walks in off the point, then gets it back to Larmer, who shoots it. And the rebound is shoved in and just gets to the back of the net. Steve Larmer, here's a look from behind Kirk McLean. He made the initial stop on a lovely little play there. And the other one hit the post, hit his right leg, and caromed in. Hit the pad below the knee and got in over the line, and the Rangers lead one to nothing. Ranger player, Steve Larmer, I think it is. Or Joey Kosey. Who coined that phrase, I tell you, I just can't get no respect. A phrase that suited the Vancouver Canucks earlier this week suited them until Monday night when they defeated the heavily favored Rangers. But as Barry McDonald reports from New York City, not only are the Canucks earning that respect, but there's an awful lot of pressure on the boys from Broadway. <laughs> It didn't take the Vancouver Canucks very long to earn some respect amongst the New York media. <laughs> Two days ago, it was Kirk who and what's a Canuck, but not anymore. Vancouver for real screams the Daily News. Crisis time for the Rangers, according to the Post. The city will continue to panic until we lift that thing over our heads. So. Uh, nothing's really changed. We played well. Fans are panicking. We just didn't manage to get a victory, and I think we'll have a much better result tonight. But not everyone in the Big Apple is convinced the Rangers are in trouble. The only one who showed up to play, dog that, you know, really did the job was, was the goalie. You know, the Rangers played great, and uh, I think they're going to win it. They're going to win. It. It's no big deal. No matter how they do it, I mean, give us all heart attacks, but they're going to do it. They won the Stanley Cup in six games or five games. You're going to be talking about the fact that Vancouver got lucky to win game one? No. Yeah, I mean, the Rangers let games slip away. What's going to happen to the Rangers tonight? They're going to go all the way. They're going to win tonight. They, they better win tonight. Because they're my favorite team. You played here. Is it possible to play in this city without being aware of the pressure and the expectations? No, you can't. Either, wherever you go, uh, it's, it's put, up, put, put upon you and you're, uh, you go buy groceries and <laughs> people are mentioning it to you. And it's a, it's a difficult place to play. It's a great city to play in when you're winning. You know, when you're losing, it can be tough. We're all critical now at this time of year. I mean, the first game all the way through to the last game is critical, so every game just gets bigger than the next. Win or lose tonight, the Canucks should have some sort of edge as the series shifts to the West Coast Friday. Travel. Vancouver is used to it. The Rangers aren't. New York hasn't played a game outside the Eastern time zone since the end of March. I'm sure uh, they're a little more rested than we are, which might benefit them in a long series, but I think... Uh, uh, we might be able to adjust quicker, but I still think you're going to see the same team. They've got a lot of talent and experience. With another win here tonight at Madison Square Garden, the Canucks would obviously be in the driver's seat. Only two teams in the history of the Stanley Cup Finals have lost the first two games at home, then come back to win the series. Clearly, the pressure is on the Rangers. In New York, Barry McDonald, CBC News. Well, no matter what happens tonight, there are a few million people who would jump at the chance to see Saturday's game here in Vancouver. Unfortunately, there aren't a few million tickets. And as John Gibbs reports, that means that one of the most basic laws of economics is about to come into play. Officially, the 16,150 seats at the Pacific Coliseum are sold out for Saturday for prices ranging from $40 to $73. Unless you gamble on a handful that may become available on game day, you'll have to buy from a scalper. How about a pair of seats, 12 rows up from the ice, on the aisle, in a spot where two periods out of three, you get a great view of the Canuck offense trying to score. You can still buy these seats. But our defense played well. They belong to retired lawyer Brian Prentice, a season ticket holder since the Canucks joined the NHL 23 years ago. He wants $500 each, 1000 for the pair. If you've got the money, 
I mean, you enjoy hockey, what the hell? If you're not a big... Today's classifieds have more than 60 ads buying and selling Stanley Cup tickets, up to $1,000 for a single corporate box seat, although the cheap seats are cheaper. Tickets are anywhere from $150 to $350. Don Motz is a professional buying and selling Canuck tickets. Yeah. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Okay, I'll see you here. Bye. Crazy. You're a hockey fan, right? I'm a hockey fan. I love hockey. I love the Vancouver Canucks. For Brian Prentice, $1,000 would help pay for next year's season tickets. $3,800 a pair and maybe rising. So you don't feel guilty about asking 1000 bucks for these? Not in the least. Somebody wants to go that badly, they'll pay the $1,000. If not, you go. I'll go, sure, and enjoy every minute of it. Now, if the Canucks win tonight in New York, Brian Prentice says the value of these two seats will jump to $1,200 for Saturday night. And if they win here on Saturday night, that means Tuesday's game here in the Coliseum could be the Stanley Cup final, in which case these two seats will become priceless. Brian Prentice says he wouldn't sell them for any money. John Gibbs, CBC News, at the Pacific Coliseum, Section V, Row 12, Seat 1. And win or lose, there's going to be a big party for the Canucks. It will be held at noon in BC Play Stadium, two days after the series ends. And if the Canucks win, there'll also be a big parade. And Vancouver's mayor is convinced there will be a parade. Philip Owen has placed a bet with New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. If the Canucks win, this flag will fly from New York City Hall. And Giuliani will have to wear his jersey to the first council meeting following the series. If the Rangers win, Owen has to wear one of their jerseys and fly their flag for a week. All right, we'll have more on the Canucks a little bit later in this half-hour edition of the Evening News. Oh, give the big one, come on. Hey! hey. <laughs> Well, I'm going to be doing that Saturday night. I got my tickets, and I'm all ready to go. And uh, but first, we got to get over tonight. And of course, that's all coming up. Today, voodoo doll, and start waving that white towel. Game two is just moments away. Unless you think that only Canadians are cheering for Vancouver, here's one more glorious look at game one with music courtesy WJRZ Radio in New Jersey, where they are fans of any team who can stick it to the Rangers. not just Joyzy fans that are getting behind the Canucks, the whole season of those tight callers have finally started to affect Don Cherry. What else could explain this fight this afternoon outside of the Manhattan Hilton? Looks like even Don Cherry is jumping on the bandwagon and jumping into the Canuck Mobile. <laughs> Here's the Canuck Mobile. That's there, you guys put away the guy. All right. A few bottles in here, but they're pop bottles, I think. Oh, here. All right, now let's hear it, guys. Three minutes time, it's the Canucks. This is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I got a tough question for you. The Vancouver Canucks feel their best player has been Gus. You know who he is. His mascot? I don't know who Gus is. Well, the Canucks tell us their best player has been Gus. Would you agree with that? 
Who's Gus? Gus? Who's Gus? Linden looking back, gets it to the line. Here's a shot by Babbage. Oh, big rebound! I have no idea who Gus is. He wasn't on the, on the ice last night. this guy. Excuse me, sir, do you know Gus? Hey, buddy, no Gus, no glory. I'm going to have to be a little less lippy in Coach's Corner tonight. That guy's tougher than I thought. Don Cherry and the New York Cabbies, men who love to blow their own horn, getting ready for game two of the 1994 Stanley Cup final. Vancouver's up one game to none as we welcome you to Madison Square Garden on Manhattan. Going crazy again, 18,200 strong. Good evening, welcome to Molson Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup Final of CBC. I'm Ron McLean. If you haven't figured it out yet, Gus is Greg Adams. They used to have two Greg Adams, so they went with his middle name, his dad's name, and Gus is his nickname. It's now one of the most popular on the West Coast. Six goals, two of them game winners, two of them game tying goals. He's been a hero along with his buddy, Kirk McLean, who stood on his head in game one. And who'd have thought Vancouver was once one and three in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now they're three wins away from the Stanley Cup itself. 13 and five, they're on quite a roll. For New Yorkers, it's been a tough couple of days. The Rangers lose in the fourth period two nights ago. The Knicks lose in the fourth period last night. And Kevin Lowe can't dress tonight. But here is some good news if you're a New Yorker. Wish the people in New York could watch Hockey Night in Canada. Because they'll remember when Nick Patillo was a hard throb here. He was always throwing the pucks up to the fans after the warm up and tonight, there it is, no jacket, right into the top row of Madison Square Garden. Nick Patillo, Calgary fans love you all over the league, they love you. How about your Rangers, though? They look to be in a little trouble there. Well, you know, the, the goaltender played great. The plane played really great. I have uh, Vancouver to keep that exposure. To compose it's going to be a great hockey game. I mean, the Rangers are going to look to blow out Vancouver right in the first period. But uh, it's going to be a great hockey game, and the crowd's into it. And, it's just great for New York. Well, it's not fair to say I suppose that they're in trouble in the sense they played a great game, but if you lose now and go out to Vancouver, that's trouble. What do you think maybe they do wrong that uh, Vancouver was able to exploit or will try to tonight? Well, I just got to stay on Brian Leach. I think Brian Leach is their offense. I mean, if you take Brian Leach away from New York Rangers, Vancouver's going to have a chance. But the Rangers are going to play a great hockey game tonight, and we'll look for a great hockey game. Great to see you again, Nick. All right, thank you very much. Nice laser show as the Rangers arrive for game two. Mark Messier is obviously the heart and soul of this hockey team. We spoke to him about the importance of tonight and what the mood is in the locker room. Well, I think the, the big thing now is uh, this time of year is just about winning. We felt we played well. We certainly played well enough to win the game, but the bottom line is we didn't. And I think that, uh, you know, McLean uh, had a great game for him. Uh, we had a, plenty of opportunity to score enough goals to win the game. And, uh, and we didn't. So I think that has to be some concern. And also, I think uh, we can expect a better game out of Vancouver tonight. They had a weak layoff. Uh, they might have been a little sluggish in the first game, so we can expect more from them, and we got to be better ourselves. There are the Vancouver Canucks taking to the ice. Kirk McLean, 54 shots he faced the other night. He's out first. Trevor Linden, their captain, was the second Canuck out. Here's John McIntyre. See the final one? Here's Kay Whitmore. Still more Canucks. Jeff Brown getting set for a very important opportunity. Bob Cole is at the ready, as always, to provide the play-by-play -play -play accounts tonight. And he'll be joined by Dick Irvin and Harry Neal, who are with us now. Fellas. Okay, Ron, if Harry Neal had a vote for the Conn Smythe Trophy playoff MVP, which he does not, by the way, you'd have a prime candidate, Harry, after game one. Yeah, not much uh, choice after game one. You know, I went into the New York Post Office yesterday to mail some letters home and I saw this poster with Kirk McLean's picture on it. Wanted, grand larceny, description, often wears a mask, big gloves, funny pants. Reward, phone Neil Smith, $10,000 for the arrest of this criminal. Here he is committing the crimes in the eyes of the New York Rangers. Alias, Captain Kirk, 
Maybe, Dick, maybe the best individual goaltending performance I've seen in this, my eighth final, working for Hockey Night in Canada. Maybe, and that's the compliment. Yes, I would agree with that, certainly, Harry. Rangers look at McLean, of course, as the big stumbling block, but they have to look at themselves a little bit, too. They saw the New Jersey Devils self-destruct against them in Game 6 with missed scoring opportunity. And the Rangers had plenty of those the other night because they had a lot of those wide-open chances. Early third period, they're ahead 1-0. They get a breakaway. Who do you want in the breakaway? Mark Messier's not a bad choice. After the game, Kirk said that was the save that he thought was his best of the night. Now they go into overtime, and right off the opening faceoff, they rush into the Vancouver zone, and Adam Graves, who set an all-time Ranger record this year, regular season and playoffs, gets that chance. Who else would you want there? So certainly big chances there. Very briefly, Harry, the Canucks have to play a bit better up front. Yes, they do. Every one of them admits it. Everyone knows it. They owe McLean a debt, and they better start paying it tonight. All right, and we'll see what happens tonight, but first... Feel the pressure. As Mark Messier said, I'm not sure if they can play better. And the Rangers know that Vancouver can play better. Well, we're ready for game two at Madison Square Garden. And the Rangers will start in front of Richter, Buka Bowman, Leach, Messier, Graves, and Kovalev. There's Kirk McLean, the hero in game one. He has an incredible record in these playoffs. Withstanding all kinds of pressure, he's been in seven overtimes now, won six of them. 77 overtime shots, one goal. Not bad. Mike Richter, no one's been talking about Richter, and that's understandable after McLean's heroics. But in 17 games now, he remains right up there. 1.87 goals against and a .925 save percentage. The referee, Bill McCreary, Kevin Collins, and Jerry Golche on the line. Vancouver with Skinnick, Adams, Burray, Lyndon, Maddich. The starting five in front of Kirk McLean. And the Rangers back in their own zone to start it out. Leach, it is shot down the ice. Maddich will get there. I see way off. side of the net as he tried to relay it in cloud and going after his brain. Messier waiting behind to pick up speed. Make him stop. Make him turn. Get in his road. And every time you can get a piece of him, do it. And there was a good example right there by Brian Leach. The defensive zone coverage will be tested by the Rangers. Here's the first shot and the first stop of the game for McLean. And this has all the earmarks of being a dandy. Lume taking out Keekin in behind the net. And after the game the other night, they were in Zubon shot. And it's dumped off the boards and down the ice by Hunter. 1.15 left on the power play. The Rangers cruise in there. It is Zubon playing it in behind the net. The Vancouver Canucks are going to clear it. Down the ice it goes. 105 left for the penalty. This is Sergei Zubov again, number 21. He gets it up through the middle. And now Messier. He got away from it. Chuck was knocked down. The play goes right on. And this partisan crowd wanted another minor penalty. 45 seconds left for the penalty. No score, first period. The Rangers on the power play move in. Kovalev left it. Zubov! Now he shoots it. Low shot wide of the net. Back of the goal. They dig it out. Another pass to the side of the ball, and the connection jamming the area in front of the plane, doing a great job of it. Zubov winding up. Penalty 
till very late in round three. The former Canucks puts his New York Rangers ahead, 1-0. And it ends four minutes and 19 seconds of Crystal West hockey. You know, Harry, Jay Wells was up in the goal crease earlier on in the game. Everybody in the Rangers seems to want to get out on the act in deep. And Doug Lister, I wonder what his feelings are. Scoring the big one right there against his longtime former team. But you're right, Harry, it's just been a super start here to game two. Well, Pat Quinn's uh, Canucks were on their heels for four minutes, and they had two great chances. If this pace... Get out of the way, boys. It's a big barn burner tonight. Is and it? here's the penalty right here. Lister goes back after Antosti, who hasn't touched the puck on this shift. McCurry's all right. He dodged the high stick, and the Canucks have a power play. Yes, that's an interference call against... Lister. He has scored the goal. The Rangers lead. One to nothing. We are coming up to the eighth minute mark of the first period. Now Vancouver, their first power play of the hockey game. Perez straight to center. Dumps a high one into the right of Richter. Bookable trying to shoot it around the boards to get it out. He doesn't do it. But the Rangers get a second chance. And it's cleared off the line. Characteristic. I've been watching Richter now for about a month, and he looks like he might be a touch shaky here. You're right, the short side has been his enemy. He should have caught that one, especially when the short side is glove side. Both of them fired one ahead of Vancouver player, Jeff Brown, and then Mchino shot of the rest of the way. Mchino coming in after. Trying to one-hand it out front. He was tied out and couldn't make the play. Center ice area, and Kinoff shooting it back in. 
2.20 left to the opening period. Score is tied, 1-1. One, one. Minute 15 left to the Anderson penalty. The Ducks trying to get something going right here. There's just over two minutes left in the period. Chance to take the lead into the room after one. And they're in over the line. Linden takes it back to the line. Lume fired one in. Richter the save. Linden went in there in a hurry. Ran into Lister rather heavily. The Rangers' Messier is up there. Messier has the puck stolen just inside the Vancouver line. Now, 16th floor, the top of a Manhattan building about a mile from here. $1,000 an hour to practice. Pat wins, black aces, the guys that aren't playing practice. The rink asked 1500 bucks, And the big negotiator, George McPhee, got him down to $1,000 an hour. studio here we are the greatest hockey players in the world every one of these guys will be playing in the National Hockey League making 10 million dollars you know you guys I played in the National Hockey League one game I'll tell you that anyhow let's say say hello to mom okay see you mom all right see you mom best in the world right here Pretty good, eh? all right grapes that's the youngsters they had in New York you were at the luncheon today right. Harry introducing what could be well, the assistant coach Dick Todd will hit in the head there and they're leading him to the dressing room. Next coach to Peterborough last year, his first year in the league, and here he is in the final. 22 seconds left for the period. The Rangers come up one more time, and Tekin in decides to let her fly from center. Rebound to Anderson. He waited too long, no shot. 10 seconds left in the period, and now the Canucks get their last chance. Pass comes in from McIntyre left, and Jelena tried to shoot it as he was dead. And the puck loose in the corner. Not a hitting there at the buzzer, which ends period number one. Fans across Canada stand up and give these two teams a standing ovation for an outstanding period. Both teams reaching down for a handful of determination. You can't ask for anything more from either team. Coming up in our first intermission, Don Cherry is back with us in the coach's corner. Lister and the Messel, the goal scorers in period one. The score after one, the Rangers won, and the Canucks won. Cherry. Brought to you by Pepsi. Be young. Have fun. Drink Pepsi. Here's the Canuck mobile. Let's see you guys. Yeah. All right. A few bottles in here, but they're pop bottles, I think. Uh, we go here. All right, now let's hear it, guys.
probably yes. no air conditioning. Yes, and there's the girls you were ogling today walking along the street there. I was very surprised. That's my New York, that's Betty Boop. Well, and who are you ogling? Uh, well, I'm ogling anybody I want to say, first of all, right off the bat, I want to say uh, thumbs up and keep plugging away in there. A kid from uh, Connor Adams in Nova Scotia named Aaron McLean. Good kid. You told me he's having a bone marrow transplant? Yes. That's my Lidster. Now watch it here as he... <laughs> this is not the shot, but anyhow, watch he gets crashed, and you can see the puck go in after he gets crashed. That's a great, That's a great shot. Yeah. And you see he had the puck here, and here it is again. Now you really can see it on this one. Now watch, he's got the puck, hits him, and then puts it in. And see, Bill McCurry, where he is, though, he's blocked out. In well, fairness to him, but it's, uh, shouldn't all count. I'm saying, the kids had the car parked when they're on their way to come here, and uh, they all signed the, the car, eh, with a, a mark a lot or something like that. Right. And then he, Pat gets on the thing, and he says, hey, Pat, the kids, and they're on the bus, and they're going away, and the kids wanted you to sign the car. Stop the bus. Pat gets off and goes, signs the bus, and all the team cheered when he got on this thing. What a great guy. Those kids, that was after Game 7 in Calgary. And they're going to get, uh, by the way, flown home. Somebody oh, yeah. in Vancouver's What's paying the, the money. Well, they're going to put the car, it's so beautiful, Anyhow. on a flatbed and drive it back and fly them home, which is delightful right. for those fans. All right, enough about that. I know. All right, now here we go. Pat Quinn, boy soprano of St. Mike's from County Arma. A friend of mine has told the boy, uh, boy soprano. Now, folks, I'm going to I'm going to read you something you won't believe. 16 out of these 20 players, he got, I got to put my glasses on, he got through trades. Now, I'm going to start right here. These five he got on waivers, that means nobody in the league wanted them. Brian Glynn, remember him? Great kid playing, great big guy. Uh, Martin Jelena, not bad. Everybody passed him. The French guy in Quebec passed on him. Tim Hunter, didn't show discipline out there today. Timmy, you didn't show discipline today. He said, uh, by the way, he said, what's wrong? I get a penalty for roughing, and then I don't yeah. get one there. Yeah, he didn't show behind. discipline, no. You had to show discipline. John McIntyre on waivers. I got to hurry. For Peter Neved, who got a point in the playoffs, he got Jeff Brown, Brent Hennigan, not bad, two beauties, and that Lafayette kid, I'm telling you, what a beauty they got in him. Probably for Neved. There in the, uh, Anyhow, Murray Craven, he got uh, for Robert Cron and Sandlack. Dave Babbage, their steadiest defenseman for Curvers. That's nothing. You got for Garth Butcher and Dan Quinn. Now listen to this. You ready for this now? You got Cliff Ronning, Sergio Mameso, Jeff Courtnell, and Robert Dirk. Oh, now, Gerald Dedick, who's a great a minute here. All right, gotta hurry. Uh, if I uh, got Dedick out for a first round, uh, Jerky Lumi for a uh, second round. Now, hey, listen to this one. Now listen to this, the first star and the second star of the last game for Patrick Sundstrom. You remember Patrick, the great Patrick Sundstrom? They got Kirk McLean and Greg Adams. What a general manager, Pat Quinn. My old defense partner in Tulsa and Rochester and my roommate. Got any stories about when he was your roommate? Oh, I can't tell you them. All right, Don Cherry singing the praises of a boy soprano in this installment of the Coach's Corner on Molson Hockey Night in Canada in the Stanley Cup playoffs on CBC. Aaron, in 1966, Terrible Ted, as he was known, was the leader of the Detroit Red Wings on and off the ice. When the Canadians and the Wings were great rivals, Gordie Howe was Mr. Hockey, but it was Ted Lindsay who killed the Canadians. His immense skill had him classified as a league-wide threat. 17 NHL seasons, Lindsay played on four Stanley Cup winners and was on the famous production line, playing a major role as the Wings won seven consecutive regular season titles. Ted Lindsay's personal dossier includes 379 goals. He was a 10-time All-Star with eight nominations for the first team. Tonight, his all-round excellence is honored on hockey's great wall. Brought to you by Ford, makers of the 95 Windstar and a proud founding sponsor of the Hockey Hall of Fame and Museum. In game one, the Murray was the fourth best Soviet on the ice. The three Ranger ones better, but Pavel gave us a little taste in the first shift of the second period of what he's done so often for the Canucks. He, he waits behind for the long pass. If you're a defenseman and he's on the back check, you better check where he is. And here's the shot off the post. Took no time at all to get rid of it. Had Richter beaten at the wrong side of the iron. Oh, he's all cool. Play that he uses in the offensive zone. The Rangers took the ice away from him in game one. Watch the speed of Graves, who makes 
Murray shoot on a, a going away from the net. If you can catch Murray, you are a racehorse. Murray's starting to be noticed. He's got a 16-game point streak with that assist on the winning goal in game one. Two games to go to tie the great Brian Croce. And he must have been feeling a little under the weather in game one because he looks awful healthy to me tonight, especially in this period. Captain Kirk, Kirk McLean, the goaltender for the Vancouver Canucks, who was so outstanding in the series opener. Playoff time brings out the celebs uh, around town. They were booing when there was a picture on the screen during a commercial break a while back. I thought, what are they doing that for? It was a picture of the mayor of New York, <laughs> Mayor Giuliani. It was odd. Kirk McLean has had to make some of his better stops in the shorthanded situation. Well, they cheered when they came on the screen, though. John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carol Hanna. The Peters among the 18,200 sellout crowd. Up to center is Brian Newman. Up there, uh, you know, we had Tekin and made a good pass to me and then and then backed me up. Uh, we just got caught odd, odd men after I got knocked down, but uh, he doesn't want me to get caught uh, unless we have support, so I, I try and make sure we got someone back there. You're really getting hit tonight. Has that been the story all through the playoffs? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, you know, it's some tough series out there, and that's how uh, the playoffs are. We just got to uh, score on a power play. Tell me a bit about the Canucks as compared to New Jersey and uh, earlier opponents. Well, they, they certainly forecheck a lot more, and uh, therefore you get some more chances. Uh, opens up the ice a little bit, so you see a little more trading chances back and forth. Uh, New Jersey did a great job of shutting us down the neutral zone, and we really had to work for everything. And, uh, we're fortunate to get that in seven games, but uh, this seems to have a lot more flow than, than some of our other series. Good luck in the third tonight. Okay, thanks. Brian Leach, Norse Trophy winner last year, a star for the New York Rangers in this edition of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Coming up next, the man we spoke of earlier, place a little later on this month. Kirk McLean was the story here on Tuesday night. His 52 saves made him the man of the hour for 24 hours. He was like a prize fighter navigating through cameras and questions, a few of which I fired at him yesterday. given a chance to, to win the game, uh, you know, and he held us in there uh, time and time again. Got a piece of that. They came out strong, especially at the start of the game, and uh, he kept us right there and gave us the opportunity to uh, get a couple of goals and get it back into it. Things happen good on a personal note because there's the people around you, what they're doing. Uh, you know, you feed off of that, and, and um, right now the team's playing with a great deal of confidence, and, and, it, and it rubs off on everybody. The media attention, especially in, under the circumstances with the Stanley Cup Finals in New York and what have you, it's a little overwhelming at, at some points, but we uh, handle it pretty well. And you know, it's good to have the media attention as long as it doesn't get overly done. Yesterday was a, found it tough napping. I think I, I rolled around and and uh, maybe went in 15-minute spurts. Uh, and, you know, it was a pretty exciting moment. A uh, little bit of butterflies, I, could, I can honestly say, yesterday afternoon, trying to sleep. And, and then as soon as you, you, you get up and then when you're with the guys and you, you're in the locker room or around them, it, it eases up a little bit and you, and you start gearing yourself for the, for the game. I'm 
type of guy who's or a goaltender anyways that's not really intense as far as not talking to anybody or don't want anybody in my hair I'm, I'm just like one of the other guys I like to be around and that's the thing that I think that keeps me uh, calm is being with the guys and, and really trying to keep my mind off of things as much as, as possible the pass! I was tired of that point uh, I mean it was so hot in there uh, I was sweating in a big way I think I was just holding on to my gloves with the tip of my fingers they were just falling off my hands and I was just happy to see it going Burke's been great again tonight. He played his midget hockey with the Don Mills Flyers in Toronto. Scott Mellenby was on that team, his junior in Oshawa, on his way to becoming a star of today's NHL. Meantime, the stars of tomorrow's NHL were here in New York this afternoon. They were paraded before members of the press. Here's a look at a few of them who will be in Hartford as we give them McLean-like exposure. so much work into it and I know how much work uh, it takes to come here and I'm just going to do all my best to try to make it work. Oh, it's a, a terrific day for all of us. Uh, it's a very exciting situation to be here in the middle of the Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, Madison Square Garden, you know, one of the nicest rinks in the NHL. Um, you know, what else could you ask for? of today, stars of tomorrow, and the Taxi Squad. New York Rangers lead the Vancouver Canucks 2-1 here in Game 2 of the Stanley Cup. We're back with the third period next from New York. Scoring chances are still in favor of the Rangers. The most glaring stat perhaps is the offensive zone faceoff. The Rangers 16, the Canucks 7. The Canucks played a way better in the first 10 minutes of the second period. Couldn't get the goal. And you can see what I mean, Burry had... Off, so I was thinking, it'd be wonderful if the Canucks make the finals. We could do something in Stanley Park, because not that many people realize it was named for the same fellow who gave us the Stanley Cup. And naturally, this is the first time it's rained on a game day in Vancouver. But it's okay. Flowers are smiling. Welcome to the beautiful park in downtown of the city. 1,000 acres of land that was set aside for the enjoyment of all colors, creeds, and customs for all time. This park was dedicated in 1888 for Frederick Arthur Stanley. Lord Stanley of Preston, the Governor General of Canada. Five years after that, he gave us the Dominion Challenge Trophy, a.k.a. the Stanley Cup. So as we get set for Game 3 of the 94 Final, thank you, Lord Stanley of Preston. In the first place, you gave us somewhere to dream. Then, you gave us the dream that's all about first place. Dan Kenny taught me that. And a nice shot outside the Pacific Coliseum and a full house inside as we get set for game three of the 1994 Stanley Cup Championship Series on Wilson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC. Got my lucky tie on here tonight and they should do it tonight. They got to do it tonight. Pat Quinn kind of wasted his the other night. You were worried about that. Well, not to wear it, Dan. You got to wear it at the right time, Pat. Look, tonight the New York Rangers are going to go after uh, McLean again tonight. You can't, and one of them said, look, he can't stop what he can't see. And that's what they're going to do. Hey, with the way he played in the first game, that's the kind of stuff they got to do. I know it's not fair, but that's the way it works. What would you do about it? Nothing you can do about it. Long, it's a long talk because of the instigator rule. You can't take it. In the old days, they were already heroes to the fans, 600 of them at 4.20 in the morning. There's Arthur Griffiths. Pavel Bure, of course, is the heartthrob of the city. You can see the fans going nuts. Graham McLennan, who works here in the Zamboni entrance, was telling me that back in 1982 around town, they hung towels from all the cranes. Now they've got the banners. They're ready for this. That's a crane overlooking the new arena where the Canucks will call home. 
And the fans, of course, uh, they were lined up for blocks to see the Stanley Cup was on display downtown, and here they were at 4.20 this afternoon trying to get in, get a good seat. They had to get in early because they've darkened the building, so they want them in their seats. What about the Rangers getting away? Well, it's the, it's the Rangers I want to still talk about. I can... Porto, 0 for 9 games. Linden, 0 goals for 6 games. Bury, 0 for 3. They cannot win the Stanley Cup if those players don't start scoring. If he doesn't score, he floats a bit. And here he gets another one here. Linden. On the face off. One by Messier. Adams digs it out. He has Burray there with him. So is Brown up on the play. He centered it. But the Rangers dig it out and two of them skate away hard. In his pad. There's something. And one in behind him. Well, four of the first of the five goals the Rangers have scored in this series have been slightly tainted. Off the and net. this is the first mistake McLean's made. You remember the empty net goal. He had no chance on that, did he, Dick? And then Larmer put it off the post off his leg. Then Anderson beat three guys to the net. And then Lindster kicked it in or pushed it in. And this one's a weird one. So you can't get legitimate goals. You can get some we can't see from this angle has not got up so I don't know what the penalty was for but it's Jay Wells by the look of it the Ranger defense is injured to say the least Kevin Lowe playing injured Zuboff out and Wells right here 
I knew our guys in the truck would miss it. Whoa. Pavel Burry gives him the lumber, and you have to wonder, is Wells cut? If he is, is Burry gone? Or is it four? Yes, I think he's gone. I think he gets a five-minute plus a game misconduct here because Jay Wells was cut. Yes, he does. Ooh, quite a turn of events. The crowd does not realize it yet. Andy Van Halen has gone to the and penalty box. Here's the announcement. Pavel Bure, a five-minute major for high sticking and a game misconduct. Well, Andy Van Helleman has <laughs> guided him. Left for the period and take the lead. Two to one. Nemchinov getting away from his check. Glenn and got on the slot. Here it is. Well, certainly Glenn had him, but he rolled off him. And then Nemchinov cuts across in front of the net, shoots it between the legs of uh, Craven, and Anderson tips it in for a goal. Four skaters against four. A lovely tip in. Yurke Lumi pays no attention. The best of teams are four aside, even though they came out of the box at the end of the penalty. And Leach pours right through to the net, walks between the two Vancouver defensemen who had three guys to contend with, and backhands it over Richter. I mean, over McLean. Keep the long shots low on McLean. That was the strategy the Rangers started to employ in New York. And Brian Leach. Makes it 3-1 Rangers with 1.28 to go in the second period. Luka Boom and taken in the assists on the goal by Leach at 18.32. So the Rangers score late in the first period to take a 2-1 lead. One Anderson scored at 9. Stanley Cup champions, once a Ranger, always a Ranger. It's been a well-documented 54 years of trial and error for the New York Rangers. These were the men. This was their time. Mac Colville was born in Edmonton in 1940. He was 24. The players all got along so well together, you know. There was no clicks. Winnipeg's Alex Shabicki was 25 54 years ago. I remember I was getting kid in Winnipeg and wrestling to Foster Hewitt. Driving away out of Toronto, you know, and dreaming about someday, you know, playing the game. Clint Smith, the two-time Lady Bing winner, was born in Assiniboia, Saskatchewan. We could play a tough game, we could play a fast game, uh, you name it, and we could play it. Victoria's Murray Muzz Patrick was 23 in 1940. I don't believe we had any one as a big star. We, we had about three or four that were the top guys. Another Winnipeg native was utility forward Al Pike. We had much more fun, I think, today than today's hockey players because we rode the train so much and we, we just had to get along better because we were sometimes we were 20, 24 hours on the train. Kitchener's Dutch Hiller was 24, the year they won the cup. We uh, always had a meeting before the game and all of us decided what we were going to do. The Rangers of the late 30s, early 40s were a quality team. The sculptor was Frank Boucher, the coach. The architect was general manager Lester Patrick. Well, Foster, I uh, tell you, the, it's remarkable the way the game of hockey has been accepted into the hearts of the great American centers. And I honestly believe that his possibilities have merely been scratched. But he was close to the dollar, but a very good man. But his word was his bond. When he said something, you didn't need it right. It was there for you, always. Boucher had plenty of talent to work with. In goal, Davy Kerr. 
On defense, Captain Art Coulter, Babe Pratt, Ott Heller, and up front, a collection of consistent, productive forwards. We had 10 forwards, uh, Neil Koval was the center on the Mac Koval, Alex Shabiki line, which had played for a couple of three years before I got there. They were brought up through the 3R system, Rangers, Ramblers, and Rovers. And then there was Phil Watson. This is how it wound up. Phil Watson, Lynn Patrick, and, uh, and Brian Hextall. And then there was uh, Clint Smith, Kilby McDowell, myself, and Dutch Hiller. We were one of the greatest passing teams, I guess, that was ever in the National League. That's what everybody keeps telling us anyhow. I don't think there was $1,500 difference on the contract from the best to the one on the third line. Because of the circus moving into Madison Square Garden, the Rangers played most of the final series in 1940 in Toronto. But that didn't stop this juggernaut. Al Pike and Muzz Patrick's overtime goals gave New York a 3-2 series lead. Game six was tied at two in extra time, setting the stage for Brian Hextall's winner and Dutch Hiller's story. I beat the person with a puck or, or took it away from him, and I turned and went to my right behind the leaf net and saw a hex down past the boat. And he just slapped, slapped it right in. But Brian carried that stick all night after that, all the way to Detroit, all the way home. When we come into the dressing room, Frank Boucher was right there to greet us. And he gave me a big hug, or what he gave me, but giving me credit for playing one heck of a good game. General Kilpatrick came in and he said, gentlemen, he says, we have a room, banquet room at the Royal York, and he says, we're having a party. And he says, this is an order. I want everybody at that party. Only seven members of that team remain, like Muzz Patrick, who lives in Connecticut. This special group is known as the Silver Seven. You've met six. Number seven, Captain Art Coulter, is in Alabama. Well, Art, if you're looking in on this, we want to thank you for your leadership, <laughs> for backing us up. But I won't thank you for not getting more money out of Lester. <laughs> well, you got your two cents with it now, Ellie. Okay. Final, the New York Rangers and Vancouver Canucks fortunes were as different as night and day. The New Yorkers were far too much for the Canucks in a number of areas, and especially in the area of number two. Brian Leach's two goal effort Saturday gave him a share of the lead in playoff scoring, 28 points and plus 23. He's quietly allowed the Rangers to be two wins shy of the Stanley Cup. The Canucks, for their part, also had problems with twos. To prove their luck was too bad, two bad bounces added up to defeat. When Pavel Burry went to the Wells too often, there was no two and two to be had for Pat Quinn. Still, for all their two sorrows, the Canucks have caught one break two days off, a disruption of the Rangers' role, and a chance for Vancouver to retool, perhaps in a boat face as possible, on Tuesday. Whether it's to be or not to be will be clear to all tonight. The skies have left it in Vancouver, and fans here hope spirits do too. Rain for the last couple of days, but as you can see, it's just overcast and some sunshine as we get set for game four of the Stanley Cup Final. The New York Rangers and Vancouver Canucks get with it, fans. There's some fans in the Zamboni area here at the Pacific Coliseum. That was the big story the other night. You couldn't hear yourself think in this building, but all of a sudden after Bure's goal that gave the Canucks a 1-0 lead, things fell flat. I know my wife was on hand. the blue line. Another pass. Here's a shot. Lester stopped that. Cleared into the corner. The Rangers pick it up. They do not get it out. Lume kept it in with a shot in front of the net. Back to the line to Lume again. Into Trevor Linden. Linden is caught in there with two Rangers watching him. Braves reaching for him. Pass to the line for Brown. Dumped it ahead to Burray. They're on the outside of that four-man box. No shot yet. Here's Adams all the way back to the line again. Lume to Linden. In front is Adams. Adams center. Brown shoots. Brown takes it again. Lume off on an angle. Coming for the net. To Burray. Brown shoots. That's blocked in third by New York. 
Four seconds left to the penalty. No score. First period. Vancouver on the power play. They killed off. A penalty of their own. Now they move up across center. Court all over the line. In with a shot. Hit a leg. Leach blocked it. Court will center. And right into the crease. And Rickard covered up before anybody could get near it. And then beats him to the puck. then when you played the Islanders. The only other time a front page story occurred with a picture of me was when they let me go here, Dick, so <laughs> I'm one for two, I guess. But that was a nice one today. The one thing that the Canuck fans reminded me of after game three is the way they kind of looked after game three in 1982, like they're saying, boy, it just isn't going to happen, but not Too much time Leach did. He got the puck at his own blue line after a 
turnover and a little mix-up by Burry right here. The defenseman doesn't know whether he should go in or stay out. Hedigan goes in, and here's the long breakaway. He knows what he's going to try and do, but he can't get it up over the catching glove of McLean. And you hate to say game-saving stops in the first period, but that was a huge one. Another one of those late goals would have taken the crowd and maybe the Canucks and put them in, on their heels because they've been dominant so far as they have the 2-0 lead. And now they have a short power play here, four skaters against three. Deacon gets the penalty, and there he is. It's a roughing call at 1845. So a big turn of events here for the Vancouver Canucks. Messier has 32 seconds left in his penalty. That was a major. Keegan, and now his penalty just starting. And Cordell has one minute left in his. And just over a minute remaining in the period. The announcement coming of one minute. This is Burray. He's up over the line, and the pass intended for Linden doesn't work. It's up along the board to the corner. Lume centered it, but they're not going away. Brown comes in and can't get a shot. And the Rangers hold on and shoot it down the ice. 38 seconds left in the period. Murray deep in his own zone. Bet it off the boards behind Vancouver net. There's Lume. Trying to set up Murray, but he is heading off to the Vancouver bench on a change. Messier having served that major on there for New York. 15 seconds remaining in the period, and the Rangers come out. They are trailing two to nothing. Through center is Limer. Tried a long shot. That'll be deflected. Well, Vancouver, as they saw the shots even eight apiece. Slow start, really. Not many shots at all till we got to the 10 minute mark. But then they picked it up. Linden and running scored. Well, I think we're seeing the real Canucks, at least the Canucks that got them this far, and we haven't seen this kind of dash from. In Sweden. Oh, thanks. I needed that. Wake up. He's a good friend of mine. We're just kind of confused here, so you tell us what's going on. Well, the referee has the option. You can give five in a game if he's pushed into the goal frame or the boards from behind without the ability to defend himself. That's five in a game. If he's hit from behind and it's not deemed to be dangerous, Oh, it's just a five-minute major for boarding, and that's what the call he was. He ain't there like he was Like dead. that call. Maybe the two after, you were a little worried. All right, Linden. never mind. I just, we just wanted to know what's going on. Uh, just so you know, when Lyndon had the stick there between the legs, and you're wondering, well, how does he get a penalty? That's thigh sticking. I figured it that's out. That's not what you said oh, when he yes, did it. It was, it was okay. not between his legs. Both two so nothing. figured out. All right, two nothing. Uh, the Canucks lead. What do you think of the game? Good game. Uh, it, it, uh, it wants to get a flow. I think Greg's going, you know, he's set. He's got to have... Greg always has the uh, save of the game. Now, we got a little thing here. First of all, before we go... Okay, on, roll it, Larry Boy. I know you were very excited about all the crossbars and how great they sounded. That's the net cam. That brought up the gay well, thing. Well, you say you're a redneck. In yeah, there's nothing, nothing wrong with redneck. I'll tell you how a redneck games around. Anyhow, the gays and everything, and everybody said, oh, you're going to get in trouble with the gays and all that liberation and all that stuff and everything. Now, I got a letter. I got a letter back from them just to prove you're wrong. Okay, now, it's the Cutting Edge News Release. This is the paper. All right? Okay. Yes. It says, thanks, Don, we needed that. The Cutting Edge is Vancouver's Hockey Unity 94 Gay Games in New York. We'd like to thank Hockey Night in Canada's Don Cherry for his comments about gays during the hockey game 